Chapter 10. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H, continued. They had neglected to inform Jamil there might be a change in their plans for that day. Jumana was with him, and she looked so crestfallen when Ramses explained that they wouldn't need her, that Nefred said impulsively, Why can't she come with us? She can't come to the dealers with us, Ramses said. It will be difficult enough bullying them into giving away useful information without a wide-eyed female child present. Nefret had to admit he was right. She and her mother-in-law had a unique status, but Jumana would be treated like any other Egyptian female. She was also a member of a family with connections all over Gurna and Luxor, some of them legal, some not. Abdallah's uncle had accrued a sizable fortune by methods no one was rude enough to inquire into. The dealers wouldn't speak freely in front of her, but the wide, imploring eyes were difficult to resist. Jamil can take us across the river, and she can stay with him. Jamil gave Nefret an outraged look. He probably had plans of his own, involving a long, leisurely gossip with friends in the glamorous coffee shops of Luxor. She really couldn't blame him for not wanting his sister trailing along. Then she might visit the school. You can talk with your teachers, Jumana, and tell them what you're doing. I will do that. Yes, I will. They will be very proud of me. I must teach that child not to shout, Nefret thought. Once they reached the other side of the river, Jamil tied the boat and sat down to chat with the other boatmen. As she and Ramses walked toward Luxor Temple, Nefret saw that Jumana had also stopped to talk with several girls of about her own age. It was no wonder news spread so fast. Gossip was one of the chief amusements in a semi-literate society where other means of entertainment were lacking. This was brought home to her a few minutes later, when a voice hailed them, and they saw one of the clerks from the telegraph office trotting toward them. "'It just came now,' he explained, handing Ramses the telegram. "'I was about to send a man to bring it to you when I heard you were in Luxor.' Ramses handed over the expected bakshish and ripped open the envelope. He let out a breath of relief and handed the paper to Nefret. "'The Vandergelts will be arriving in Luxor on Sunday.' You expected bad news? One always does, doesn't one? Telegrams are so damned uninformative, Nefret murmured, rereading the brief message. If this isn't just like Mother, she doesn't say why they're coming by train instead of sailing, but wastes four words on Find Bertie new interest. What on earth do you suppose that means? The phrase shell-shocked comes to mind. Yes, of course, Nefret's smile faded. Poor boy. It's not really such good news, Ramses went on. With Sethos on the loose, they could be jumping from the frying pan into the fire. Shall we try to put them off? I don't suppose there's any danger to them, really. He stroked his chin in unconscious imitation of his father, and his frown of concentration smoothed out into a smile. However, I think I'll wire Mother. Let's go to the telegraph office. You're going to tell her about Sethos? No. He wrote out the telegram and then showed it to her. All is discovered. Kindly refrain from conspiring with my wife against me. Nefret laughed, but shook her head. Now you're the one putting me in an impossible situation. I am not. Your first loyalty is to me. It's in the Bible, as Mother would say. The first shop they visited was near the Luxor Temple, conveniently located to catch the tourist trade. The proprietor greeted them with a show of surprise that didn't fool either of them, sent one of his sons out for coffee, and began complaining. The thrice-cursed war had ruined his business. How could an honest man make a living when so few tourists came? "'That is why we came to you,' Ramsay said. "'Your honesty is well known, and since there are no tourists, you must have many fine antiquities for sale. What have you got to show us?' After considerable hemming and hawing, Omar finally brought out a small bronze figure of a seated cat wearing a gold earring and a fragment of carved relief. The latter showed the head and shoulders of a man wearing a short, tightly curled wig. Late 25th or early 26th dynasty, Ramses murmured, turning it in his hands. Very good, Nefret said. I wish I had your eye. I be damned. This comes from the chapel of Amenerdis at Medinet Habu. 
It was in situ last time I saw it. How much damage? Nefret cleared her throat warningly, and he controlled his anger, as his father would not have done. There was nothing to be gained by berating dealers like Omar. They wouldn't stop cooperating with the local thieves, but they would stop showing him objects. Who was responsible for the robbery of Le Grand Effendi's storage magazines? he asked abruptly. He knew better than to expect a truthful answer, but he hoped his sudden question would induce a reaction, however fleeting and faint that might give him a clue. It did. The other man's face became as hard and blank as a plaster mask, glazed with sudden sweat. He shook his head dumbly. No one else will hear of it if you tell us, Ramses persisted. Do you doubt my word? No. The dealer's eyes rolled from side to side. But, but I know nothing, brother of demons. I have nothing for you. I must, I must close now. It is time for prayer. It lacked a good quarter of an hour until noon, but Ramses didn't argue. Omar barely waited till they were outside before he slammed and bolted the door. The second shop was closed, so was the third. We may as well give up for today, Ramses said. Omar's son warned the others. There's definitely something out of the ordinary going on. The dealers are accustomed to having me come round trying to winkle information out of them. They rather enjoy the game. They wouldn't be so wary unless they'd been warned not to talk to us. Threatened, perhaps, Nefret said. He wasn't just wary, he was frightened. Yes, our estimable kinsman is good at terrorizing people. In his heyday, there wasn't a dealer in Egypt who would dare cross him. He added feelingly, damn him. Yes, darling. She took his arm. It's still early, but we might have lunch. Sit on the terrace of the Winter Palace and watch the passing throngs. Sethos may be playing the part of a waiter. He was not amused. Walking slowly, with his head bent and his hands in his pockets, he said absently, Whatever you like. Or we could go by Abdul Hadi's shop and pick up the portrait. You don't really want a new frame for it, do you? For what? Oh, the portrait. No, I... He came to a dead halt. Hell and damnation! What's wrong? We left it there. Ramses slammed his fist into his other palm. How bloody stupid can I get? Come on! She had to trot to keep up with him. The midday call to prayer floated down from the mosque of El Gibri, and when Ramses burst into the shop, Abdul Hadi was about to lower his rheumatic knees onto his prayer mat. For a moment, Nefret feared her husband was too overwrought to remember his manners, but she needn't have worried. I beg your pardon. I came for my mother's picture. It can wait. The amiable old gentleman looked bewildered. But did you not take it last night? It was not on the easel this morning. And I thought... Never mind, Nefret said quickly. Malish, thank you. Goodbye. She pulled Ramses out of the shop and closed the door. He turned to look at her. His features were as impassive as granite, but his effort to keep his voice low was not entirely successful. What are you laughing about? But it's funny, Nefret gurgled. Instead of fleeing into the night like a proper crook, he waited coolly outside that window until we... until... Oh, dear. Finish the performance, her husband said wildly. He must have found it quite amusing. I seem to remember telling you. And then, didn't I... The Savoy's closer than the Winter Palace. She took his arm. I prescribe a stiff whiskey or a glass of wine. I don't need a drink. He stalked along beside her, scowling blackly. What I need is revenge, not only for last night, but for a long history of affronts. You can't... I don't want to torture him, sweetheart. I want to humiliate him and get the better of him for once. Remembering some of the things they had said and done in the belief they were unobserved, Nefret felt a certain sympathy. But she tried to be fair. He wasn't deliberately playing Peeping Tom. He was only waiting to see whether we'd leave the portrait. And now he's got it. How are we going to explain that to Mother? They selected a table in the Garden of the Savoy and ordered. 
Bougainvillea spread ruffled arms along the wall behind them, and a sparrow alighted on the table and cocked a bright eye at Nefret. She fed it crumbs from her hand until it suddenly took flight, and she looked up to see Margaret Minton standing beside her. "'May I join you?' she asked. "'How did you find us?' Nefret asked, watching Ramsay's face go blank. He rose and held a chair for the journalist. "'The usual methods,' Minton said blandly. "'Bribery and bakshish. "'I paid some of the loafers on the dock to come and tell me "'if you turned up on the East Bank. "'I've been trailing you all morning, to no avail, I might add. "'Why were you visiting antiquities dealers? "'It's common knowledge that the professor won't buy from them. "'Father won't, but I occasionally do,' Ramsay said. "'Nefret saw him brace himself like a duelist on guard. "'One must sometimes sacrifice principle to expediency "'or lose an important piece to a private collector.' You weren't surprised to see me. Did Mrs. Emerson tell you I was coming to Luxor? Had you informed her of your plans? With a faint smile, she acknowledged her second failure to get past his guard and attacked from a third direction. Surely she told you about the bodies she found in the Mastaba. Nefret decided to intervene. She'd read the letter and the clipping from the Gazette. Ramsay's had not. Besides, she was tired of fencing. Is that why you're here? she demanded. If it is, you are on the wrong track. All we know is what Mother told us in her last letter, and that was little enough. The waiter came with the food they had ordered. Miss Minton waved away the menu he offered her and asked for tea. While he hovered, arranging the dishes to his satisfaction, she glanced round the garden. Who is that man? she asked suddenly. He's been staring at me ever since I sat down. He was still staring a burly man with a heavy, neatly trimmed beard and a bush of curly brown hair. But not at her. Catching the fret's eye, he stood up and came toward them, smiling and holding out his hand. Hello, Nefret. It's wonderful to see you again. I've not met your husband, but of course I've heard of him. May I offer my felicitations to you both? Ramses rose and took the extended hand, a soft brown fuzz covered the back. It felt like a cat's fur, but his grip was almost painfully hard. Ramses met it with equal strength, thinking how childishly they were behaving, flexing their muscles to impress a woman. Sorry I missed you the other day, the other man went on. Nefret pronounced the formal words of introduction, and Kuentz kissed her hand. Introducing Miss Minton could not be avoided. She was firmly settled in her chair and had no intention of leaving. She is a well-known journalist, Ramses added. Ah, then I must be careful what I say. His booming laugh made heads turn. Not unless you've done something you're ashamed of, Miss Minton replied. Me? No, never. To blow up the German house, that was not a shameful thing. The sentence contained three words that would have aroused any journalist's curiosity. Miss Minton's fingers twitched. Blow up? German? What's this about? She is wanting to write it all down, Cohen said with a grin. See how she crooks her fingers as if they were holding a pen. So, you hadn't heard of our humble effort on behalf of the Allies? We had heard of it, Ramsay said but no one seemed to know who was responsible. The journalist turned her hungry gaze on him, and since he saw no reason to conceal the facts, he went on to explain. It might get Miss Minton off on another track. The German government built the place a few years ago to serve as headquarters for their archaeologists. Without wishing to denigrate your efforts, Kuentz, I can't see that blowing it up to the Allied cause much good. It was very ugly, Kuentz said airily. Too large, too red, too German. Hardly sufficient cause for destroying someone else's property, Ramsay said. It was not the only reason. Coens glanced round like a stage conspirator and lowered his voice. Carter and I found out that the place had become a center for the illicit antiquities trade. Among other undesirable activities, I say no more, eh? But I'd like to hear more, Miss Minton said eagerly. Was Mr. Carter involved then? 
Who else? I did not say that, Coins declared. Ramses had the impression he was quite enjoying himself. I and I alone was responsible. And now I must return to my labours. I have been away too long. Then perhaps you would dine with me this evening. I am staying at the Winter Palace. So you will write it all down, and then my name will be in your newspaper? I won't print anything without your permission. Nefret's face twisted into a look of exaggerated incredulity. Coens laughed. So what do I care? A poor, hungry archaeologist does not refuse a free meal, especially with a beautiful lady. Thank you, I will come. At eight, yes? And you, my friends, the young Emersons, will visit me again at Deir el Medina, where I will show you many things of interest. He bowed and walked away. Ramses pushed his chair back. I forgot to ask him about something. Excuse me. Was it true? Miss Minton demanded. What he said about the German house being a centre for dealing in illegal antiquities. It's the first I've heard of it, Nefret said truthfully. Ramses was still talking with Coens, knowing that if they were discussing archaeology, he might go on at length, oblivious of the time. Nefret raised her hand to summon the waiter. But there's been an increase in such activities this year, hasn't there? I didn't know you were interested in the subject, Miss Minton. Didn't you? There was a note in her voice that made Nefret look up from the coins she was counting out on the table. Don't tell me you didn't read the manuscript Mrs. Emerson took uh, quite by mistake. I wager you talked it over at length, all of you, dissecting my emotions and speculating about my feelings. Perhaps it gave you a good laugh. Nefret felt her face heating up. At the time, she hadn't questioned her mother-in-law's bland appropriation. She would never have called it theft of the document. Yet it was really like stealing someone's private diary and showing it to others. The author had spared herself very little, because she had never meant anyone else to read it. No doubt she had explored every other possible source of information before she consulted a woman whom she knew disliked and mistrusted her. No one laughed, she said. It was a rather feeble stab at reassurance and tacit apology. But the other woman nodded in acknowledgement. She was blushing, too. And I don't wonder, Nefret thought. I know how I would feel if I had spread my heart out on a sheet of paper and someone else had read it. I wouldn't blame you for laughing, Miss Minton murmured. I wrote it for myself, you know, soon afterward while the details were still fresh in my mind. I never meant anyone else to see it. What made you decide to show it to Mother? Desperation, the other woman said simply. I don't suppose you can understand, you with your happy marriage to a man who is everything you could ever want, and that close-knit, magnificently eccentric family. I had no lover, no family, no friends... The competition in my business was keen. I didn't feel I had time for such distractions. I was ripe for the plucking, and he... Her wide mouth expanded into a sudden grin. My dear, he was superb. There wasn't a single false note. Oh, I knew he was putting on a performance, but I didn't care. Something told me that if I didn't find out who he was and what he was really like... I would spend the rest of my life measuring other men against that impossibly romantic image and having them fail and hoping against hope that I would meet him again. That's not a very practical program for a woman of my age. The grin and the glint of self-deprecating humour that brightened her eyes struck a responsive note in Nefret. She wasn't moved to confess all, however. I am sorry, she said. Did you ever meet him? Sethos? She hesitated for a moment, trying to anticipate where a truthful answer might lead her, and then decided it could do no harm. Yes, he unquestionably had a knack for making himself interesting. You felt it too? Nefret smiled. Not really, but I was already head over heels about someone else. You love him very much, don't you? And he feels the same for you. You are both lucky, 
Mrs. She broke off with a little sound of amused vexation. It's almost impossible for me to think of anyone else by that name. I don't suppose you would consider calling me Margaret. You may or may not believe me, but I didn't come here to trap you into an indiscretion. I would like us to be friends. And, she added, with another of those wide, rueful smiles, if either of us is at a disadvantage, it isn't you. You know too many things to my discredit. Nefret didn't know whether that offer of friendship was genuine, but she knew it would be foolish to reject it. Thank you, she said. Margaret, I'd better go and collect my husband. He seems to have gone off with Mr. Coons. He was alone, in fact, just inside the door of the hotel. When he saw her approach, he came out, trying not to look as if he'd been hiding, and took her arm. I thought my absence would give you an excuse to get away, he explained. What were you going on about so long? Nefret repeated the conversation. I've nothing against the woman, Ramsay said thoughtfully. I rather admired her. But those questions about her legal antiquities and her interest in Coen's story make me wonder about her real motive for coming here, particularly in view of our recent encounter. Nefret shook her head decidedly. She still wants to believe he's alive, but she can't know anything, unless... Unless what? Unless he told her. The last thing he wants is an infatuated female, and a journalist at that on his trail, Ramsay said. Then it's just a forlorn hope, Nefret said softly. Stop a minute, Ramsay said. I've had an idea, and I don't want to discuss it in front of the kiddies. The pylons of the Luxor Temple glowed in the afternoon sunlight. Ramses turned to look at them. He'd never finished copying the reliefs in the hyperstyle hall. There was so much to do, so many irreplaceable records that were deteriorating daily. Nefret joggled his elbow. Well, don't get lost in archaeological speculation. Not now. Well, let's suppose that after the initial shock... Minton was canny enough to realise that Mother might have been lying in her teeth. Which she was, except for one vital piece of information. My omniscient mamma wasn't lying about that, but she was, as we've just learned, dead wrong. Let us also suppose that as a journalist and a member of a superior social class, Minton has access to certain sources of information. And don't ask me what, because I haven't the faintest idea. All I'm saying is that she might have learned something from someone that strengthened that forlorn hope. Someone in the war office, you mean? It's awfully vague, Nefret said dubiously. So what do you suggest we do? Cultivate the confounded woman. You can do it, he added hastily. Exchange girlish confidences and all that. Why don't you cultivate her? You do look a bit like him, and she clearly enjoyed that fond embrace at Giza. Damn it, Nefret, you'd know that wasn't my idea. Oh, you're joking? Yes. She slipped her arm through his and leaned against him. I will defend my honour to the best of my ability, Ramsay said. So we cultivate her. It's worth a try. Searching for Sethos all over Luxor is a waste of time and energy. We need to come up with another scheme to make him come to us. He'll be on his guard now if he hasn't already left. I'll believe he's gone when I hear that someone has made off with a pyramid or the Temple of Dendera, Ramses muttered. No, he's still here. The only other thing I can think to do is to try to locate his confederates. This is where we miss Selim and Abdullah. They had and have connections with most of the jolly little tomb robbers of Gurna. I'll see what a few carefully chosen curses will do. So we're going to Gurna? Not today. Do you remember Lansing telling us about the tomb robber, Kuntz, caught in the act? Kuntz gave me the location. I thought we might have a look at it. He ran long fingers through his hair and added morosely, Who knows, the fellow may have been considerate enough to leave a footprint or a scrap of paper with Sethos's cryptogram on it. We'll have to collect Jemana first. Damnation, that's right. I forgot about her. 
However, she was waiting when they reached the dock. Jamil was nowhere to be seen. When Ramses asked for him, his sister shrugged slim shoulders. In the coffee shop, where do you think? I told him to come, but he would not. Shall I go now and tell him again? I'll fetch him, Ramses said. The length of his stride and his formidable scowl told Nefret that the unfortunate Jamil was in for a lecture. It wasn't really fair, since they hadn't told him when they would return. But they wouldn't have had to go searching for Selim or Daoud or any of their other men. Nefret turned to the girl, who was sitting on the edge of the dock. Did you have something to eat? she asked. Yes, they gave me food at the school. The brief answer and the downcast eyes were so unlike her that Nefret asked, Is something wrong? They would not let me have a book. She raised an indignant face. I wanted to read about the god's wives. I would have taken care of it. Nefret sat down and put her arm around Jumana's shoulders. I have books you can borrow. Do you? Will you? I will wrap them in cloth and take very good care of them. The child's face was radiant. She was no child, though. In Egyptian terms, she was a grown woman and ripe for marriage. And with a face like hers, she probably had dozens of suitors panting after her. It would be a crime to let enthusiasm and intelligence like that be lost to a traditional marriage, though. The girl deserved a chance. And I haven't done much to help her, Nefret thought guiltily. Lending books was the least she could do. That pitiful stub of a pencil and tattered notebook. Why hadn't she thought of supplying something better? When Ramses came back, Jamil was trotting at his heels, mumbling excuses and looking more resentful than chastened. He took them across to the Dahabiya, and Nefret made them all wait while she put together a parcel for Jumana. The first volume of Emerson's classic History of Ancient Egypt, pencils and pens, and a bottle of ink, a pristine book of blank paper. With that treasure clasped to her bosom, Jumana did not object to being dismissed for the day. They mounted the horses that had been left in Ashraf's care and headed toward the western cliffs. Jumana left them at the point where the track divided. Her face shone. First time I've seen her struck dumb, Ramsay said. That was a nice thought, dear. I didn't do it to be nice, so you say. My God, she's a beautiful little creature. If she ever looks at a man like that... If she ever looks at you like that... She probably thinks I'm as old as Methuselah, Ramsay said wryly. You aren't as old as the man Yusuf will select for her. No young man could pay the bride price he will ask. I won't let that happen, Ramses. He didn't ask what she meant to do to prevent it. She'd manage it somehow. Her jaw was set. He took her hand. She'll get her chance, I promise. I thought Mr. Lansing said the tomb was behind the Ptolemaic temple, Nefret said when they reached the Asasif. He was mistaken. Cohen said it's closer to Deir el-Bahri. The easiest approach is by way of Hatshepsut's causeway. It was after three o'clock. The sun was in their eyes when they headed west, and heat rose from the baked bare ground. There were few people about. The tourists had retreated to their hotels. The guards were napping in the shade. And, like all sensible excavators, except Emerson, Lansing had stopped for the day. The site was not completely deserted, however. As they passed, a man stood up and ran toward them, his arms waving wildly. "'It's Mr. Barton,' Lefret said, bringing the mare to a halt. "'I wonder what he wants. Another look at you, I expect. Don't be absurd. He reminds one of Don Quixote, doesn't he? Or perhaps one of the windmills. Good afternoon, Mr. Barton.' Barton rocked to a stop. Good afternoon. Are you looking for me, us, Lansing? His eyes were fixed on Nefret, like those of a dog who is hoping for a pat on the head. So Ramses left it to her to answer him. We didn't think you'd be here so late, she said tactfully. We were planning to have a look at the place where Alain caught the would-be tomb robber. Alain? Oh, Cohen's. Yes, that's right. You know where it is? I think so, Ramses said, if you'll excuse us. Mind if I tag along? 
I can keep up. I walk really fast. Nefret was too soft-hearted to resist. She gave him the hoped-for pat. If you like. We'll have to go on foot most of the way anyhow. They left Jamil and the horses beside the second terrace of the temple and went on, following a narrow path that climbed steadily upward, skirting heaps of loose debris. There were many such paths used by the sure-footed and often barefooted people of Gurna, or by goats. Some had been in use since ancient times. When they stopped to catch their breaths, they were high enough to see clear across the cultivation to the river. The line between the green and the barren desert was as sharp as if it had been drawn with a knife point. Nefret could feel perspiration puddling between her breasts and running down her back. There were dark patches on Ramsay's shirt, too, and Barton was breathing hard. He had followed so close behind her that once or twice she'd had to skip to avoid tripping over his extremely large feet. If he had hoped to leap to her assistance, he had been disappointed. "'That's where they found the cache of royal mummies,' Ramsay said, pointing toward the base of the cliff. "'Where?' Barton asked eagerly. "'I read about it, but I haven't seen it yet. Can we get in?' "'No, we can't,' Ramsay said forcibly. "'Not without ropes, and certainly not today.' Barton looked so disappointed he relented. "'I'll show you where it is, but don't entertain any notions about exploring the place on your own. "'The shaft is over forty feet deep, and the last time I was down there, "'the ceilings of the corridors had begun to collapse. "'You've been there?' "'Damn,' Ramsay's thought. "'I should have known he'd take that as a challenge instead of a warning. "'It was some years ago. "'I wouldn't risk it again without assistance.' Another climb brought them to the base of the cliff. There wasn't much to see, only a gaping, irregular black hole. Ramses took hold of Nefret's arm and waved Barton back. Careful. The service des Antiquités ought to have covered the opening. It's too much of a temptation to impetuous idiots. There's nothing down there, you know. That wasn't exactly true. Emile Bruch had removed the coffins and miscellaneous funerary equipment over thirty years earlier. But it had been a rushed job, and Emerson had always been of the opinion that the tomb ought to be properly excavated. Ramses wasn't about to mention that to Barton, who had edged closer and was peering down into the hole. Ramses understood his fascination. It was one of the great stories of Egyptology. The bodies of Egypt's royalty, violated and robbed and stacked up like cordwood, to lie hidden for almost three thousand years— discovered by a family of modern tomb robbers who surreptitiously marketed stolen objects until they were caught by the Antiquities Department. "'We'd better go on,' he said. The going wasn't easy. The path rose and fell, twisted and turned, over the piles of loose debris that bordered the Theban cliffs, the result of centuries of weathering by wind and rain. Barton kept catching Nefret's arm, throwing her off balance and then steadying her, he didn't seem to realise that was what he was doing, and she was kind enough not to complain. The opening of the royal cache was not far behind them when Ramsay stopped. That looks like it. There was a long vertical shadow at the spot he indicated. It was only one of many. Splintered and cracked, the rock face rose high above them. How can you tell? Nefret asked, shaking off Barton's hand. It's the right distance. Ramses looked round. He said there's a boulder to the south of the cleft that resembles a sheep's head. They all do, Nefret muttered. I'll go up and have a look, Ramses said. Stand back a bit. The climb wasn't particularly difficult. He'd been up and down cliffs like these a hundred times. The surface was so uneven, it offered plenty of hand and footholds. One only had to test each one before putting one's weight on it. Moving slowly but surely... He was almost at the crevice when Nefret screamed. A louder, deeper sound followed, drowning out her voice, but he had already reacted, flinging himself to one side, his feet and hands groping for holes. The boulder passed within inches of his right hand, accompanied by a shower of smaller stones, and struck the ground with a force that sent splintered fragments fountaining upward. They rained down on the two bodies huddled against the cliff. Ramses couldn't remember how he got down. 
The rents in the front of his shirt suggested he'd slid most of the way. Of the three of them, Nefret had come off best, thanks to Barton's prompt action. When Ramses reached them, the young man was still holding her, his long arms wrapped tightly round her body, and his head bowed over hers. Ramses removed him with rather more force than was necessary and bent over his wife. She pushed her hair out of her eyes and let out a cry of relief. Thank God! The last thing I saw was that rock coming straight at you. Help me up. Are you sure you... Yes, I'm fine. Thanks to Mr. Barton. Ramses let go her hands and turned apologetically to Barton. I'm frightfully sorry. Sprawled on the ground, with his arms and legs at odd angles like a four-legged spider, Barton grinned feebly. No, I'm sorry. I didn't see. I should have... I was almost too slow. Did I hurt her? I didn't mean... Yes, all right, Ramsay said, interpreting the incoherent comments. Barton had been gaping at Nefret and hadn't noticed anything amiss until she cried out. Nefret was on her feet, a little pale but steady. There was someone up there, she pointed. I saw his head and shoulders, and then... Oh, my God, look out! The figure seemed to float rather than fall. Full sleeves and flowing garments billowing gracefully, like the wings of a giant bird. But it hit the ground with a solid and sickening thud. Ramses wasn't conscious of having moved until a pained grunt from Nefret brought him to the realization that he had pushed her down and was lying on top of her. Get up, she gasped, shoving at him. Is he dead? The body had landed practically at Barton's feet. It was face down, and as far as Ramses was concerned, it could stay that way. The fellow had to be dead. There was blood spattered all over the ground and on Barton's boots. He knew his wife wouldn't be satisfied until she'd made sure, though. The face was unrecognizable, a ruin of broken bone and raw flesh. Barton spun round, covering his mouth with his hand, and Ramses patted him absently on the back while he watched Nefret go through the ritual and, in his opinion, unnecessary motions. She looked up at him and shook her head. Her hair was coming down, long strands of gold curling over her shoulders. She's so beautiful, he thought. Aloud, he said gruffly, find something to cover his face or Barton will throw up. No, listen, I'm really sorry. The young man wiped his mouth on his sleeve and said pathetically, I never saw a dead person before. Not a fresh one. This one's bad, Ramses admitted. Never mind covering him in a fret. Take Barton away from here. Yes, of course. She slipped her arm through the young man's. Don't be embarrassed, Mr. Barton. I'm a doctor, you know, and we're used to this sort of thing. So I've heard. Barton managed to summon a feeble smile. Uh, do you think... Do you think you could call me George? Ramses waited until George and his wife were out of sight before he bent over the body. He had to clean his hands with sand after he'd finished. When he joined Nefret and Barton, she was kneeling beside the young man, inspecting him for injuries. Her hair fell over her shoulders, framing a face becomingly flushed with heat and excitement. Her lips were slightly parted, and the tip of her tongue protruded, the way it did when she was concentrating. "'There's a bump,' Nefret announced, probing a spot on the left side of Barton's head. "'How many fingers am I holding up?' Barton's glazed stare was suggestive of concussion, but Ramses felt sure it wasn't the bump on the head that had addled his brains. He finally got the word out. Uh, three. Good. Why don't you come back to the boat with us and let me give you a proper examination? Those cuts ought to be disinfected. The house the Metropolitan people had built was closer, but by then Barton would have agreed to accompany a fret into the fires of hell. He made only a feeble protest. Uh, it's too much trouble. It's the least we can do, Ramsay said. You saved my wife from serious injury. Can you make it back to Dera Bahri? 
Sure. Good. I'll meet you there. Nefret bit off a particularly ripe swear word as he turned toward the cliff face. Barton's eyes widened. Are you going up there? What for? It was an accident, wasn't it? I mean, the fellow must have been drunk, or... No, Muslims don't drink, do they? Sick, maybe, or... He was leaning against that rock, and it fell, and then he... It must have been an accident. Ramses didn't reply. The climb was easier this time, and before long he'd reached the place from which he was sure the missile had come. The path leading along the side of the cliff from Deir el Medina to the Valley of the Kings. It had been used by the men who lived in the village and worked in the royal tombs almost 4,000 years ago. There was no one in sight in either direction when he climbed onto the level. He looked down. Nefret and Barton were still there. He'd known she wouldn't leave the spot until she was sure he was safe. She raised her arm in salute, and he waved back, gesturing them to proceed on their way. The surface of the path was disturbed by the passage of feet, shod and unshod, animal and human. There were no distinctive prints. At one spot, a fresh break showed pale and clean, where a section of rock had been levered away. It wouldn't have required much time or effort to do the job, nor would there have been any reason to suspect foul play, unless one was looking for evidence of it. Bits of the time-weathered rock were always crumbling and falling. But the man had used a lever of some sort. The marks were there, and... There were other marks, scuffed and rubbed, but not entirely obliterated. Ramses met only one person as he wended his way toward Deir el Bahri, a jovial villain from Gurneh, who greeted him without surprise, giving him a knowing grin, and asked if he was looking for lost tombs. He went the long way round, scrambling down the steep but safe path behind the north side of the temple. Nefret and Barton were waiting with Jamil and the horses when he reached the level of the second terrace. Find anything? the American asked. No. Listen, I didn't mean to pry. It's just that I've heard so many stories about you folks. It was an accident, no doubt. Ramses turned to Jamil. Nefret must have told him what had happened. He looked more alert than Ramses had ever seen him. Someone will have to go to Luxor, Jamil. The uh, accident must be reported to the police. They will do nothing, Jamil said indifferently. He was probably right. Ramses thought guiltily of the dead man, abandoned and prey to predators. But the idea of retrieving the battered remains was too much even for him. Nevertheless, they must be told, he said, and at once. At Nefret's suggestion... He sent one of the gaffiers, motivating him with a generous tip. Jamil would stop off in every coffee shop in Luxor before he went to the Taftish, if he bothered to go there at all. They had drinks in the saloon while Nefret worked on Barton. He had turned bright pink, like a schoolboy, when she insisted he remove his shirt. His injuries were superficial, cuts and abrasions and bruises, almost all of them on his back. Nursing his own whiskey, Ramses made courteous conversation and thought inhospitable thoughts. But it was hard to remain aloof with a man who was drinking your beer and making admiring comments about your work. By the time Barton left, they were using one another's first names. Barton was in no hurry to go. Nefret had to remind him twice that Lansing might be wondering what had happened to him before he put his glass down and rose to his feet, and then he started thanking her again. Ramses took his arm and led him out. "'Shall I tell Ambrose what happened?' Barton asked. "'Why not?' "'Uh, no reason, I guess. "'Well, thank you again.' When Ramses returned to the saloon, Nasir was setting the table for dinner. He was less clumsy than he had been, but he had found a new excuse to linger by folding the napkins into intricate shapes. His ambition exceeded his skill. Tonight's effort was probably meant to be a flying bird, though it more resembled a decapitated duck. 
Ramses dismissed him with a few brusque words and went to stand by Nefret, who was curled up on the divan. You hurt his feelings, she said reproachfully. Stop him doing that, then. It takes forever to untie the knots. All right, darling, I'll try. George is a nice boy, isn't he? It's a pity he had to have such an unpleasant experience. He'd better get used to it if he stays in Egypt. Oh, really, Ramses? One doesn't have bodies dropped at one's feet every day. We might ask him and Mr. Lansing and Monsieur Legrand for dinner one evening. With Miss Minton. If you want to waste time on social encounters, that is up to you. I was under the impression that you meant to persuade the woman to confide in you. She's not likely to talk freely when others are around. Goodness, but you're in a grouchy mood this evening. All right, we'll make it a threesome. You can excuse yourself after dinner and I'll get to work on her. When? The sooner the better. The Vandergelts are arriving on Sunday. And we'll be busy with them for a few days. Tomorrow, then? If she's free. Why are you looming over me like that? I thought you liked being loomed over. Only when something interesting is likely to develop. Shall I put dinner back? No, I'm hungry. Her smile faded, but she waited until after Nasir had served the first course before she went on the attack. What is it? Something you found when you searched the body? There was nothing you didn't see for yourself. No means of identification. Nothing distinctive about his clothing. It might have been an accident. If you believe in unholy coincidences, it's conceivable that a chunk of rock crumbled away just when I happened to be climbing. But he couldn't have fallen unless he was standing on top of the ridge that bounds the path on the cliffside. It's not a straight drop. You think he was pushed? Nefret said slowly. It's not a straight drop, Ramses repeated impatiently. He was lifted and pitched over. You saw how he fell, backward, face up. He landed on his head, but the damage shouldn't have been that extensive. He was hit in the face before he was thrown over. There were drops of blood on the rock. So there were two people up there. One who tried to kill you, the other who tried... You don't know what either of them intended, Ramsay said. Nor do I. Damn it, Ramsay, stop interrupting me. She broke off, biting her lip, as Nasir trotted in with the next course. But the argument didn't end there. Ramses knew he wasn't behaving well, but she'd come so close to injury that afternoon, and it had been that gawky young American who had shielded her, and Luxor wasn't safe after all, and he hadn't the faintest clue as to the motive or the man behind the attack. I tell you, it couldn't have been... He glanced at Nasir, who was so unnerved by their loud voices that he was juggling plates in his anxiety to get out of the room. It couldn't have been one of that lot. Who else could it have been? You haven't... You didn't... No. How many times must I tell you before you believe me? Then who was the second man? What second man? You said... I was theorizing. We don't know there were two people up there. Could it have been... She broke off and directed an inimical glance at their unfortunate steward. Completely undone by a sign of disfavor from his goddess, Nasir burst into tears and fled. Christ! Ramsay slammed his knife down. My fond uncle, you mean. Nursemaid or guardian angel. You think we need one, don't you? Obviously, I can't take care of myself or you. You're impossible. I'm going to write the parents and tell them what happened. Her hair always came loose when she was angry. The lamplight ran golden fingers along the curling locks. Her cheeks were flushed and her eyes shone with tears of fury. Do as you like, Ramsay said shortly. I'm going to bed. It's been a rather a long day. He was tired, and he'd acquired several new bruises during his precipitate descent of the cliff. But he was still awake, open-eyed, in the dark, when Nefret slipped in and closed the door. She stood still for a few moments, waiting for him to speak. When he remained mute and motionless, she moved quietly to the other side of the room and began to undress. She took her time about it, hanging her clothes neatly over a chair before she slipped into a nightgown. His night vision had always been excellent, and he had a hard time keeping his breath even. 
She tiptoed toward the bed. He was about to reach out for her when she threw herself down beside him. The bed springs squealed. I know you aren't asleep. How dare you behave this way? He caught her in his arms. I'm sorry. And don't apologize. Aren't you being a little inconsistent? I was afraid. She hid her face against his shoulder. That's why I was so horrid. I wasn't at my best either. Oh, I don't know. It was a jolly good argument. He couldn't joke about it. I didn't lie to you, Nefret. I'd never take on another job without telling you. Consulting me. That's what I meant to say. I can't make sense of what happened today, but I'm certain it had nothing to do with... I don't want to talk about it. Her lips moved from his throat to his chin. You shaved? Uh, well, uh, uh, I thought... Oh, darling, you really are adorable. She was laughing as his mouth found hers. Some time later, he said drowsily, I'm beginning to understand why mother and father argue so often. Making up afterward is awfully pleasant. Mm. It was hardly more than a breath against his shoulder. He thought she was asleep until a very quiet, very firm voice said, Now tell me about Enid Fraser. The following is an excerpt from Letter Collection T. Dearest Mother and Father, You'll have received Ramsay's telegram by now. I won't apologise. I told you I couldn't keep things from him. In order to set a good example, I will now tell you several things you need to know, with, I should add, the agreement of my husband. First, Miss Minton is here. Margaret, I should say. She asked me to use her first name. I don't trust her one inch, but I can't make out what she's after. Unless... But that would be insane, wouldn't it? She seemed very interested in tomb robberies and antiquities theft. We met her at luncheon today, and Alain Cuentz joined us. He's back at Dera Medina, and she pounced on him with all her claws extended when he casually mentioned that it was he who blew up the German house, because, he claimed, it was a centre for the illicit antiquities trade, and other things. See what you can find out about that. Howard Carter's back in Cairo, I understand, Alan denied that Howard was involved, but in a way that implied the reverse. The other point of interest is that someone dropped a rock on us today. We were near Deir el-Bahri, looking for a tomb Alain said had been robbed, and Ramses was halfway up the cliff when it happened. The rock missed him, but not by much, and shortly thereafter, a body followed the rock. It landed practically on top of poor young Mr. Barton, who was with us. The man's face had been smashed, possibly before he fell. I'm giving you the bare facts. I don't know what they mean, at least I hope I don't, but I beg you will not come rushing to our rescue. Ramses would hate that, and so would I. We have refrained from rushing to your rescue, you know. I thought Ramses was going to explode when I started telling him about your recent activities. Do try and stay out of trouble, will you? On a brighter note, we look forward to seeing the Vandergelts. I'll do my best for Bertie. Much love to all, Nefred. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Margaret Minton did not respond to Nefret's note inviting her for dinner. They were lingering over a rather late breakfast when their messenger returned with the information that the sit had left the hotel early that morning and that the concierge had no idea when she would return. Gossiping, as was customary, he had asked several questions and learned a few more facts. She had taken a picnic basket and hired one of the dragomen, so it seemed likely. But she had planned a long excursion, Ramses interrupted impatiently. Which of the dragomen? Said, their informant chuckled. He won out over the others who wanted to go with her by saying he was a trusted friend of yours, brother of demons who had helped you to capture many thieves and murderers. Said. Ramses ran agitated fingers through his hair. Good God, the fellow has to be a hundred years old, and he's still the biggest coward in Luxor. If she gets in trouble, he'll be about as much use as Jumana. Bless. Why would she get herself in trouble, though? 
because she's a busybody and a journalist and a woman of dangerous self-confidence. And she dined with Coons last night. I think you're needlessly concerned. Anyhow, there's nothing we can do about it. The messenger, who was squatting on the floor, listening interestedly, volunteered. They were coming to the West Bank. Ramses handed over the expected bakshish, and the man left. Jamil and Jumana had arrived by then. As they descended the stairs, Ramses said, Did you write the parents? Yes. She glanced at him from under her lashes. I sent the letter off this morning. What did you tell them? The bare facts. You didn't mention him, did you? No, but I still disagree. Their first step that morning was at the Vandergelt's house to make sure all was in readiness for the travellers. The steward, or Major Domo, as he preferred to be called, was a Belgian who had been in Cyrus's service most of his life. Though the Vandergelt's had not been in residence often of late, Albert prided himself on keeping the place immaculate and ready for occupancy at a moment's notice. Nefret assured him they would meet the Vandergelt's at the station and bring them home. All right, that's done, she said, as they headed down the track away from the house. I suppose now you want to look up Alain? How did you know? I know practically everything about you, his wife murmured. And I intend to find out the rest of it before I'm done. There's Christabel Pankhurst and Dolly Bellingham and Layla and the girl in Chicago and Sylvia Gorst. I never had anything to do with Sylvia. Can't stand the woman, never could. Well, I thought she was probably lying, Lafrette said calmly. We'll talk about it later. Not if I can help it, Ramses thought. He was fairly sure he couldn't, though. Coence was at work, supervising a small crew excavating one of the workmen's houses. He came running toward them and took Nefret's hands, cradling them in his furry paws. I heard horrible, dreadful, my poor girl. Nefret managed to free her hands. I've almost certainly seen more corpses than you have, Alain. Your concern is needless. But I feel responsible. Did you find the worthless tomb, then? No, Ramses said. The man even had hair on the palms of his hands. Perhaps my directions were not clear enough. Believe me, though, the place is not worth your trouble. We didn't come about that, Nefret said. We were curious about what you told Miss Minton last night. It was a curious conversation, Cohen said with a grin. Come and join me in my humble quarters. I'll have Mahmoud make tea. They were humble enough, only a small tent pitched against a slope with a camp stove and a few other minimal comforts. Is this where you stay? Nefret asked, accepting the single stool. Part of the time, I rent a room at Hussein Ali's hotel, if you can call it that. I keep my clothes and notes there, and it is possible to have a bath if one doesn't mind curious onlookers and an occasional dead fish in the water. The tub's in the courtyard. Her look of disgust made him shout with laughter. It's not so bad. Not the way you people live, but it has a certain charm. I'm sure it does, said Ramses, who had lived under even less comfortable circumstances when he was engaged in certain of his undercover jobs. We tried to reach Miss Minton this morning, but were told she'd gone off for the day. Do you have any idea where? His brusque tone sobered Coens. She didn't say anything to me. No reason why she should. Hold on, though. She was very curious about the German house. In fact, all she'd talk about was the illegal antiquities game. Said she was thinking of doing a series of feature stories about some of the more notorious players. The Rasuls, that Italian fellow your parents rounded up a few years back. What was his name? And Sethos, of course. It was always startling to hear that name, but it wasn't really surprising. The Emersons had tried for years to enlist the aid of the police and the Service des Antiquités in tracking down the master criminal. Those who had doubted his very existence to begin with had changed their minds after certain of Sethos's activities became public. He'd once written a letter to a London newspaper explaining with the greatest politeness 
that he was sorry to have offended Mrs. Emerson by robbing a well-known politician while she was picketing his house. I told her what I knew, Coens went on. She'd bought me a very good dinner and a quantity of excellent wine. She kept prodding me for more details, so I finally pointed out that you and your family knew more about the subject than I. Not that much, Ramsay said. Our encounters with Sethos and Ricchetti are public knowledge. Ricchetti, that was the name. I wasn't here at the time, but I heard about it, and about Sethos. Some of the stories rather strain one's credulity. Is it true that he was after the Dashur treasure, and would have got to it before de Morgan, if you hadn't stopped him? The story has undoubtedly been exaggerated, Ramsay said. Coens let out a whoop of laughter. Not as much as Margaret will exaggerate it. Whatever happened to the fellow anyhow? Could he be the one behind the latest outbreak of thefts? He's dead, Ramsay said. He rose to his feet. We mustn't keep you any longer. They had to remove Jumana from the edge of the dig, where she sat scribbling in her notebook to the barely contained indignation of the workers. The ruins of the former German expedition house were behind the Ramesseum. The local people had rummaged through them, removing anything that was salvageable. All that was left was a pile of blackened ashes. I hadn't realized they'd done such a thorough job of it, Nefret said. Complete destruction, Ramses agreed. One can't help wondering why. Carter and Coens, if it was they, acted without authority. Illegally, in fact. I expect Margaret will make a dramatic tale of it. Yes. There's no sense hanging about here. Let's go on. Minton had been on the West Bank. Several of the people Ramses questioned had seen her with Said, and helpfully pointed them in various directions, none of which led to anything. Finally, Nefret said, This is a waste of time. If you're all that determined to locate her, she'll be at the hotel this evening. Shall I tell Ma Man we are dining out? However, when they reached the Winter Palace, they discovered that the Sit had not returned. Ramses tugged fretfully at his tie. He hated wearing evening dress almost as much as his father did. Where could she have gone? Led on a wild goose chase by Said, perhaps, Nefret said. She didn't share his concern. She knew the amiable willingness of Luxor guides to supply anything the client asked for. In a fair imitation of Said's wine, she went on... You look for tomb robber, Sit. Yes, I know many tomb robber. I take you to see them. You give me bakshish. Ramsay's tight lips relaxed into an unwilling smile. So you think she's sitting in Said's house drinking vile tea while he parades half the population of Gunner past her? Each of them with a more lurid story, Nefret agreed. Stop fussing, darling, and let's have dinner. If she's not back by the time we finish, well, we'll worry about that later. The elegant dining salon was only half full, though it was Saturday. Most of the guests were Americans, with a scattering of other nationalities, including a few British officials. Luxor was a popular weekend excursion for the archaeologically inclined, and for those who were bored with the routine of Cairo life. The service at the Winter Palace was so good as to be mildly annoying. Waiters, wine stewards, and innumerable flunkies hemmed them round. Ramses handed the ornate, gilded wine list back to the maitre d'. There are no German wines on the list, but I feel certain you have them. A Riesling will suit, 1911 or 12. You're being deliberately provocative, aren't you? Nefret demanded. Yes, I despise the politicizing of harmless ideas and people and objects. Nefret snatched up her evening bag in time to save it from a sprinkle of water. One of the underwaiters had been too quick or too clumsy, filling her water glass. He received a low-voiced reprimand from his superior and cringed away. Malesh, Nefret said impatiently, leave the fellow alone. He did no harm. An hour later, they were finishing their dinner, and there had been no sign of Margaret. Nefret picked up her bag. I'm going to freshen up, she announced. I'll stop by the desk first and ask about Margaret. She hadn't been worried, not really, but she was relieved to hear that Miss Minton had returned and gone directly to her room after collecting her messages. She looked very tired, 
the concierge volunteered, and uh, warm. Do you want that I should ring her room? No, that's all right. Thank you. The tactful euphemisms conveyed a picture of a woman staggering with exhaustion, sweat-stained and grubby. Said must have led her a merry dance. Grinning, Nefret went on her way. Square in the middle of the marble floor passage that led to the ladies' parlour was a kneeling figure, a woman, black-robed and veiled. She wrung out a cloth into the pail beside her and went back to scrubbing the floor. One of the ladies ahead of Nefret, bejeweled and befurred, drew her satin skirts aside. One would suppose the management would not allow these filthy females in the place until after the guests have retired. The scrubwoman crouched lower and rubbed even harder. She might not have understood the words, but the tone of contempt was unmistakable. Nefret said, "'One of your elegant friends probably threw up. "'You're quite right, though. The management should have left it. "'Wouldn't that have been nice for you?' Voice and stare sent the two ladies scuttling off. Nefret reached into her evening bag and took out a few coins. "'Thank you.' "'But I really can't accept Bakshish, said a voice from around the level of her knees. "'The scrap woman stood up and took her hand. "'Let's get out of this. There will be more of them.' Three other women entered the corridor. "'The scrap woman dropped Nefret's hand and scuttled past them, head bowed. "'Nefret staggered after her. The him. "'By the time she joined him, in a pillared niche nearby, "'he had removed the robe and veil.' and might have been an ordinary guest of the hotel, clad in well-cut evening clothes, wearing a look of bland superiority, and displaying a set of large, protruding teeth. It was his hands that gave him away. She'd observed them earlier, fumbling with the pitcher of water. You were the waiter! Hell and damnation! Not the waiter, only his clumsy assistant. I've been working here for almost a week. I had expected you would come round before this. Do sit down, won't you? Nefret sank onto the velvet-cushioned bench. You left your bucket. And there it will remain. Let's hope someone falls over it. I was forced to that role, because it's so damn difficult to get you alone. You couldn't have known we'd come tonight. You sent Margaret a message this morning. I thought it likely that when she didn't respond, you would come looking for her. How did you know? Nefret gasped. Oh, I've been on duty for hours. We oppressed members of the working class put in long days, but we are lazy beggars who are unable to resist stopping to gossip. I saw her go off with Said, and later I recognized your crewman, who obligingly told me to whom he had delivered the note. I had, of course, made my preparations in advance. It's quite easy to change roles when you've had as much practice as I. He waggled his teeth at her. Amusement won out over outrage. She started to laugh. Sethos put his hand over her mouth. No uncontrolled hilarity, if you please. It might attract attention. Listen carefully, Nefret. I want you and Ramses out of Luxor. Get him back to Cairo. You're the only one who can do it. Why? God, you're as bad as Amelia. All I can... All I will tell you is that he is in danger here. From whom? Not you? Thank you for your scepticism. No, not me. Let me think how to put this. I discovered when I tried to rebuild my old organization that someone had got in ahead of me. Someone like Ricchetti? It's a lucrative business, Sethos said, somewhat evasively. There are always enterprising souls ready to take advantage of a vacancy. How many bodies have to fall on you before you get the point? Nefret said slowly, you heard about what happened yesterday. Everyone's heard about it. If you two go on prying, you'll be hurt. Nefret put her hand on his sleeve. What about you? Won't you please reconsider what you're doing? It's a dangerous game, and the other players are dangerous men. Surely you've put enough by to retire, permanently? She spoke quickly and earnestly, trying to hold his eyes with hers using the little tricks every woman knows to convince him of her sincerity and her interest. She thought his face softened for a moment, but then he laughed and said lightly, Into the bosom of the family? I can't really see Radcliffe being pleased at the prospect. 
Besides, he'd want me to give up my ill-gotten gains. So would Mother. They couldn't make me do it, though, Sethos said, with a toothy smile. Prettily done, Nefret. You're a charming creature, but don't waste your charm on me. I've a little present for you. He took it from his inside breast pocket, a bag of colourful cotton, clumsily stitched together with a drawstring of thin cord. Even before she took it and felt the weight, she knew what it was. I've heard he won't carry a gun, Sethos said. I hope you don't share his sentiments. I share them, but I'll do anything that will keep him safe. Just like a woman. Your principles always yield to expediency. Do you know how to use it? Yes. Good. I'm in dead earnest, Nefret. Get him away from here, and try to take that damned woman with you. Margaret? Why? That, at least, should be obvious, said her uncle by marriage, in exasperation. She's as obstinate and inquisitive as Amelia. She's no fool, either, if she goes on the way she's begun. <sighs> Tell her some fantastic yarn that will induce her to follow you to Cairo. Offer her a scoop, a corpse, a curse, something. Now, you'd better get back to him before he comes looking for you. Doesn't he ever let you off the lead? He was five feet away, moving with a deceptive quickness that reminded Nefret of his brother before she could react. She jumped up, took two steps, and stopped. She'd have to run to catch him up. A pretty sight that would be, Mrs. Emerson, the younger, pelting through the lobby of the Winter Palace in pursuit of a strange man. A second later, he was out of sight. He'd done it again. From now on, I'll be on guard against provocative comments like that, she told herself firmly. He used them like slaps on the face, jarring the listener into temporary immobility. Off the lead, as if she were a faithful hound. She managed to stuff the crude cotton bundle into her evening bag, but she knew Ramses would notice the bulge. He noticed everything. He noticed. Not the evening bag at first, but her air of suppressed excitement. You've been a long time, he said, searching her face. Has something happened? Yes, and I don't want coffee. Let's go. I'll tell you as soon as we're alone. They had hired a falaka instead of having one of their men row them across. Nefret loved sailing the dark waters under the starlit sky. As soon as they took their places and the boat was underway, she launched into her story. He didn't interrupt until she repeated what he had said about Margaret Minton. So he calls her Margaret, does he? Try to remember his exact words, Nefret. It may be important. She went over it again. She left the gun until last. His only comment was, I saw there was something. Don't show it to me now. Accustomed as she was to his self-control, the cool tones worried her a little. Are you angry because I didn't tell you while we were at the Winter Palace? She said meekly. He put his arm round her shoulders. No, there was no sense in staying there. It would have been futile to try and find him. But the arm under the fine broadcloth of his coat was hard as granite. They had coffee in the saloon. They were to meet the train next morning, but it was still early, and Ramses wouldn't rest until he'd picked over that conversation, word by word and syllable by syllable. You told him we cared about his safety? It must have been a very affecting performance. I do care, Nefret protested. How could I not after what he's done for us? He has a lot of admirable qualities, and a lot of the family charm. He reminds me more and more of father. And of you. Ramses had removed coat, waistcoat, and tie as soon as he was on board. Pacing up and down the saloon, he pushed a lock of hair out of his eyes and said caustically, Mother tried for years to redeem him, as she put it. Do you suppose you can succeed where she failed? He's older now, and he's been through a lot, Nefret said temperately. And I think he was sincere when he said he was concerned about you. Far be it from me, said her husband, to cast cold water on that touching assumption. But there is another, less sentimental interpretation of his seeming concern. I know. He's after something, Ramses muttered. Something big, 
something that requires time and privacy. He's not worried about the locals. He's always used a judicious blend of intimidation and reward to win their support. And they'd have nothing to gain by turning him in. Hell, there's nobody to whom they could turn him in. The local police are useless or corrupt, and the service des antiquités hasn't the manpower. And the British authorities are too busy with the war to care about a few artifacts. The only person they might approach is... You. Yes. Not as myself, but as father's representative. There's an outside chance that one of the lads might be moved by old loyalties or by fear of the father of curses. I'll give him this much credit, Ramses added grudgingly. I don't believe he would do me an injury, and he certainly wouldn't harm you. But he's not going to let us stop him either. What he did tonight was typically ingenious. Appealing to you on my account with veiled hints of danger. They weren't so veiled. He said there was another player in the game. Ramses dismissed this with a brusque gesture. We've seen no sign of anyone else. Right. People drop rocks and dead bodies on you all the time. Maybe he only meant to frighten us off. Sethos? He wouldn't take the risk of hurting either of us. His lips tightened in exasperation. You've gone soft on him. Like Mother and Margaret, giving you the gun was a particularly clever touch. Did he ask you not to tell me about it? No, Nefret said. Let's have a look at it. He threw himself down on the divan next to her and drew the weapon out of its clumsy container. Pretty little thing, he said, with a curl of his lip. It's the newest model of Mother's beloved ladysmith, fully loaded. He swung the cylinder out, except for the seventh shot, the one in the chamber under the hammer. Since there's no safety catch, that would prevent a nasty accident in case the gun was dropped. I know. Mother let you play with hers, did she? Would you rather I didn't carry it? You're asking for my approval? Nefret, you know why I don't carry a gun. This isn't the first time I've asked myself whether I have the right to take that position. But I can't. He bent his head so that she couldn't see his face, and when he went on, his voice was tired and defeated, like that of an old man. You were worried about my accepting another assignment. You needn't have been. I won't. I can't. I've lost my nerve, Nefret. The very thought of violence makes me sick. How does it feel to have a coward for a husband? Nefret almost laughed as one does at a statement so outrageously false it is tantamount to a joke. He wasn't joking, though. He really meant it. She wanted to put her arms round him, but the situation was too serious for caresses and soothing denials. It's me, she thought. This is what I've done to him. He's afraid for me, not for himself. And he can't see the difference. And he won't believe me if I tell him. That is one of the most ridiculous statements you've ever made, she said. She knew it wasn't enough. Good of you to say so. He smiled at her, but his eyes were hooded and opaque. Well, that's the end of tonight's little drama. Keep the gun. One can't refuse a gift from a fond uncle, can one? Chapter 11 The train de luxe, first class only, except for a second class car reserved for the servants of the travellers, departed on Monday, Wednesday and Saturday. It was not deluxe enough for Cyrus, who would have borrowed the Sultan's carriage and had it hitched to the train, had he been able. Failing that, he reserved an entire car for his party, which included Daoud. There was no one better than Daoud to look after an invalid, and Bertie had taken quite a liking to him. They carried with them every comfort Cairo could provide, from hampers of food to linen sheets for the berths. A flurry of telegrams had assured us that everything was in readiness for the travellers upon their arrival, and that they would be met at the station. When the train pulled away on Saturday evening, only an hour late, Emerson let out a gusty sigh. What a fuss! The boy would be better off if everyone left him alone. Now, Emerson, you know that's nonsense. He seemed brighter. 
but he has a long way to go. Senia was good for him, I think. Senia had carried on like a small tragedienne when we denied her request to accompany the Vandergelts. She was reluctant to give up her self-appointed role as Bertie's nurse, but her real reason for wanting to go to Luxor was that she missed Ramses. We'll take her with us to the dig tomorrow, Emerson said. That will cheer her up. I don't believe in rewarding children for bad behaviour, Emerson. She's only six. What do you expect her to do? Sit in the house all day while we're at Giza? There is no school on Sunday. I ought to take her to church. Her religious training has been sadly neglected since we got here. Be damned to that, said Emerson. I need you on the dig. We've lost several days, and with Dowd gone, we're even more short-handed. Do you intend to begin on the Queen's Pyramid tomorrow? Emerson gave me a severe look. That sounds like blackmail, Peabody. He was just making one of his little jokes. We'd already decided that the Queen's Pyramid should be our next project. At least I had, and Emerson had not said we would not. Since Friday was the day of rest for our Muslim friends, we had become accustomed to working on the Sabbath. It was a frightful nuisance to dress and drive all the way into Cairo to attend services, so I conducted a brief service of my own, with prayer and reading aloud from Scripture. At Gargery's request, we also sang a few hymns. He favoured the militant or the lugubrious of these. I had no objection to a rousing chorus of onward Christian soldiers, but to hear Gargery bellowing out verses like, Dark was the night, sin warred against us, heavy the load of sorrow we bore, was somewhat alarming. Senia, who was unacquainted with sin in any form, enjoyed it very much. Emerson did not attend. After this, we all set out for Giza. Senia had apologised very sweetly for her behaviour, and we were all in a cheerful frame of mind, except for Horace, who was never in a cheerful frame of mind, and who hated riding in his basket. Emerson complained, of course, about Dowd's absence and a number of other things, but I could tell he was looking forward to investigating the pyramid. I had given the place only a cursory inspection before. A closer examination indicated that the task before us was not going to be easy. The pyramid itself was the best preserved of the three that had been built for Khufu's queens. The names of several such ladies were known from other sources, but the precise ownership of the small pyramids was yet to be determined. Like the other tombs at Giza, all three had been cased with fine limestone, which had been stripped off leaving the step-like core. The entrance to the substructure was on the north side. Sand had drifted high around the base, burying the opening and the remains of the funerary chapel on the south side. If, as we had cause to suspect, it was the latest of several similar shrines, disentangling the various levels would be a daunting task. However, that was all to the good. It would keep Emerson busily occupied for some time. So we rolled up our sleeves, metaphorically speaking, and got to work. The first order of business was a meticulous survey of the area. Emerson and I set about this while Selim arranged the photographic equipment. I saw Senia starting to scramble up a slope of sand and was about to call out a sharp warning when Gargery, close on her heels, as always, pulled her away. Go and look for bones, Senia, I ordered. Her lower lip protruded. I am bored with bones. Aunt Nefret is the only one who likes them, and she isn't here. Potsherds, then. Ramses likes them very much. You can have a collection ready for him when he comes back. He likes things with writing on them better. Look for them, then, I said in exasperation. We're all going to be busy for a while, so amuse yourself like a good girl. I watched the trio depart. First Senia trotting along at a brisk pace, then Horus, then Gargery, remaining a safe distance from the cat, who would not allow anyone to come between him and Senia. Gargery was still limping a little. I didn't waste my sympathy on him, however. It had been his choice to come with us, and he wouldn't have relinquished his post as guard for Senia if he had had to crawl after her. 
I can't help blaming myself for the suggestion that she find something interesting for Ramses, though in the end, the result would probably have been the same. They would have found their opportunity sooner or later. It was sooner than they could have hoped, for the child remembered the inscribed stealer, had headed straight for the dump site where that object had been. It was a considerable distance away, and the terrain was uneven, with hollows and heaps of sand between. Her high-pitched scream cut across the distance like a train whistle. Before it stopped, with shocking suddenness, Emerson was off and running. Selim dropped the camera. "'Sit! What? Follow me!' I cried, and went after Emerson. He had to cast about a bit before he found them, so I was on the scene almost as soon as he. Gargery lay flat on the ground, struggling with a man who was dressed like one of the gaffiers. After the first horrified look, I realised my unfortunate butler was not really fighting. He was only trying to hold on to the fellow, who was kicking and pounding him with his fists. Arms locked round the man's leg. Gargery hung on him like grim death, and it wasn't until Emerson dragged his captive away from him that he raised his head. Spitting out a mouthful of sand, he gasped, "'The other one took her. It was that same chap, the one that showed her the stealer, sir. He said he had something else for her, and then he took hold of her, sir, and madam, and that one there knocked me down, and... and... "'I have failed in me duty, sir and madam.' "'No, you haven't,' said Emerson, who was holding his prisoner by the throat. The man was no longer struggling. His terrified eyes were fixed on Emerson. Gargery was almost as wild-eyed as the prisoner. He kept flailing around, trying to stand, and would, I expect, have gone running off in frantic and futile pursuit had I not restrained him. I was, of course, intensely concerned, but I knew haste would accomplish nothing.' "'It was too late to follow the other villain,' I said as much to Gargery, adding, "'This fellow knows where his companion has taken her. "'How you managed to hang on to him I do not know, "'but when we find her, and we will, "'it will be because of your courage and loyalty.' "'Not just mine, madam,' said Gargery. "'He got to his hands and knees and crawled painfully "'toward an object that lay motionless on the ground.' its tawny fur almost indistinguishable from the sand that surrounded it. Gargery gathered the cat's body in his arms and sat down, holding it on his lap. He kept biting and scratching until that bastard kicked him, madam, square in the ribs. Excuse me, madam, he's a hero, madam, poor old fella. He bowed his head. Two tears dropped down onto the ruffled fur. "'You are both heroes,' said Emerson. "'Sell him, get this fellow to the house and lock him up. "'He's told me where they were to take her.' "'The rest of our men, including Amherst, had gathered round. "'A dozen eager hands reached for the quaking villain, "'and Emerson added, "'He is not to be harmed, is that understood?' "'Let me go with you, sir,' William begged. "'Emerson shook his head. "'Mrs. Emerson and I will deal with the matter, Selim.' I leave you in charge. You must go at once. Look after Gargery and the cat. I will carry him, sir, said Gargery, getting to his feet with Selim's assistance. It's the least I can do for the poor, brave... Ah! He dropped his burden and clutched at his arm. Horace gave him a malevolent yellow stare, rolled over and began licking his side. A hasty and necessarily cursory examination assured me that Gargery had no broken bones, though his bruises were extensive. I knew better than to try to examine Horace, but the energy with which he fought my attempt to wrap him in Emerson's coat suggested his injuries were less severe than I'd feared. I handed the squirming bundle to William, who took it with the same look of terrified disgust with which an elderly bachelor might receive a wet, howling baby. Hold him tightly, I instructed. He will try to follow us if you let him go. Yes, ma'am, said William. Whatever you say. Emerson kept patting Gargery mechanically on the shoulder, but every muscle in his body was tensed, and I knew I couldn't keep him from pursuit much longer. Not that I wanted to. I was as frantic as he. Now, Emerson, I began, and got no further. 
He caught my hand and set off with long strides toward Manor House, where we had left the horses. His pace was so rapid I couldn't find breath enough to speak until after we'd reached the stable. Emerson's curses inspired the stableman to quick action, and it was Emerson's hands that saddled and bridled his own steed. "'Where are we going?' I asked breathlessly. "'Kafr el Barud. It's a hamlet due east of here.' He tossed me onto a saddle and mounted. The grounds of the hotel were crowded with people and vehicles. We were unable to go quickly at first, and Emerson took advantage of the enforced delay to utter a few sentences of explanation. They had horses and a rug or cloak to wrap round her. The first man fled with Senia, while the other one was struggling with Gargery. They hadn't expected him to put up such a fight. He swallowed noisily, and then said, They won't hurt her, Peabody. She has already been hurt, frightened and roughly handled, and perhaps struck. How else could they keep her quiet? Good gad, Emerson, can't we go faster? Emerson's lips curled back, baring his teeth. Stay close. I don't believe we actually knocked anyone down. The persons who fell to the ground tripped over their own feet in their haste to get out of our way. How Emerson found the place, I do not know. Hamlet was too grandiose a word for the scattering of huts. Not more than half a dozen of them nestled in a hollow at the foot of the escarpment. It was one of the poorest, most miserable-looking collection of dwellings I've ever seen, even in Egypt. The inhabitants must have had to carry drinking water from the river or the nearest irrigation canal, for there was no well, nor tree, nor green plant. The crumbling mud bricks of the houses were the same drab colour as the surrounding soil. Emerson had galloped straight into what would have been the village square, if the place had boasted such an amenity. There was no sign of life except for a dog sleeping in the dust, and a few chickens. Our approach had not been silent or inconspicuous. The inhabitants had had time to flee or conceal themselves. "'The place looks deserted,' I said. "'Are you sure he wasn't lying?' "'To me, I think not.' Emerson, who had of course lost his hat, shaded his eyes with his hand and studied the dismal scene. That seems the most likely place. My own eyes had told me there was only one possible place where a prisoner might be held. It stood a little apart from the other houses, and it was more stoutly built. Bolted wooden shutters covered the single small window, and the door was also barred from the outside. As we approached, the dog got up and stood watching us with feral yellow eyes. I knew the temper of these vicious half-wild beasts, so I wasn't surprised when it bared its teeth and began to growl. Emerson ignored it. He had no thought at that moment for anything except the child, but I picked up a stone and held it ready. My heart was pounding so hard it hurt my chest. Except for the dog's low growls, the place was utterly silent. It was like a Muslim cemetery, dusty and deserted and baking under the hot sun. Was the child unconscious or bound and gagged or in the grasp of the villain who had carried her off? I couldn't imagine Senia failing to protest her captivity if she was able to articulate. We were almost at the door before I heard a voice, and astonishment stopped me in my tracks. It was not Senia's unmistakable, high-pitched voice. It was not the gruff voice of a man. The crooning, quavering tones were a woman's, repeating soft endearments. Little one, sit down and rest. Here is water, darling. Will you drink? Or oh, honey cakes, eat them. They're good. La shukran, said Senia. My knees almost gave way. It was such a relief to hear her, sounding quite cool and unhurt, politely declining the offering. I looked at Emerson. What on earth? I mouthed. He put his finger to his lips. I knew why he hesitated. He wanted to be certain there was no one else in the room. Senia went on in the same gentle voice. I want to go home, mother. Please let me out. Sweet one, I cannot. He locked us in. You aren't afraid, are you? Don't be afraid. You are safe with me. She'd been very brave, but now she began to cry, 
and when Emerson heard her sobs, he lifted the heavy wooden bar and wrenched the door open. There was some light in the room from small ventilation holes high under the eaves. I made out dim shapes that were, as I later discovered, a low bed or couch, a brazier, and a few pots and baskets. In the first moment, I had eyes only for Senia. Her face was dirty and smeared with tears, and her clothing was crumpled. That was all I saw before she hurled herself at Emerson. He caught her up in his arms and held her close. It's all right, little bird, we're here. Did they hurt you? Not very much. She wiped her wet eyes with her fingers. Did they hurt Gargery and Horus? The man kicked him, the beast! They're both all right, I said, deciding this was not the time to enter into detail. Emerson, let's go. Not just yet, said Emerson. He set Senia on her feet. I have a few questions to put to this woman. Don't frighten her, Senia cried. She ran to the woman, who was crouched by the brazier, and put her small arms round the shaking form. She was kind. She only did what he told her. It wasn't her fault. She wore the single garment characteristic of the poorest women of Upper Egypt, a square of dark brown woolen fabric wrapped round the body like the stola of the Greeks. It exposed her stringy arms and wrinkled throat, her withered hands fumbled with the folds of the garment, trying to draw it over her head and face, but she was so frightened she couldn't manage it. My vision had become accustomed to the dim light. When she raised her head, I saw her eyes were white with cataracts. She was blind. Who are you? she quavered. What do you want with me? Pity replaced the wrath that had darkened Emerson's countenance. He spoke to the woman in Arabic, softening his gruff voice as much as was possible. We mean you no harm, mother. I am the father of curses, and this is my wife, the Sit Hakim. Only tell us who brought the child here and what he meant to do with her. It took a while, and a number of caresses from Senia, to win the poor thing's confidence. She said she knew nothing of the business except that her son had told her she must keep Senia hidden for a few hours. He would return after darkness had fallen to take her away. He hadn't explained why. She hadn't asked. I believed her. The woman's role was to hear and obey, and she was too frightened and too frail to lie. We're going to take the child with us, Emerson said. We are her family. Will he harm you, mother, when he finds she is gone? No, no. He is a good son. He takes care of me. He would not have hurt the child. I think, she hesitated, I think someone gave him money. We have very little. She had a little more when we left. Emerson is extremely soft-hearted. I only hoped she'd been telling the truth when she claimed her son would not blame her for the loss of his prisoner. There was no way she could have prevented it, but some men will vent their anger on the nearest object especially if it is weaker than they are. Emerson took Senia up in front of him, and she settled in the curve of his arm with a sigh. Can we go home now? I want to see Gargery and Horus, and I'm very thirsty. She offered me water, but you told me not to drink water unless it was boiled. I unhooked my canteen and handed it to Emerson. You are a good girl to remember that when you were so frightened. I wasn't frightened. Not very. I knew you'd come. Over her head, Emerson's eyes met mine. I knew he was remembering another child who had said something of the sort to us many years before. Honesty compels me to remark that in Ramsay's case, the innumerable mishaps from which we had rescued him were usually his own fault. But this was not true of Senia. We had failed her, and it was only due to the mercy of God and the courage of Gargery that matters had turned out as well as they had. Senia handed the canteen back to me. Can we go home now, please? When we reached the house, we found a large crowd assembled, all our skilled men, all the female servants, and a half-dozen of the gaffiers. 
Ali the doorman was not at the door. He was with the others, brandishing a heavy stick and shouting at the top of his lungs. His demands and those of the others were directed at Selim. They wanted action, and they wanted it now. And poor Selim's attempts to be heard over the bedlam were in vain. He was the first to see us. The change in his expression made the others turn, and then we were the centre of the shouting mob. It took quite some time to quiet them. Khadija carried Senia off to see Gargery, and Fatima ran to the kitchen to cook Senia's favourite dishes. The rest of them began an animated discussion. Should they celebrate the child's return with a huge fantasia first, or wait until after they had punished her abductors? Sir, William edged up to us. I hadn't noticed him. He was so confounded self-effacing. What can I do, sir? Nothing, Emerson said, cruelly but correctly. Seeing the young man's face fall, I added, Thank you, William, but as you see, the matter is under control. Yes, ma'am, I... I'm very glad the child is safe. Emerson had already turned away. I patted William's arm and followed my husband and Selim into the study. What have you done with him? was Emerson's first question. He is locked in the garden shed with Hassan on guard. They would have torn him limb from limb, father of curses, if I had allowed it. What happened? Where was she? Did you find the other man? We gave him a brief account of what had transpired. Ah, said Selim, brightening. So we will go there and wait for him to come back tonight. That is a step we must take, Emerson agreed. Though there is a chance someone will warn him. It couldn't be helped, Selim. We had to get the child home at once. Fortunately, we have another source of information. I persuaded Emerson to wait a bit before beginning the interrogation of our prisoner, since I wanted to be present, and there were other duties I needed to carry out first. They did not take long. Gargery had been put to bed by Selim and smeared with green ointment by Khadija. He was a sight to behold, but his cheerful, if distorted, smile and air of self-satisfaction told me that he considered his bruises a small price to pay for his new role as hero, which, I feared, he intended to milk to the full. Senia had been to see him. She was now in the bath, attended like a small sultaness by Khadija and Basima and several other women, and Horus, who lay stretched out on a cushion, watching. The cat and I studied one another with mutual distaste. Now was when we missed Nefret. Veterinary medicine is not one of my specialties, but I knew that an animal in pain may attack even a friend. However, I have never been known to shirk my duty. I advanced upon Horus with a firm stride. Peabody, don't, Emerson exclaimed in alarm. Not without gloves, not without several people holding him down, not without a stout stick. His voice trailed off into silence. Horus had rolled over, and we saw that his entire underbelly was bright green. Oh, I said. Khadija, uh, how did you... Khadija glanced at me over her shoulder. He has no broken bones, Sitakim, and I think nothing inside his heart. He has eaten a great deal of chicken and clawed halfway through the door of Senya's room. But how did you... I talked to him. In what language, I wondered. I decided not to ask. Horus sneered at me. The storage shed had no windows. The interior was as hot as an oven. The prisoner's sweating face shone like glass. He was a young man, dark-skinned and heavily bearded. The men had not handled him gently. His head was bare and his robe was torn. If there had been any fight left in him, the sight of Emerson's stalwart form filling the narrow doorway would have ended it. He had been sitting on the floor. He wriggled back as far as he could go and raised his hands in appeal. It is said that the father of curses does not torture prisoners, he croaked. Only when they refuse to answer my questions, Emerson said. That has never happened. I hope you will not be the first. What is your name? The first few questions were answered without hesitation. His name was Mohammed. His profession, camel driver. He lived in Giza village, where he had met Saleh Ibrahim, who had hired him for a little job. The child was in no danger, father of curses, I swear. Saleh said she must be taken alive and unhurt, or he would not be paid. 
He said, paid, Emerson repeated. By whom? I do not know, father of curses. I have done wrong, but do not send me to prison. Beat me and let me go. It was Saleh who planned it. He took her to his house. That is all I know. I swear I will never again. Oh, be quiet, Emerson said in disgust. He turned to me and spoke in English. I know his kind. He's a petty criminal who will turn his hand to any job that does not require great courage or intelligence. What surprises me is that he had the intestinal fortitude to take on this job. He knew who the victim was. He knows who we are. He knew her relationship to us. He may have been promised a large sum of money. It would have to be a very large sum, said Emerson, with unconscious and justifiable egotism. No, there is something he hasn't told us. Look at the miserable creature. Sweat was pouring down the man's face, which had turned a peculiar shade of muddy grey. His hand had gone to his throat, and I saw that he was fingering an amulet of some sort. That won't help you, said Emerson. Do you think God listens to the prayers of sinners and liars and tormentors of little children? You know who hired Sally. If you do not speak... He paused for effect. Mohammed's teeth began to chatter. If you do not tell us the truth... The Sitakim will fetch her parasol. The fellow's eyes rolled back into his head, and he slumped over in a faint. Now you've done it, Emerson, I remarked. I hope so, said Emerson. Hassan, give him some water. I had Dawood to thank for the legends that surrounded my parasol. He was a fine raconteur, and the tales he had told about us had spread throughout the length of Egypt. I had never been sure how much he believed in the magical powers of the parasol, but he had certainly managed to convince a number of other people. We revived Mohammed and found him pitiably willing to confess, but he was in such a state of terror, Emerson had to shake him a few times before he could speak intelligibly. Only one thing could have persuaded him to brave the wrath of the Father of Curses, and the terrible parasol of the Sid Hakim. It was not money. It was the knowledge that the act had been ordered by a man he feared even more, and the hope of becoming one of his trusted men. I think I knew what he was going to say, even before Emerson shook it out of him. The muster! It was the muster! Who dares refuse his commands? My fertile pen falters when I attempt to describe the impact of Muhammad's statement. He would not have dared to lie. He was telling the truth, as he believed. Even Emerson was momentarily struck dumb. Recovering, I said, The master is dead. Muhammad looked like a cornered rat. Terror and cunning mingled on his sweating face. So they said of him once before... But he was not dead, Sit, or else he came back from Gehenna, where the very Afrits cower before him, and he punished those who had been disloyal. I have not seen him, but Saleh has. He gave Saleh money. He will give him more tonight, when he knows his orders have been carried out. Tonight, Emerson repeated, in a voice like the rumble of thunder. "'Obviously someone has used his name, Emerson,' I exclaimed. "'Obviously.' "'Visibly troubled, Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin. "'Since none of his hirelings knew what he really looked like, "'it would not be difficult to convince them that he'd returned. "'He has as many personalities as hairs on his head.' "'We had spoken in English, but Mohammed understood enough to give him new hope. "'You believe me, Father of Curses. I can tell you no more.' Let me go, and I swear I will never again. Shall we turn him over to Mr. Russell? I asked. No, what purpose would that serve? Russell couldn't get any more out of him than we have. I want him here, at my disposal. I can't think how he could be of further use to us, but one never knows. Muhammad's howls of woe followed us as we went back to the house. I had instructed Hassan to get him food and water and make him as comfortable as circumstances allowed. He was a contemptible creature, but one must live up to one's standards. We planned our expedition with care, confiding only in Selim. Though I didn't suppose we would require his help, 
It would have been cruel to refuse his demand that he be allowed to accompany us. He was aching to get in a few blows on his own account. It was late afternoon before we got off. Mohammed had been vague about the precise time of the meeting between the impostor and his hireling, probably because he didn't know himself. After nightfall might be any hour between dusk and dawn, so we needed to be in position before sunset. We had a little less than a mile to walk from the place where we left the horses, and there we assumed Arab dress. Emerson enjoyed this part of the business, since in my guise of a Muslim female, I was obliged to follow him at a proper distance. We approached the village from the south, where ridges of rock offered concealment. The sun was low in the west by then. He and Selim settled down to wait. I went on. Emerson hadn't given in to this part of the scheme without argument, but in my opinion it was imperative that we have someone actually inside the house, and I was the only one who could approach it without arousing suspicion. Many of the poorer local women went unveiled, and so did I, but the headscarf shadowed my face, which I had darkened with one of the concoctions Ramses kept for that purpose. I met no one as I shuffled toward the house, even the dog had disappeared. During our earlier visit, the inhabitants had hidden in their houses. Now they appeared to have made a hasty exodus. They might be uneducated and ignorant, but they were not stupid. When the father of curses appears, trouble follows, as Dawood was wont to say. They must have known the trouble was not over, that the father of curses would hold someone accountable for Senia's abduction that he would return, breathing fire and summoning all the demons of Egypt to his aid. I did not believe any of the others had been directly involved, but it is not only the guilty who flee when no man pursueth. I doubted they would have taken the old woman with them. She would have been an encumbrance and would serve as a scapegoat. Sure enough, she was there, huddled in the corner by the brazier, looking as if she hadn't moved since we last saw her. She raised her head when I entered and closed the door after me. "'Do not be afraid,' I said softly. "'It is the Sit Hakim. She nodded. "'I knew you would come back. The others knew too. They have run away. "'Your son hasn't returned? No.' In the same lifeless voice she went on. He will not return. The story of your coming here has spread now, and if he hears of it, he will go far away and never come back. And I will be alone, with no one to care for me. Is the child safe? Yes, safe and happy. She is a good child, kind and gentle. He swore he would not harm her. She would not eat the honey cakes. Her voice trailed off into mumbles, and she began rocking back and forth, her arms folded across her breast as if she were nursing an infant. She had spent some of her windfall on opium. I recognized the smell. Well, who could blame her for wanting to escape from a life of blindness, poverty, and loneliness? I looked round the room, trying to decide what to do. The sky outside was darkening, and soon the interior would be pitch black. The only place to sit was the floor, which was crawling with insect life. My ankles were already under attack. I decided to stand on one side of the room, where I would be concealed by the door when it opened. The old woman paid no attention. She was lost in memories of a happier past, when she had cradled a child. It was entirely possible that our attempted ambush was doomed from the start, the villagers, dispersed across the landscape by now, would report the exciting events of the morning to everyone they met. One of them might even take the risk of heading Saleh off and warning him that his plot had failed. If he did not hear of it beforehand, he would certainly realize something was amiss when he found the door unbarred. In my opinion, these possibilities did not justify abandoning our plan. They were possibilities, not certainties, and I felt sure Emerson would agree that we ought not miss even a remote chance of capturing the kidnapper, whom we would force to lead us to the man who had hired him. Was it the same individual who had murdered Assad and attacked us? It hardly seemed likely that we had more than one enemy after us, though I had known it to happen, but try as I might, I hadn't been able to think of a single underlying motive that would explain all the events.'
However, a new and intriguing idea had occurred to me after Muhammad's astonishing announcement that afternoon. Could our adversary be a lieutenant of the master criminal, bent on revenge for his master's death? Few, if any of them, could have known of his work for the war office, and his demise might well have been blamed on us. I had encountered several of these individuals, and since I had nothing better to do, I passed them in review. The sophisticated, charming Sir Edward, the gallant young Frenchman I had known as René Darcy, the amiable American lad Charles Holly, surely not any of them. They'd all been perfect gentlemen, even if they were criminals. The only one of Sethos's immediate entourage who might have concocted such a diabolical scheme was dead. There could be no doubt of it, for I'd seen her corpse. Of course, I hadn't known all of his people personally. Such speculation got me nowhere, but at least it helped to pass the time. Darkness had fallen. The old woman was asleep. I could see nothing, but I heard her thin, whistling breaths. I had prepared myself for a long wait. The sound that shook me out of my half doze was so unexpected and so uncanny, I almost lost my balance. It was the high-pitched, mournful howling of a dog. The crack of a weapon, pistol, or rifle ended the dog's lament. I waited, holding my breath. What the sound betokened, I could not tell. How far away it had been, I did not know. But someone was out there in the hills, armed with a modern weapon. Once in the days of my impetuous youth, I might have rushed out of the hut, firing my own little gun. I knew better now. Whatever occurred, I must stick to my post until I was relieved. Grasping my pistol in one hand and my torch in the other, I pointed both at the door and stood ready. I suppose the interval did not last more than half an hour, but I thought I would burst from frustration and worry before I finally heard a voice. Peabody, it's me. Don't shoot. Is it safe to come in? My throat was parched, but I managed to croak a response. Certainly, it is safe. Do you suppose I would shoot blindly at an opening door? I have known it to happen," said Emerson. The door creaked open, and I saw his form outlined against the starlight. He had spoken in his normal tones, and his torch was lighted, though he was considerate enough not to shine it directly into my eyes. Stiff with long standing, I stumbled toward him. He removed the pistol from my numbed grasp before he lent me the support of his arm. "What happened?" I demanded. I heard the dog howl, and the pistol shot. And you stayed in position, good girl. He gave me a quick kiss. Now, if you can only get out of the habit of waving that damned gun at people, you aren't hurt, are you? No, but I've been standing in one position for hours. Where to sell him? What happened? Curse it! Gone to fetch the horses. Emerson shone his torch round the interior of the hut. Opium, he muttered. Poor creature. We'll have to make arrangements for her tomorrow, Peabody. Her son won't be coming back. Dead? Yes. The dog must have been his. It was lying beside his body. Strange. The loyalty the beasts feel, even for masters who abuse and neglect them. After the noisome dark of the hut, the night air was as refreshing as cool water against my hot cheeks. I refreshed myself with actual water from my canteen. Which I had been unable to do earlier, since both my hands were occupied, and while we waited for Selim, Emerson answered my urgent questions. The tragedy, if you want to call it that, occurred not far from where we had concealed ourselves. As I reconstruct the affair, Sally was to meet his employer in the hills above the village. The bastard may have meant to take Senia away with him. He may have wanted proof that Sally had her. Before he paid over the rest of the money, however, this is only a guess, but it makes sense. Sally kept the assignation because he was too greedy to abandon the rest of the reward. His attempt to deceive his employer failed. He was forced to admit he had lost his captive. Or I suggested the impostor may have heard of our visit, as you yourself pointed out. It would have been a subject of gossip all day, all over the area. Hmm. Emerson fingered the dent in his chin. 
Yes, that makes even better sense. Sala hoped his employer was still unaware of the latest turn of events, and believed he could trick him into handing over the money. Or, it may be, he meant to overpower and rob him. The imposter took the risk of meeting Sale, because the risk of leaving him on the loose was even greater. He might have been able to tell us something that would give us a clue as to the identity of the man who had hired him. I expect he meant from the first to kill Sale once the deed was done. The dog was the only thing he hadn't anticipated. It began to howl, and the bastard shot it. There was no trace of him, I suppose? No. It took us a while, in the dark, to find the spot. He had plenty of time to knife Sully, kill the dog, and make himself scarce. Foiled again, I cried, shaking my fists at the dark, unheeding heavens. Had I been allowed to follow proper procedures, I would have returned to the murder scene, searched for clues, and examined the body. This suggestion affected Emerson adversely. He assured me with considerable vehemence that he had done the job himself at least as thoroughly as I could have done. I doubted this, but his indignation rose to such a pitch I deemed it advisable to abandon the idea. So what clues did you discover? I inquired as we rode back toward the house. Nodding graciously at Selim, I included him in the question. However, he was wise enough to remain silent. Nothing, said Emerson. Did you suppose he would leave his card? No footprints, no scraps of clothing, not even a bit of paper clutched in the stiffening fingers of the corpse, said Emerson, with awful sarcasm. There was no struggle, not even an argument. The fellow came at Saleh from behind, put one arm round his throat to prevent an outcry, and drove the knife into his body with the other hand. It is an ingenious reconstruction, Emerson, but how could you be sure? Elementary, my dear Peabody. Sale would not have stood still and silent without making some attempt to defend himself, if he had faced a man with a knife. His own knife was still in his belt. Anyhow, that appears to be our friend's approved method. He is as efficient as he is ruthless. One would prefer, said Emerson didactically, to avoid being spattered with blood. The victim's own body would protect the murderer from that, except for his arm and sleeve. Have you anything to add, Selim? I asked. No, Sidakim, except that I am sorry he died so quickly. Such proved to be the general consensus. A number of our loyal men were still at the house. In lieu of a fantasia, they had decided to celebrate on a smaller scale. Food and drink, of a non-alcoholic variety, were flowing freely. And in the centre of the room, like a monarch on his throne, was Gargery, excessively bandaged and smiling. The beverage in his glass appeared to be beer. As soon as I could make myself heard over the questions and cries of welcome, I said, I am pleased to observe, Gargery, that your injuries were not as painful as I had believed. I felt obliged to join in the celebration, madam, said Gargery, self-righteously. These good fellows insisted. Ha! said Emerson. But he said no more. Gargery's current status as hero still held. I had a feeling it would not hold much longer if he took too much advantage of it. We were both quite hungry, so we sat down on the settee and accepted plates of spiced chicken and stewed lentils. And Emerson told the audience what had happened. Groans of disappointment followed the announcement of Sally's death. "'What shall we do now, Father of Curses?' Hassan asked. "'Await my orders,' said Emerson. "'The Sitakim and I will determine what is to be done.' They went willingly after that promise, and Gargery staggered off to bed, leaning on Fatima. Neither of us felt inclined to lend him a hand, since the staggers were somewhat exaggerated. At last we were alone. "'What shall we do now, Father of Curses?' I inquired. I took it for granted that you already had a plan, said my husband. Whiskey and soda, Peabody. Yes, thank you. As a matter of fact, I have been thinking. Hell and damnation, Emerson said mildly. Well, my dear. It had been a rather tiring day, what with one thing and another, but a sip of the genial beverage had the usual inspiring effect. We must go to Luxor, Emerson. 
Emerson began muttering to himself. It had once been a habit of his, though he hadn't done it lately. Never get accustomed to it. How does she... Must! He sat down with a thump and stared at me. His heavy brows formed a straight line across his manly brow. I will explain, pray do. One of the unsolved mysteries about this business is Mr. Assad's role. The people who freed him could not possibly have supposed he would succeed in killing Ramses. He hadn't the strength or the skill to do it. I believe the episode was designed to arouse our interest. It certainly did that, said Emerson, reaching for his pipe. Please, Emerson, do not be sarcastic. I am endeavouring to discuss this in a logical manner. I... Curse it, you've made me lose track of what I was saying. In short, Ramses and we were meant to search for Mr. Assad here in Cairo. Is that not what we would have done under normal circumstances? Instead, parental affection overcame our sense of duty, and we did precisely the opposite of what our opponent had expected. Sending Ramses to Luxor was a serious error. The succeeding incidents, including Senia's abduction, were designed to get him back to Cairo. He will certainly come back when he hears about Senia. Emerson muttered round the stem of his pipe. If you hadn't insisted on keeping the other incidents from him, he would have returned before this. I sometimes think the boy hasn't much confidence in our ability to take care of ourselves. I can't imagine how he could have got that impression. Emerson, I beg your pardon, my dear. Well, well, I am not entirely convinced by your reasoning, Peabody, but, said Emerson in a refreshing burst of candour, I am always more comfortable in my mind when we are all of us together. Why can't we just tell them and persuade the children to come home? Because the scene of action is in Luxor. I am convinced of it. You were right. I was. Emerson gave me a look of exaggerated astonishment. Emerson, please don't do that. You were right in suspecting that there is something sinister behind the increase in antiquities theft. It is just like the old days when Sethos controlled the business. What we learn today proves it. Someone is masquerading as the master. Has it occurred to you that this person may be one of his former lieutenants? Emerson shook his head. He appeared to be a trifle dazed. That assumption would explain the attacks on us, you see, I continued. Revenge for the death of his leader. Furthermore, it would be to the advantage of this individual to keep us away from Luxor. That is why we must go there. QED, muttered Emerson. I have it all worked out, I assured him. The school holidays begin shortly. We will stay with Cyrus and Catherine. They will be delighted to have us. You and I and Senia, Gargery and Fatima and Daud and Selim and Khadijah and... Good God, Peabody! You can't expect the Vandergolds to take in a mob like that. And Basima and... The damned cat, Peabody! The castle is a very large house, Emerson, and I expect Daud and Selim may prefer to stay with their kin in Gune. We can be ready to leave day after tomorrow. I will wire Cyrus first thing in the morning. And now, my dear, I believe we should retire. I am a trifle weary, and there'll be a great deal to do tomorrow. I put my empty glass on the table and stood up. Emerson remained seated. Like an avalanche, he muttered, staring into space. It out of the way, only chance, nine people and the cat. I sat down again and put my hand over his clenched fists. We must find the man who is behind this, Emerson. Family honour demands it. Family what? Emerson's eyes came back into focus. The imposter is using your... Not even in the privacy of our own home did we use that word. I started again. He is using Sethos's name and besmirching his reputation. His reputation isn't exactly Lily White, my dear. However, his noble brow furrowed. It's beginning to add up, he said, as if to himself. Precisely, Emerson. I am glad you see it my way. I rather doubt it, Peabody. But we will go to Luxor. Just tell me one thing. He took me by the shoulders and turned me to face him. Please tell me your decision was not affected by that damned dream about Abdullah, when instead of speaking to you, he waved you to follow him. Why, Emerson, I said, how could you possibly think that?
Chapter 12. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. When Ramses and Nefret arrived at the station, the train had just pulled in. They had to push through a throng of people, all waving their arms and shouting with excitement. Ramses was not surprised that the whole town had turned out. Cyrus was well-known and well-liked, and his wife's numerous charitable activities had made her equally popular. It would have been cynical to suspect that they had a selfish motive, the hope that Vandergilt Effendi had returned to resume the excavations that had given employment to so many men of Luxor. No such thought occurred to Cyrus. He was visibly moved as he stood in the open door of the car, clasping the hands thrust out to him and returning the cries of greeting and welcome. Finally, Ramses put an end to the demonstration which was threatening to pour into the compartment, and by dint of shouts and some shoving, cleared a path along the platform to the waiting carriages. Cyrus helped his wife down the steps and handed her over to Ramses before embracing the fret. She kissed him back with hearty goodwill and then hurried to offer an arm to Bertie. He didn't need it. Dawood lifted him clean off his feet and lowered him gently to the platform. I will carry him to the carriage, Dowd announced, holding the young man in a fond grip. No, uh, please, I'd rather walk, really. Tell him, Bertie insisted. He was laughing and a trifle flushed. Catherine, and probably Dowd, had muffled him in coats and mufflers and capes, but the bones in his face and in the thin hand that reached for that of Ramsay's were painfully prominent. Ramses distracted Dowd with a request that he see to the luggage and put an unobtrusive arm round Bertie's shoulders. Let's get you to the carriage. It's not far. Yes, right. It's just the excitement, you know. I am glad to be here. Been looking forward to it. I hated to leave that little witch senior, though. I must warn you, Ramses. I'm in love. Do you think I'm too old for her? The brief walk to the carriage left him breathless, and he was talking too fast, putting up a valiant pretense at normalcy. We're all too old for Senia, Ramsay said lightly. She wears me out, and even father requires an extra whiskey after a day with her. Can you stick it for a few more minutes? Yusuf considers himself the official representative of the family and wants to welcome you personally. I'll see that he keeps it short. After a whispered conference, Yusuf agreed not to make a speech, which would have been lost on Bertie anyhow, since he had only a few words of Arabic. Several brothers and cousins had to be introduced, however, along with his pride and joy, Jamil. Yusuf launched into an encomium on Jamil's intelligence and beauty and all-round virtue, while Jamil postured and smirked. If Vandergelt Effendi should decide to resume his excavations, there was no one better to serve as his rais. This last was aimed directly at Cyrus, who gave Ramses a knowing grin and a wink. Make our excuses, Ramses. Your Arabic is better than mine. Yes, sir, certainly. We must go now, Yusuf. Wait, Bertie caught at his sleeve. Who's that? Ramses turned. He hadn't recognized her before. She was wearing European clothing, a divided skirt belted tight around her narrow waist, a neat flannel coat, and a pith helmet that fit much better than the other. It was an old one of Nefret's, he supposed, like the rest of the outfit. Her black hair had been coiled and knotted at the back of her neck. Ramses wondered if Yusuf had seen her, improperly attired, and in the middle of a crowd. Maybe not. She had kept in the background until then— and the clothes made quite a difference in her appearance. Catching his eye, she drew herself up to her full five feet and gave him a dazzling smile before melting back into the mob. Who is she? Bertie demanded. He had caught only the fringe of the smile, but he looked as if he'd been hit over the head with a brick. You'll meet her later, Nefret said. That's certain, Ramses muttered. Nefret turned her laugh into a cough and began issuing orders. Catherine, you and Cyrus ride with Bertie. We'll catch you up at the ferry landing. Dowd will bring the luggage on later. The carriage drove away. Bertie had twisted round to look back. Lips compressed, Ramses handed his bride into the second carriage. 
You gave her the clothes? Yes, why not? I got tired of seeing that pathetic old pith helmet slide down over her eyes. She's much tinier than I am, of course, but I showed her how to... Did you anticipate this? I expected she'd turn up today, if that's what you mean. As for Bertie, well, Mother told us he needed a new interest, didn't she? I think he may have found it. One of the graceful Falukas took them across the river to the dock where Cyrus's carriage was waiting. Nefret firmly declined Cyrus's pressing invitation to return with them to the house. You'll want to settle in and have a little rest. We'll see you this evening. Come early and stay late. Cyrus said. We've got a lot to talk about, I reckon. He drew a long breath. Sure is good to be back. Dowd turned up at the Amelia a short while later, bursting with conversation and questions. They had a good long gossip, mostly about domestic and professional matters. When are you coming back to Cairo? Dowd asked, somewhat accusingly. The father of curses will not finish the excavation of the last mustaba until you return, and the little bird misses you. She wept very loudly when they said she could not come to Luxor with us. Ramsay smiled at that only too accurate adverb, but Nefret said, You might at least write her a personal message, Ramses. Sit down and do it right now, and Dowd can take it with him. Must you go back tonight, Dowd? Oh, yes. The father of Kirstus cannot get on without me. I will spend a little time with Yusuf in Gurna before I take the train. Is there something I can do for you before I go? Uh, letters to carry back, news to tell. There was plenty of news. The question was how much to tell Dowd. She had posted her letter the day before, but they probably wouldn't receive it until the following week. Yes, she said, there is news, important news. Ramses looked up from the sheet of paper over which he was frowning. Why did men find it so difficult to write a chatty and formal note? First, she said, Miss Minton is asking questions of everyone in Luxor about illegal antiquities dealings. Second, Nefret, Ramses said apprehensively. He had mistaken the reason for her hesitation. She frowned back at him. Did he really suppose she would inform the parents of Sethos's reappearance without consulting him? The news about the accident would have to wait, too. Dowd would make it sound more alarming than it was. He might even insist on staying in Luxor to watch over them. Second, there is a letter on the way, she said smoothly. Third, Mr. Bertie has found a new interest. Her name is Jumana. Three things, Dowd said happily. Can you remember them? Oh, yes. Dowd was a trifle slow, but there was nothing wrong with his wits or his memory, and he was delighted to be the bearer of important information. He ticked the points off on his fingers. The Lady Minton is asking about antiquities thieves. A letter is coming. Mr. Bertie has a new interest. Jumana. Who is she? Yusuf's daughter. You will meet her this afternoon. She is a very intelligent young woman, and we hope to train her as an Egyptologist. I know the Sitakim will want to hear your opinion of the girl. Ah, Dawood said thoughtfully. A girl. Hmm. Nefret waited for the idea to penetrate. Glancing at Ramses, she said impatiently, Just write a few words. She doesn't really care what you say. She just wants to hear from you. So, said Dowd, a girl. His pensive face brightened as the obvious answer occurred to him. It will be as Allah and the Sith Hakim decide. He's got that right, Ramses said, after Dowd had taken an affectionate leave of them. What a devious woman you are. Dowd will break the news of our intentions to Yusuf, and if poor old Yusuf objects, he will be sat upon by Dowd who considers Allah and the Sitakim not necessarily in that order as infallible. Nefret looked demure. That had occurred to me. Cyrus's carriage came for them at five. They hadn't expected it to be so early, and Nefret hurried to complete her toilette. She was fastening on her earrings when Ramses came back from the bath chamber. His face fell. 
He was no more observant about women's clothing than his father, but he could tell the difference between work clothes and an evening frock. I didn't know we were supposed to dress. They surely won't force Bertie into a boiled shirt and all the rest. What were you planning to wear? Oh, he looked vaguely round the room. The usual, I suppose. Clothes. Wear whatever you like, Nifred said. It's just the Vandergelts. They won't care. Cyrus had dressed formally. He was a bit of a dandy and had a wardrobe almost as extensive as that of his wife. Being accustomed to the Emerson's habits, he made no comment about Ramsay's flannels and the low-heeled sensible slippers Nefret had substituted for the satin shoes she had intended to wear. They had bundled Bertie up like a mummy and ensconced him in a chair, but he swept the coverings aside and got to his feet when Nefret entered the room. She hastily sat down so that he could do the same. "'So what's your family up to now?' Cyrus inquired, while servants passed round the tea things. "'Why do you ask that?' Ramsay said. "'Did anything happen while you were there?' "'Well, no, not that I know of. "'But they sure were in a darn hurry to get us out of Cairo.' "'They were probably afraid you'd try to run off and fight the Senussi, Nefret said. "'Cyrus enjoyed her teasing, but he remained serious. "'Well, I wouldn't mind taking a hand in something. "'I'm getting kind of bored. "'Any chance of catching a few tomb robbers?' Catherine murmured protestingly, and Nefret laughed. I'm sorry, Cyrus. There have been a few incidents, but only the sort of thing you might expect, with supervision so lax. Alain Kuentz caught one of the Gurnawis investigating a cliff tomb near Deir el Bahri, but there was nothing in it. Kuentz is in Luxor? Nice young fellow. We'll have to have him to dinner. Cyrus tugged thoughtfully at his goatee. Maybe the man he caught knows about more tombs. Now get that out of your head, Cyrus, his wife said firmly. I will not have you chasing after thieves. If you're bored, hire some men and find your own tombs. Are you planning to excavate in Thebes this winter? Ramses asked. Been thinking about it, Cyrus admitted. Question is, where? Carnarvon's got the concession for the valley. They discussed possibilities until dinner was announced, and Catherine said, "'No more shop talk this evening, if you please. Bertie and I can't get a wedding edgewise while you three are going at it.' "'Oh, I don't mind,' Betty said quickly. "'I'd like to take a hand myself, as soon as I'm feeling a bit stronger. Um, "'Was that young woman at the station one of your people, Ramses?' "'No. Well... Yes, I suppose she is, in a way. Nefret gave him an amused look and explained. I remember her, Catherine said. Miss Pinch said she was one of the most capable students she'd ever taught. But of course there was no future for the girl. I'm surprised Yusuf hasn't married her off by now. She's trying to make her own future, Nefret said. You should have heard her, Catherine, insisting that she could be just as good a rice as Jamil. She didn't say as good. Ramses corrected. She said she'd be better. That wouldn't be difficult. Jamil is lazy and disinterested. Don't even think of hiring him, Cyrus. Cyrus grinned. I could tell by the look on your face what you thought of him. Maybe I'd better hire the girl. Don't make fun of her, Nefret said, dividing a frown between Cyrus and Ramses. Why can't she be trained as an Egyptologist, as David was? Will you be willing to help, Catherine? Of course she will, Bertie said. Won't you, mother? I mean to say, just because she's a girl. His mother fixed him with a curious stare, and he stuttered to a stop. She was a pretty child, Catherine said. I expect she's turned into quite an attractive young woman. She's a stunner, Cyrus said enthusiastically. His wife turned on him. You saw her? I didn't know who she was, but I couldn't help noticing her. Any man would. Nefret decided it would be advisable to change the subject. How is Anna getting on? I believe Mother said she had finished her VAD training. Before the meal was over, Bertie showed signs of fatigue, and Ramsay's offer to help him upstairs, an offer Bertie accepted. The others had finished dinner and had retired to the drawing room before Ramsay's came back. He accepted a cup of coffee and responded to Catherine's anxious look with a reassuring smile. He wanted to talk. Got a few things off his chest, I think. I'm so glad, 
Catherine murmured. Thank you, Ramses. I didn't do anything, just listened. And, Ramses went on, I assured him that it wasn't too late to begin a career in Egyptology. Really? Cyrus leaned forward, his eyes bright. Holy Jehoshaphat, but that's wonderful. Do you think he means it? It seems to have given him a new incentive to recover. He was gulping down pills and drinking some noxious brew that's supposed to build him up. I'll see Yusuf tomorrow, Cyrus declared. Get a crew together. Do some preliminary surveying. Talk to McKay about permits. The Valley of the Queens, maybe. Nefret had been watching her husband. He was doing his best to enter into Cyrus's enthusiastic plans, but his eyes were half-veiled by lowered lashes, and he looked tired. She made their excuses as soon as she could. Cyrus ordered his carriage, but they'd gone less than a mile when Ramses ordered the driver to stop and got out of the vehicle. I feel like walking. Go on, I'll see you in a bit. I'd like a walk, too. He stood looking down at her, his face in shadow, and she added uncertainly, Unless you'd rather be alone? No. He lifted her down and they started off arm in arm. The road was pale in the moonlight. Was it bad? About what you'd expect. Mud, pain, vermin, fear, loneliness, disillusionment. You don't want to hear the details. The worst of it was realising that the enemy weren't demons, but men like himself, just as lonely for their homes and families, just as frightened. I think he'll be all right, Nefret said gently. I hope so. He laughed suddenly and unexpectedly. He suddenly found a new interest in life, peppered me with ingenuous questions about excavating, as if I couldn't tell what was really on his mind. God help me, I heard myself offering to give him a few lessons in hieroglyphs and Egyptian history. With Jumana? That was definitely implied. Poor darling. We'll see if we can't find him another tutor. Ahead, the ruined walls of the temple of Seti I shone in the starlight. Remembering the night she and the parents had searched the crumbling precincts for Ramses and David, and the long hours of waiting before they found out what had become of them, Nefret clung more tightly to her husband's arm. Ramses appeared unaffected by painful memories. After all, she reminded herself, there was hardly a site on the West Bank that didn't hold them. Am I going too fast for you? he asked, slowing his steps. A little. Let's not hurry. It's a lovely night. The road to the public ferry landing turned south. Leaving it, they struck off across the cultivation, following the raised pathway Cyrus had built, so that he could reach his private dock by carriage. The original owners of the land were still living off the generous price he had paid. They went on in silence for a while. Ramses began to whistle softly. Recognising the melody, Nefret smiled to herself. They had waltzed to that song once. For the moment, at least, he had put aside his worries and was simply enjoying the night air and her company. The lights of the Amelia were visible when a dark form burst out of a grove of palm trees and ran toward them. Ramses whipped round. Fortunately, the moon was bright. He was able to stop himself before his raised hand caught her across the throat. Don't, it's Miss... It's Margaret, Nefret exclaimed. What on earth are you doing here? Gasping for breath, the journalist took her arm in a hard grip and tugged at her. Come with me. I've been waiting for hours. Come where? Ramses asked, holding tightly to Nefret's other arm. What's wrong? Oh, don't ask questions. Just hurry. I had to leave him. I don't think he can move. But if he can, he will... A feeling his mother would have described as a hideous foreboding came over Ramses. His fingers relaxed their hold on Nefret. She didn't have to ask who he was, either. Of course we'll come, she said, in her dispassionate, reassuring physician's voice. Where is he? He was lying on the ground under one of the trees, flat on his back and unmoving. Trunk and branches diffused the moonlight. Shadows hid his face and blurred his form, but there was no mistaking his identity. I can't see, Nefret said, dropping to her knees. It's too dark. Is he injured? I don't think so. Margaret leaned against one of the trees. 
He's ill. At first it was chills. He was shaking and his teeth were chattering. But he could still walk. And I got him this far. But he wouldn't go to the Dahabia, and I did. And they told me you were out for the evening. And when I came back, he was like this, and... Slap her, Nefret said curtly. She's hysterical. You slap her? I'm not awfully keen on hitting women. Delighted to hear it. Margaret took a deep breath. I'm not hysterical. I was just trying to tell you everything at once. What's wrong with him, Nefret? Damned beard. Nefret muttered. How the hell can I make a diagnosis when I can't see him, and most of his face is covered with hair? He's not shivering now. His skin is dry and hot, and he's comatose. It could be... Let's take him to the boat. Yes, right, Ramsay said resignedly. Nefret, go on ahead and get the crew out of the way. She obeyed without hesitation or question. Ramses lifted his uncle and heaved him over one shoulder. The gangplank was down, and the man who usually kept guard was not there. So far, so good, Ramses thought. As he turned into the corridor leading to the sleeping quarters, he heard Nefret's voice in the saloon. She was chattering cheerfully in Arabic, presumably to Nasir. None of the cabins was occupied except theirs. He had a choice of rooms. He chose the nearest, edged in, dumped the unconscious man onto the bed, and rubbed his back. Sethos wasn't as heavy as Emerson, but he was a big man, and at the moment, a dead weight. Margaret had followed him in. What can I do? she asked. Draw the curtains. By the time she'd done so, he'd found the oil lamp and lit it. Nefret soon joined them, carrying her medical bag. She hadn't taken the time to change, and her filmy frock contrasted oddly with her brisk professional manner. Get some water, she ordered. Margaret, sit over there and keep out of the way. When Ramses came back from the bathroom, she looked up. Temperature 103, pulse rapid. Lift him up, Ramses, and let's see if we can get these pills down him. What are they? Margaret asked. Quinine. I think he's got malaria. You think? Can't you tell? Oh, certainly, Nefret said sarcastically. Just give me a microscope and a few slides and the chemicals to fix them, and I'll give you a firm diagnosis, assuming I can remember from my lectures on tropical medicine what the bloody parasite looks like. Damn it, he's dribbling into his beard. Hang on a minute. She got her fingers under one corner of the beard and ripped it off with ruthless efficiency. Her patient reacted with a querulous mutter and a louder comment. Damned women. Open your mouth, Nefret ordered. Now swallow. Well done. He can lie back now, Ramses. Ramses lowered him down onto the pillow. With those curiously coloured eyes closed and the mocking mouth relaxed, the resemblance to his brother was even stronger. That's all we can do for now, Nefret said, except make him comfortable. When the fever breaks, he'll start to sweat, and then he'll sleep till morning. And then? Margaret demanded. Then he'll feel reasonably well, and we'll have to keep him here, by force if necessary, because if it is the commonest form of malaria, the apoxia will only last for a few hours. The next paroxysm will hit tomorrow, the same pattern, chills and fever. In other forms of the disease, the interval is 48 hours or 72. You keep quinine on hand? Yes. Thanks to Mother, we have a well-stocked medicine chest, including laudanum and arsenic. Margaret's expression seemed to amuse her. She went on. Some researchers believe that prophylactic doses of arsenic prevent malaria. I don't. He'll get a grain of quinine three times a day for three days, and half a grain for another five days. Have I convinced you that I know what I'm talking about, Margaret, or would you care to question me further? I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean... Never mind. Nefret inspected her. Ramses, take her to the saloon and give her a glass of brandy. I want to stay here with... You can relieve me later. Do as I say. What about Nasir? Ramses asked. I sent him to bed. You'll have to wait on yourselves. Now get out of here, both of you. She wrung out a cloth and began wiping away the perspiration that was now running freely down Sethos's face. Margaret accepted Ramsay's hand and let him lead her out. "'Your wife is a remarkable woman,' she said. "'I had underestimated her. People do, don't they? She's so young and pretty. They seldom make that mistake twice.' The lamps in the saloon were still lit. He settled Margaret onto the divan and got out the brandy.' 
He had intended to question her, but when he got his first good look at her, he decided he'd better give her a little time to recover. Her face was streaked with dirt and pinched with strain, and her stockings were in shreds. She wasn't wearing a coat. The once white shirtwaist was the color of mud. Were you hurt? he asked. She shook her head. A few sips of brandy brought some of the color back to her face. I suppose you want to know what happened. Well, yes, I do. Take your time. But not too much time. Her mouth curved and widened. I won't lie or equivocate. Just tell me one thing before I begin. You knew he was still alive, didn't you? You weren't surprised or uncertain as to his identity? Yes. After a moment, he added, Mother doesn't know. She told you what she honestly believed to be the truth. Ah. She leaned back against the cushions. It would appear I did her an injustice. I hope you won't think me rude if I say that I think your mother capable of lying if it would serve her ends. Wouldn't most people? I certainly would. She sounded quite her old self. She had told me his name, or rather his sobriquet, so I spent several days finding out everything I could about him. You'd be surprised how many sources I uncovered, and of course I remembered that outrageous letter he wrote and the subsequent investigation. Kevin O'Connell gloated over me unmercifully because he got the story first. She took another sip of brandy. So, Ramses prompted impatiently, so, I began to wonder whether your mother had lied to me. Her attempt to discourage me from coming on to Luxor was also suspicious. I decided to investigate. At worst, I'd get the material for an interesting feature story. I did, too, she added, with almost her old complacency. I had little difficulty in extracting information. People liked to see their names in the newspaper. The police weren't very forthcoming... But your Egyptological friends saw no reason why they shouldn't tell me what they knew. Howard Carter was a mine of information after I had plied him with drinks and convinced him that his friends, the Emersons, wouldn't mind his talking to me. They hadn't sworn him to silence, had they? Everybody who was anybody already knew the stories, didn't they? Well, yes, they did, he admitted. The Emersons had spoken freely about their bête noire. Had I heard about the time he took on the identity of a Coptic priest while his men were excavating illegally at a nearby site? I also got an earful about the recent increase in illegal excavations and theft. Most of it centred around the Luxor area, and Amelia's attempt to dissuade me from coming here made me all the more determined to investigate. What did I have to lose, after all? It was Said who gave me the final clue. Ninety percent of what he told me was pure fabrication, and I had to spend a long, tedious day listening to his fantastic stories about the master, whose right-hand man he claimed to have been, before I got what I wanted out of him. Is there anything that man won't sell? No one's found it yet, Ramsay said. That's why those who know his habits make certain he won't be tempted to betray them. He told you where to find Sethos. How did he know? It is known in Luxor that the master has returned. She sounded as if she were quoting. His whereabouts, no man knows. His true appearance, no man knows. He has a thousand faces and ten thousand names. The night was very silent. There was no sign of life, no sound of movement outside, on the deck or on the dock. Nevertheless, Ramsay's scalp was prickling. Never mind the picturesque details he said, somewhat brusquely. Just tell me what happened. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript Collection M. The editor has determined to substitute for the hurried account given Ramsay's by Miss Minton and repeated by him, one must suppose, in even more abbreviated form, the version written by Miss Minton herself at a somewhat later time. It is much more interesting. I might have known that when I encountered him again, it would be under circumstances as wildly theatrical as before. This time he didn't do it deliberately. Like certain other people of my acquaintance, he moves in melodrama, drawing it about him like a villain's black cloak. I looked up Ramses and Dufret Emerson as soon as I got to Luxor. They weren't awfully pleased to see me. I couldn't take that as confirmation of my suspicions or hopes but I could tell I wasn't going to get any help from them. 
I went the rounds of the Egyptologists in Luxor. Monsieur Legrand amiably admitted that it would have taken a lot of skill and knowledge to loot his storage magazines. Mr. McKay informed me that the whole thing was poppycock and that the Emersons were known for inventing wild stories. Cohen's had a wonderful time telling me even wilder stories. He thought he was being clever, but the things he told me confirmed my suspicions. Someone was behind the recent rash of thefts here in Luxor. Someone had been using the German house for illegal purposes. I carefully wrote it all down, lies and all. I had been besieged by hopeful dragomen ever since I arrived. I can't remember who it was who suggested Said. He'd been there from the first, and one couldn't help noticing him. He is one of the ugliest human beings I have ever seen, and as persistent as a fly. I spent a long, tedious day listening to the old rascal's lies about the master, whose trusted lieutenant he claimed to have been, before I got what I wanted out of him. I'll never forget the look on the poor devil's face when I offered him a hundred English pounds if he would tell me where I could find the master. It was an outrageous amount, more than he could earn in a lifetime. He didn't hesitate long. Not until later did it occur to me that it had been too easy. I waited until late afternoon next day before I set out. The house Said had told me about was on the West Bank. It was only one of several places the master used, but Said considered it to be the most likely. It is the largest house in the village, and the others do not approach it, because they believe he is a holy man, a haji, and a descendant of the prophet. When you knock on the door, sit. Make sure he knows it is you. He is always on guard and quick with a knife. I would not want you to be harmed, sit. I believed that. I still owed him fifty pounds. Knowing that a tourist would be besieged and harassed by hopeful guides the moment she set foot on the West Bank, I acquired women's clothing from Said. He charged me an extra pound and put it on in the boat while he took me across. Five pounds. He landed me as close as he could, but I had a walk of almost two miles ahead of me. I had taken the risk of wearing my own clothes, including my shoes under the robe. Authenticity is all very well, but I knew I couldn't walk that far barefoot, or in the clumsy sandals some of the locals wore. I felt somewhat self-conscious at first, and very awkward in all those layers of cloth. It is not only demanded of women to conceal their faces. Heads, bodies, and even hands are covered whenever they walk abroad. Said had informed me that my costume, which included a voluminous outer garment of black cotton, was what would be worn by a rigidly respectable, somewhat old-fashioned female of moderate means. But I'm sure he enjoyed watching me stumble and trip over my skirts. Said had quite a sense of humour. Apparently I did look respectable, for no one accosted me or even gave me a second glance. My progress was slow, but I was in no hurry. I didn't want to approach the house until dusk. I had no trouble finding it, larger and more pretentious than the others. It stood a little apart from them, backed by a low, undulating ridge of rock. I squatted down, knowing I was invisible in the twilight, and waited until most of the lighted windows in the houses of the village had gone dark. No lights showed in the house I wanted, and I began to wonder, not for the first time, if Said had sent me on a wild goose chase. He had already squeezed fifty pounds out of me. He would probably consider it a fine joke if I found myself trying to explain to a genuine holy man, a haji and a descendant of the prophet, who the devil I was and what I wanted. Having come this far, I had to go on. Followed by two of the village dogs growling and snapping at my heels, I went to the door and knocked. "'It's me,' I said. "'Margaret Minton, please let me in.' At first there was no answer. Then I heard a scrape of wood against metal, and the door opened onto darkness. "'By God, it is,' said a voice I knew. "'Are you out of your mind? Get the hell away from here.' "'Don't worry. I'm alone, so you think.' Oh, Christ, it's probably too late. Come in and bar the door. His voice sounded strange. Are you all right? I asked. No, but I'll be in far worse shape shortly if I don't. A match flared and wavered wildly before it went out. Here, he said, thrusting something into my hand. Light the candle, it's on the table. 
In the brief flare of the match, I had managed to close and bar the door. My hands were almost as unsteady as his. I spilled several matches onto the floor when I opened the box, but I managed to get the candle lighted. I'm rather proud of my literary skills, but I find it almost impossible to describe my feelings. Start with disbelief, excitement, triumph, confusion. And now, as the import of his words sank in, mounting apprehension. I wouldn't have known him. He was wearing the ubiquitous and usefully enveloping Egyptian dress. His galabia was of fine quality, and his beard was grizzled, and he wore the green turban restricted to descendants of the Prophet. He was the picture of the dignified holy man Said had described, except for his pale face and shaking hands. You are ill, I said, moving toward him. Let me shut up. He dropped to his knees and tugged at something on the floor. We've got a few seconds, maybe a minute. Damn, I can't do this. Give me a hand. There had been no attempt to conceal the trapdoor. It covered the entrance to a small underground room that was used for storage. Between us, we got it up, and I saw the top of a rough wooden ladder. You first, he said. Hurry. But it's a dead end. You don't take orders well, do you? He was still on his knees. A violent fit of trembling seized him, and his teeth began to chatter. And at that strategic moment, the door shuddered under the impact of a heavy object. I got down the ladder without touching more than three of the rungs and reached up to steady him as he followed me down. He pushed my hands away. I couldn't see what he was doing. It was too dark. I heard scraping noises and a few muffled oaths, and then he fumbled for my hand. Through there. Get rid of your tob and habara. You'll have to crawl. Hands and knees. Keep moving. It's about ten yards. When you can't go any further, wait for me. It was a tunnel, and I didn't like it one bit. Though walls and ceiling had been braced with pieces of wood, sand kept trickling through them. It inspired me to move more quickly than I might otherwise have done, but I hadn't gone more than a few yards before I heard his hard breathing and felt his hands pushing on the soles of my shoes. Forty-one, forty-two, can't you move any faster? I said, ouch! My head had just come into painful contact with a solid surface. Right angle turn, said my invisible companion. Forty-six... Faster! He went on counting. When he reached sixty, he grabbed hold of my ankles and pulled. I fell hard, flat on my stomach, and he fell on top of me. I had once been in an air raid in London, when a shell landed within a hundred yards of the underground station. It felt and sounded like that, a muffled blast and a horrible vibration. The slow dribble of earth increased to a steady rain. The ceiling's coming down, I said, through a mouthful of sand. Not just yet, I hope. Go on, we're almost out. When I raised my head, I saw starlight. The opening was only a few feet away. I squeezed through, encouraged by an occasional shove and a stream of muttered expletives, and found myself in the open air behind a tumble of mud bricks that had once been a house or storage shed. Sethos followed me out. He was bareheaded. Either he'd discarded the distinctive green turban, or it had been pulled off. He sat down and wrapped his arms round his raised knees. Go on. Where? Any place where there are bright lights and hordes of people. Or you might cast yourself on the tender mercies of my... of the Emersons. The Dahabia is a mile away, in that direction. What about you? I'll be all right here. Dancing lights, the flames of candles or lamps surrounded the pile of rubble where the house had stood, and a cloud of dust was still settling. People were shouting. The sound of the explosion would have brought the villagers out of their houses, and I had an unpleasant suspicion that they weren't the only spectators. The devil you will, I said. Blowing up the tunnel will only delay them. They'll spread out in all directions. Stand up. A mile isn't really a great distance. It is very long when one is encumbered with an unwilling, increasingly helpless companion, and when every sound makes one's heart stop. We hadn't been far from the edge of the cultivated fields. A line as sharp as if it had been drawn by a straight edge, and there was some cover in the form of trees and irrigation ditches and fields of growing crops. I took advantage of it when I could. 
I can't deny that I was frightened for myself as well as for him. If they meant to kill him or take him prisoner, they could not leave witnesses. Who were they? A gang of rival thieves? Surely not local men. They were pretty sure of getting off, if they were caught stealing antiquities. Nobody was going to make a fuss about that, except a few narrow-minded Egyptologists. Murder was something else. No, not local men. They wouldn't have the guile to use me as a means of getting at Sethos. They had used Said too. He must have been laughing in his ragged sleeve while he bargained with me. He'd been paid to give me that information, and I thought I knew why. They must have tried to trap him before. They had failed because he was too quick for them, and too well prepared. But if I turned up at his door, innocent and stupid and incompetent, a woman, in other words, I might delay him just long enough. We were lying flat in one of the muddier irrigation ditches at the time, while footsteps passed slowly along the raised embankment and faded. I hated to leave that ditch. For a few minutes I didn't believe I could, but I finally managed to get him to his feet and moving. He hadn't spoken for quite a while. He didn't speak again until I finally saw the lights of the Dehabiya ahead and made the mistake of offering what I thought was a word of encouragement. There it is, just a little farther. The violence of his reaction caught me off guard. He pulled away from me and staggered back. Where are we? I told him. He wrapped one arm round a tree trunk and fended me off with the other. No. You need a doctor. Would you rather I found a boatman to take us across to Luxor? You would, wouldn't you? Yes. Make up your mind. It seems to me this is the lesser of two evils. He let out an odd, choked laugh. Lesser of three evils. No, that's wrong. Least of three. Staying here, the worst. He slid through my outstretched hands and fell heavily to the ground. I knew I'd never get him up again, except for the spasms of shivering that shook his body. He lay unmoving and unresponsive. I took off my coat and put it over him. He'd been thinking more clearly than I, with the goal I had sought so close. I might have made the mistake of trying to drag him across the dock and up to the gangplank, and then everyone in Luxor would be gossiping about it next day. A visit from me, even at this hour, would not arouse surprise, though. I had already acquired a local sobriquet, the woman who looks for secrets. Though I tidied myself as best I could, brushing the dried mud off my skirt and coat and tucking straggling locks of hair into what remained of my once neatly coiled chignon, the man on watch by the gangplank was visibly taken aback by my appearance. Was that an accident, Sit? Oh, good, you speak English, I said gratefully. I lost my way and fell into an irrigation ditch. Will you tell Mr. and Mrs. Emerson I would like to see them? They are not here. The fact that the gangplank was still out should have warned me, but I felt as if I'd been hit a hard blow in the stomach. When will they be back? I do not know, Sid. They are at the castle of Vandergeld Effendi, he added somewhat doubtfully. My appearance clearly had not inspired confidence. I thanked him and turned away. I hadn't realised how I had looked forward to thrusting my responsibility on someone else. It was like a heavy burden settling back onto my shoulders. There was nothing I could do but wait. The Vandergelts were old friends of theirs. They might not come back for hours. It seemed like days. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramsay said with grudging respect... You got him all the way from the tariff. No wonder you look as if you'd been dragged behind a cart. Sorry, I, I didn't mean... Don't apologize. Margaret finished her brandy. I know I look like the wrath of God, and I don't care. May I... May I go back to him? One or two more questions. She sank back onto the settee, her lips curving in a sardonic smile. Is that all? For the moment. Why did you bring him here? She hadn't expected that. Ramses realized she hadn't even thought about it. Her forehead wrinkled in puzzlement. Where else could we go? He needed a doctor, and I could never have got him across the river. 
I suppose it ought to have occurred to me that I might be putting you and your wife in danger. I'm sorry about that. Ramses shook his head. If you'd been followed this far, they had ample time to dispose of him while you were waiting for us to return. Perhaps I ought to have expressed myself differently. What made you suppose we would take him in? Another interesting question, Margaret said thoughtfully. Bear in mind, I wasn't thinking too clearly. I simply assumed you would do the decent thing. Yes, of course, Ramsay said wryly. Noblesse oblige and all that. Your mother said he had saved her life. You wouldn't... You aren't going to turn him over to the police. I haven't decided what the devil I'm going to do with him. Don't worry, he added less forcibly. So long as he's ill, he's safe with us. Abbreviated though her account had been, it had taken longer than he'd realised. He held the door for her, wondering how they were going to account for her presence. She wouldn't leave unless he dragged her away, kicking and screaming. It would be even more difficult to explain the presence of a strange man. His uncle was deeply asleep, and Nefret was arranging a blanket that covered him to the chin. She must have changed the sheets. A pile of crumpled linen lay by the bed. You should have waited for me to help you, he said. Any halfway competent nurse can shove a 200 pound man around, even when he's a dead weight. The sheets were soaked, the fever's broken, and he'll sleep through till morning now. I'll stay with him, Margaret said. You must be tired. I'm used to this, but I'll accept the offer. Go wash your face and hands and take off those filthy clothes. I'll get you one of my dressing gowns. The minute he stirs, wake me. We're next door. As soon as they were in their room, Nefret kicked off her shoes and began unfastening buckles and buttons. Are we going to bed? Ramses asked, without much hope. Not yet. We've a lot to discuss. Hand me my dressing gown, will you please? The crew will be up at dawn. How are we going to account for them being here? She was here earlier, looking for us. Yes. Nefret tied the sash of her dressing gown. So she came back later, and he with her. "'and they both had a bit too much to drink.' "'She chuckled. "'They'd better be Mr. and Mrs., hadn't they?' "'But she's known in Luxor,' Ramses protested. "'The fret waved a dismissive hand. "'Men have no imagination. "'He's her estranged husband, "'who followed her here hoping for a reconciliation, "'which duly took place. "'That's why they were celebrating tonight. "'Your imagination is as outrageous as mother's,' Ramses said. There are so many holes in that plot, it resembles a sieve. What if he's ill again tomorrow? He will be ill again. She curled up on the bed. You've got him right where you wanted him. Before the next attack, he'll be weak but coherent. Ramses tossed his coat over a chair and began unbuttoning his shirt. Taking advantage of a sick man? Well, why not? It's in the best traditions of the game. "'Ramses, you have to. This is a very unpleasant development. "'You don't understand the implications.' "'I don't understand what you're getting at, no.' "'He finished undressing and put on a galabia, "'knowing he might be rousted out of bed early in the morning by a hysterical woman. "'Nefret sat up, tucking her feet under her. "'If he'd had an attack before, he'd have recognised the symptoms. "'With most types of malaria, there are inevitable relapses.' We've not learned how to cure it, only control it. And one never knows when the next attack will come on. A far-sighted man, as I believe him to be, would be damned good and sure he had quinine with him at all times. So? So if this is the first attack, he was infected approximately ten days ago, through a mosquito bite. There are malarial areas in the Delta and the Canal Zone, but public health methods have reduced the incidence of the disease... There is only one other area near here, Nefret concluded, where malaria is endemic. The oases? That's right. Kaga, Ramses muttered. It's been more than ten days since Assad was freed. So he's been back since, on other business. As you pointed out, it's only a few hours away by train. She leaned forward, her smooth brow furrowing. Remember, it was he who asked you if you suspected him of setting Assad on your trail. 
The idea had never occurred to you, or to me, before he brought it up. Guilt? I can't believe it. I don't like the idea any better than you do, but we'd be fools to ignore the possibility. He knew you took Wardani's place last winter. He knew Wardani's lieutenants had been sent to the Oasis, and he's certainly clever enough to realize that an emotional fellow like Assad could be egged on to seek revenge. You said it yourself. He's after something big, something for which he needs time and privacy. What better way of keeping us in Cairo, out of his way, than to set a dedicated assassin on your trail? Unfortunately for him, we didn't react as he had hoped. Everything that's happened since has been designed to get us to leave Luxor, including the attack on Mother. Ramses demanded incredulously. His henchman, I love that word, may have misunderstood his instructions. Now look here, Nefret. It was just a thought, Nefret murmured. No, darling, there is another alternative. He was telling the truth when he spoke of a rival. Someone else is after his big discovery. So it would appear. He blew out the lamp before he went to her. Said was bribed to tell her where she might find Sethos. It's the only possible explanation. Said is the last man on earth Sethos would have trusted with that information. They must have tried to trap him before and failed. They hoped her presence would slow him down enough for them to move in. Said must know who they are, then. Not with everyone trotting about in disguise, Ramsay said disgustedly. He's not the keenest of observers. No, oh, we'll have a chat with him, but I expect he'll claim it was just a jolly little joke on the sit. We're in too deep to pull out now, aren't we? She asked in a small voice. He took her in his arms. I'm afraid so. Get some sleep, it's late. We'll worry about our next move tomorrow. The proximity of his wife had the usual effect, but the damnable sense of duty his mother had pounded into him made him say, Perhaps I ought to stay with him tonight. If he's feeling fit enough by morning, he'll try to get away. No, he won't. I took his clothes. Chapter 13 Emerson was determined to go on working until the last possible moment, leaving all the domestic and travel arrangements to me. That suited me admirably, since he would only have been in the way. So I sent him off to Giza after breakfast, with every intention of joining him once I had completed my tasks. We had announced our intentions at breakfast, arousing some mild surprise and a great deal of pleasure, especially from Senia. There had been no question of her attending school that day. Not only was she entitled to a rest after her frightening experiences, but I didn't want to let her out of my sight, or at least out of the house. After her cries of delight had subsided, and she'd been persuaded to resume her chair, I said, "'We've a great deal to do if we're to be ready to leave tomorrow evening. You must help Basima pack your clothes, and the other things you want to take.' "'My presents.' Her juvenile brow wrinkled. I don't have all my Christmas presents. Can we go to the Khan el Khalili, Aunt Amelia? No, I moderated my sharp tone. There won't be time. You can finish your shopping in Luxor. Supposing I bring back a few bones from Giza, Emerson offered. You can wrap them up for Aunt Nefret. I would rather pick my own bones, said Senia. Can't I go with you? No, uh, there will not be time. Fatima will need your help, too. Amazing, Emerson said to me, after she'd gone dancing off to visit Gargery and begin her packing. I had expected she would be timid about returning to Giza. It is a testimonial to her strong character, and I would like to believe to her trust in us. A trust, I added firmly, that will not again be misplaced. We must make certain she is guarded at all times without arousing new apprehensions in her. This was really a very good idea of mine, Emerson. With all the excitement, she won't have time to brood about her experiences. 
As soon as Emerson had taken his leave, I wrote out several telegrams and sent one of the men to the telegraph office, instructing him to stop at the railroad station afterward and purchase our tickets. A consultation with Fatima came next. I felt a slight touch of uneasiness when I found her in the kitchen, gathering the ingredients for her famous plum pudding. For such a self-effacing, soft-spoken little woman, she could be extremely stubborn about what she considered to be her duties and privileges, and preparing Christmas dinner was one of them. Cyrus's chef might not take kindly to having another cook underfoot. By midday, matters were well in hand at the house, so I took a picnic basket and set out for Giza, after warning everyone in the house to make certain Senia had someone with her at all times. I placed my greatest trust in Khadija. She was as strong as a man, and as dependable as one could wish. I found Emerson with William Amherst, finishing the survey of the site, and persuaded them to stop for a bite of lunch. "'The professor has told you of our plans?' I inquired of the young man. "'Yes, ma'am. Do you mean me to go with you? I wouldn't want to be in the way. In fact, William had been the furthest person from my thoughts, but his wide, moist eyes held a look of appeal I could not resist.' To leave such a friendless individual alone over the holiday seemed cruel in the extreme. He would be of no use here, since Emerson would not allow anyone to shift a single basket of sand without his supervision. He was well acquainted with the Vandergelts, and Cyrus had always spoken well of him. I weighed these factors with my customary quickness, and I believe there was scarcely a moment's pause before I replied. Naturally, I had counted on your joining us, William. Cyrus will be glad to have you. "'You are too good,' the young man exclaimed. "'Emerson had been muttering over his cucumber sandwich. "'It usually takes him a while to get his mind off the work he has been doing. "'The exchange caught his attention. "'He looked up, scowling. "'In her own characteristic fashion. "'Curse it, Peabody, did you come alone?' "'Certainly, I have my parasol.' "'Emerson did not pursue the subject. "'He had found another that gave him an excuse to complain.' You ought not to have left Senia. Emerson, there are eight people in the house, not counting the cat. I do think you ought to stop work for the day, though. We have a number of minor matters to clear up. Yes, and one of them is here at Giza, Emerson said. I want to have a closer look at the scene of yesterday's crime. What, the murder scene? I was thinking of the crime of abducting our ward. But you are in the right. We had better see what, if anything, is left of Saleh. He gave me a challenging smile. Needless to say, I remained unperturbed. It was William who turned pale. Left of the jackals and wild dogs will have been at him, Emerson said cheerfully. I'm surprised you haven't already attended to that, I said, watching William's countenance take on a greenish hue. What the devil was wrong with the man? He ought not to be so squeamish after so many years in Egypt. I was waiting for you, my dear. Not for all the world would I deprive you of the pleasure of examining a dismembered corpse. Come along, Amherst. You won't want to miss this. I honestly do not believe Emerson was motivated by malice. He is of the school that believes the best way to conquer a weakness is to face it head on. An examination of the spot where Senia had been seized gave us no new information. Returning to the hotel, we collected our horses and hired one for William, overruling his feeble excuses. However, only a person of excessively delicate sensibilities would have been overcome by what we found. Predators had been at the body of the dog. The remains were somewhat scattered about, but enough remained to identify it. Of the body of its owner, there was no trace, except for a copious quantity of dried blood, already blurred by blowing sand. "'Someone must have collected whatever the jackals left and bedded it,' said Emerson. "'Touching consideration. "'I suppose even a swine like Saleh might have a friend. "'Let us see if we can locate him.' "'With William trailing reluctantly after us, "'we made our way down the ridge into the village. "'Since we had to assume we had been seen, "'Emerson announced our approach in the loudest possible voice "'and in terms designed to reassure the hearers.' We mean no harm to the innocent. You know us. 
You know that when our word is given, it is not broken. We will pay well for information. Bakshish! The seemingly empty houses disgorged a trickle of people, fewer than twenty in all, ranging in age from naked toddlers to a toothless, bent old man who proclaimed himself the sheikh of this wretched place. We have your word, O oh father of curses, he mumbled. We are innocent. We have done no wrong. Emerson reached into his pocket. Coins jingled. The audience edged closer. We got very little in the way of useful information, though Emerson dispensed back sheesh with a lavish hand. All in the village knew that Saleh was a bad man, but always before he had done his evil deeds elsewhere. They had known nothing of his latest venture into crime until he came to the village carrying a child whose struggles and complaints made it clear that she had not come willingly. They had been too afraid of him to interfere. He hadn't been seen with a stranger in the village or elsewhere. In short, they were ignorant and innocent, and they were relieved he was dead. But they had buried his remains because that was their religious duty. And because they didn't want his ghost coming back to haunt them, said Emerson to me in English. Do you want to dig him up, Peabody? Most probably he's buried deep. I see no point in doing that, Emerson. I wonder what he did with the first payment he'd been given. It wasn't on his body. Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin. Hmm, let's have a look. Emerson and Amherst, who had regained his nerve, now that there were no dismembered corpses to be inspected, found the little bundle tucked into a crevice in the crumbling wall of the hut. While they searched, I did what I could for the old woman. She was in pitiable condition. Opium destroys the appetite of the user, and it was evident that she hadn't even had the will or the energy to drink water. She sucked greedily at the canteen I held to her lips, and then sank back with a sigh. My son is dead, Sitakim. Soon I will die too. I have no wish to live. There are others who will care for you, Emerson said. We will make sure they do. Ah, uh -huh. she raised her head. Then I will live. The father of curses has said it. How does it feel to be a demigod with the power of life and death, I inquired, as we left the nasty place. Splendid, said Emerson with a grin. He had removed the rag that had been wrapped round the money, and I recognized the notes issued by the National Bank of Egypt. Fifty Egyptian pounds, said Emerson, counting. He paid well, the swine. This should keep the old lady in lentils and opium for a while. He gave the money to the mayor, whose roomy eyes popped when he saw the amount, and whose wrinkled face fell when he heard Emerson's instructions. I did not doubt they would be followed to the letter, since Emerson announced his intention of sending round from time to time to make certain. He added in an offhand tone that if one of them remembered something of interest, he would pay well for information. Do you think someone is concealing something? I inquired as we mounted and started back to Giza. I rather doubt it. But should that be the case, he wouldn't speak up in front of the others. We will have to wait and see. Fatima had tea ready when we reached the house, where we found Dawood making serious inroads on a plate of sandwiches. Fatima had fed him the latest gossip, along with the sandwiches, and he was fairly bursting with outrage at the effrontery of the man who had dared lay hands on the little bird. Naturally, he was convinced he could have prevented it if he'd not been in Luxor. We let him get it out of his system, and then Emerson said, You couldn't be in two places at once, Dowd. We sent you to Luxor to find out how matters are proceeding there. Make a report. Fatima, more sandwiches, if you please. Dawood held up his hand. One, he said, raising a finger twice the length and breadth of mine. Without pausing for breath, he proceeded to reel off the facts which, he added, Nurmi Sur had told him to relate.
He had just finished the second of them when Senia burst into the room, embraced us all, and settled herself comfortably on Dawood's large lap. How are they all? she demanded. Is Bertie better? Do they know we are coming? Are we? Dawood asked. Oh, yes. Didn't the professor tell you? All of us, on the train tomorrow. Tell me how they are, Dawood. Do they miss me? Very much, Dawood assured her. Mr. Bertie is better. Three. He has found a new interest. Her name is Jumana. I did not doubt he had repeated the message word for word. It was not at all what I had had in mind for Bertie, but Emerson's well-shaped lips curved in one of those masculine smiles. The girl Nefret mentioned? Well, well, there's nothing like a pretty woman to... Emerson, please! With a gesture, I reminded him that there was an innocent child present. Did you meet the young woman, Dawood? Oh, yes. Nur Misur said you would want to know what I thought of her. She is very, very pretty. He took another sandwich. Is that all? I demanded. Dawood pondered the question. She talks in a loud voice and says what she thinks. So it is likely Yusuf will not find a husband for her, though she is very, very... Yes, I see. Oh, dear, Emerson, I foresee complications. So long as it doesn't turn out to be another pair of confounded young lovers, Emerson grunted. We used to be infested with them, and a damned deuced nuisance they were. There is a more important thing, said Dowd, who had no interest in young lovers. He added punctiliously, It was not Nur Misur who told me of it. Something about the tomb robbing, Emerson inquired. Dowd cleared his throat. With the instincts of a master storyteller, he had saved this bit of news for the last, and his solemn voice made it evident he was quoting. It is known in Luxor that the master has returned. His whereabouts no man knows. His true appearance no man knows. He has a thousand faces and ten thousand names. The silence that followed was broken by the crash of shattering China. Mr. Amherst had dropped his cup. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. The soft sound brought Ramses instantly awake. The curtains at the window fluttered in the morning breeze. He had just enough time to swing his feet to the floor and make sure he was decently covered before the door opened. Nefret sat up with a start. The candle Margaret held cast ugly shadows over her face, shaping black hollows under her cheekbones and lengthening her nose. Come at once, she ordered. He's awake. The window of the room where they had installed their guest faced east. It wasn't quite as early as Ramses had thought. The sky over the eastern cliffs was pale with the approach of dawn. He had expected to find Sethos on his feet and in a combative frame of mind, the light from Margaret's candle showed a motionless form lying on the bed. The face above the blanket that covered him from feet to chin was unshaven and sunken, with a scowl almost as forbidding as one of Emerson's. Clever, he said. I suppose there's no use asking you to give me back my clothes. That's open to negotiation, Nefret said. She looked and sounded a good deal brighter than Ramses felt. Stifling a yawn that threatened to crack his jaws, he leaned against the wall and folded his arms. Nefret opened her medical bag. The expression on Sethos's face, when he saw the thermometer, cheered Ramses quite a lot. No, he said firmly. Yes, said Nefret. Shall I have Ramses hold you down? His uncle considered the question. Ramses, who was beginning to enjoy himself, watched the struggle between common sense and an unreasonable but understandable desire to hit out at someone. At least get her out of here before you rob me of what remains of my dignity, Sethos said, glancing obliquely at Margaret. It was the first time he had deigned to acknowledge her presence. That's reasonable, Nefret conceded. Margaret, go and get dressed. Use the room next to this one. 
Sethos submitted to Nefret's examination in tight-lipped silence. Temperature and pulse normal, she announced. But you know what's going to happen, don't you? He responded with another question. Malaria? Looks like it. What time did the last attack begin? Sethos brushed this aside with a wave of his hand. You needn't stand over me like a prison guard, Nefret. I haven't the strength to fight you off, much less the pair of you. And I'm not foolhardy enough to risk falling ill before I can find a safe hiding place. We need to come up with an explanation for my being here. Any ideas? The force of his personality was strong as ever, even though he was flat on his back, looking like death warmed over. But this time, his attempt to distract them failed. Have I your word you won't try to leave? Nefret asked. For what it's worth. His lips twisted. Would a cup of coffee be asking too much? I'll see what I can do. Sethos's eyes followed her as she went to the door, her white gown falling in graceful folds. Is there any chance of concealing my presence from your crew? he asked. Not likely. However, the door opened again. Nefret thrust a bundle of clothes at Ramsay's. You may as well get dressed, too. Bolt the door, Sethos suggested, unless you want an audience. She got you here, all the way from the tariff, Ramsay said. He stood up, stamped his feet into his boots, and fastened his belt, at considerable risk to herself and without anyone seeing you. Give the woman credit. Never mind that. I presume you know that there are several unpleasant persons looking for me. You might put yourself and your wife in danger if I remain. You can't leave now without being seen, unless you mean to swim across the river. I've an idea. Ramses waited until the women had joined them before he explained his plan. The coffee Nefret brought finished clearing his head, and he flattered himself that he managed to produce a clear, lucid argument, despite his uncle's frequent attempts to interrupt. We can't conceal indefinitely the fact that we have a guest... Misdirection is our only hope. They know Margaret was with you last night. They know or will learn that she came here earlier in the evening, alone. Ashraf saw her leave. He will swear she did not return. If we can get her over to Luxor unobserved, no one will know where she was for the rest of the night. I'll have to take her across myself. She can borrow Nefret's tob and veil. It'll be a bit tricky, but I think we can manage it if we get the crew out of the way. If she has any sense, which I doubt, she'll refuse, Sethos drawled. Do you suppose they won't want to chat with the last person known to be with me? She only has to walk from the dock to the hotel, Ramsay said. Once there, she stays. Is that clear, Margaret? Don't set foot outside the hotel until you hear from us, and don't respond to any written messages. Margaret nodded brusquely. As for you, Ramsay went on, "'returning his gaze to his uncle, "'who stared back at him without blinking. "'We met you at the Vandergelts last night "'and brought you here when it was apparent "'you were coming down with malaria. "'You don't trust these native hospitals "'and you refused to be examined by a male physician.' "'Nefret let out a gurgle of laughter. "'She was always quick. "'Sethos wasn't far behind her. "'Ramses had expected, "'had in fact rather hoped for, an outraged protest. "'A woman.' he said flatly. You'll tell the crew I'm Cyrus's spinster sister. Very proper, very modest. First trip to Egypt, hates everything about it. Don't tell me how to play a role, Sephos grunted. There was a glint in his eyes that Ramses didn't like at all. Control your histrionic urges, he said sharply. No one will set eyes on you. Our steward wouldn't venture to intrude on a maiden lady. But I ought to have a wig or a nightcap, Sethos insisted, just in case, and a flannel gown. Nefret's laughter shook her whole body. Margaret's face grew even grimmer. She got to her feet. Is he feeling better? she asked Nefret. Obviously, Nefret gasped. One long step brought Margaret to the side of the bed. She raised her hand and brought it down with stinging force across Sethos's unshaven cheek. That, she said, is for making a fool of me and Hayil. And this, 
he caught her hand before it connected a second time. Margaret called him a name that made Ramses blink. She was choking with rage. For being a supercilious, ungrateful, selfish pig. She pulled her hand free and flung herself out of the room. The door of the adjoining room slammed. That's got rid of her, anyhow, said Sethos. Now, you are a pig, the fret snapped. The sentiment seems to be unanimous, Sethos said, meeting Ramsay's hostile stare. As I was about to say, your plan is admirable as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. I know. I'll take care of the rest tonight. No, Sethos said. I think I know what you have in mind, and it makes a certain amount of sense, but I'll see to it myself. With a temperature of 103, by nightfall you'll be burning with fever or shaking with chills. There's just one little thing. Before I mount my fiery steed and ride out to challenge your enemies, I'd rather like to know who they are and what they are after. His uncle's expression made his palms itch. He was in complete sympathy with Margaret's desire to slap that supercilious smile off his face. Sethos knew it was not concern for him that had prompted Ramsay's plan. If word got out that they were harboring a stranger on the Amelia, someone might hear of Margaret's visit earlier that same evening and put two and two together. The master must be seen and recognized after that visit, so that his enemies would not come looking for him here. This hasn't anything to do with the Senussi or Sahin Bay or the damned department, has it? Ramses demanded. It's the same old antiquities game. You let things slip for a time and a new player has jumped in. Who? If I knew, don't you suppose I'd have dealt with him? You'd better believe me, Ramses, reluctant though you may be to do so. I've been trying for weeks to identify the fellow. If he's an Egyptian, he's an unusual specimen, because he's utterly ruthless. He's killed at least three people. I don't want you to be the fourth. Amelia would take it badly. You aren't going to evade the issue again, Ramses snapped. He sat down on the side of the bed and took his exasperating kinsman by the shoulders. What's he after? The muscles under his hands contracted in a series of shivers. What? Ramses demanded. Queen T's jewels? Sorry, Sethos muttered. I'm feeling a bit... The jewels? There weren't any. That entertaining episode and the rumours I spread about were just my way of announcing my return. He closed his eyes. Ramsay's hands tightened involuntarily. Sethos moaned. Leave him alone, Ramses, Nifret said. She leaned over the bed. I want you to take another dose of quinine. Then I'll get you a nice frilly nightcap and we'll let you sleep. Where she had obtained the cap, Ramses could not imagine. He'd never seen her wear it. It had pink bows and rows of lace ruffles. Surely not even Mother wears those, he asked. It's what they call a boudoir cap, Nefret explained, to cover one's untidy hair while one drinks one's morning tea. Before one's maid attends to one's toilette. It came with a negligee, a set. I intended to give it to Senia. I'm going to kill him. Ramses said. You can kill him after breakfast, darling. Go on up. I'll be along after I've had a word with Margaret. As he made his way up the stairs to the upper deck, Ramses considered his plan again. It had a number of weak spots, but he had been unable to think of anything better. Cyrus would have to be warned, and another lie concocted for him and Catherine. Not even to Cyrus could they reveal the true identity of Nefret's patient. Ramses swore under his breath. Inventing wild fictions was more along his mother's lines than his, but he could only thank God she wasn't here, adding further complications to a situation that was already getting out of hand. He'd have to wait until afternoon, when the men were sleeping, to take Margaret across the river, and, by one means or another, force Sethos to divulge the secret he was determined to keep to himself, and, and get rid of Jumana and Jamil. He had no sooner seated himself than they turned up. With another muttered oath, he went to the rail. When she saw him, Jumana began waving and calling out. 
She looked like an animated doll in Lefret's clothes. Don't swear, Lefret said, joining him at the rail. Was I? Tell them they won't be needed today, Lefret. Eat your breakfast before it gets cold, Lefret said, and went back down the stairs. Nasir was standing at attention, a napkin over his arm, as she had taught him, ready to serve the food. But Ramsay stayed at the rail, watching as Nefret talked with Jumana. It was a task he ought to have tackled himself, instead of leaving it to her. But that infuriating conversation with Sethos had left him so angry, he wasn't sure he could trust himself to behave normally. The loan of a few books satisfied Jumana. Jamil lingered, exchanging witticisms and boasts with Ashraf, before he followed his sister. Nefret came upstairs. She declined Nasir's offer to warm the food, told him they would wait on themselves, and began eating tepid eggs and soggy toast. I'm sorry, Ramsay said. I ought to have sent them away myself instead of... Stop it! She looked up. Her eyes were blazing. You're always sorry about the wrong things. What sort of idiotic stunt have you planned for tonight? If you're determined to go through with it, I'm going with you. Someone has to stay with him. Someone? Why is someone always me? Her eyes were brimming with tears, probably of rage. In this case, I know. She wiped her eyes. But I insist on knowing where you're going and what you mean to do. The obvious move is to go back to the house where he was staying and pretend to look for something he'd been forced to leave behind. I'll show myself to some of the villagers, indicate guilt and alarm, and beat a hasty retreat. I thought that was it. Damnation, Ramses! What if some of the... the others are watching the place? I'll retreat even more hastily. It was a fairly feeble attempt at humour, and Nefret was not amused. He took her hand in his... I doubt they have the manpower to waste on surveillance, Nefret, but it would certainly help if I knew who they are and how many of them there are and what they want from him. Her unsmiling lips tightened. I'll find out. You'd take advantage of a sick man. She pushed her chair back. One more insouciant remark, Ramsay's Emerson, and you will be sorry. He was faking that attack. If it follows the usual pattern, it won't hit again until later this afternoon, and at this moment I wouldn't give a damn if he were about to breathe his last. Do you want to come with me? I wouldn't miss it for the world. Sethos was lying with his back to the door. When it opened, he turned over. The ruffles framing his bristly face should have been mirth-provoking, but he carried it off as only Sethos could. Now what? he demanded. Nefret sat down beside him and began to speak softly. After only a few sentences, Sethos threw up his hands. I know better than to argue with a woman when she's in that frame of mind. You'd dismember me without hesitation if it would help him, wouldn't you? Yes. Hmm. There's nothing like devoted love to bring out the finest qualities in... All right, all right. I was going to tell you anyhow... His eyes turned to Ramsay's. So far as I know, there are only three of them, in addition to their anonymous leader. One's a Syrian named Mubashir, who worked for me in Cairo in 08. He probably thinks he's still working for me. Short, stocky, scars on both cheeks. He gave brief descriptions of the other two, adding, Mubashir's the most dangerous one of the best men with a knife I've ever employed, and quick as a snake. You'll go armed? He will, Nefret said, before Ramses could answer. Do you think they'll be waiting for you to come back? Not if they know my habits. One of the reasons for my long, successful career is that I never return to a place once it's known to the other side, even if it means abandoning useful items. He gave Ramses an insolent grin. You made good use of the items I had to leave behind once before. You'll find that skill useful tonight. But don't be tempted to show off. It's a family failing. All you need do is make sure some of the villagers see and identify you. You're about my height and build. The green turban should dispel any doubts. I lost mine somewhere along the way. But you can probably come up with... He's doing it again. 
Ramsay said to his wife. Right. I am willing to believe, said Nefret, articulating with precision, that you haven't learnt the identity of the leader. Why haven't you questioned that man, Mubashir? Go after Mubashir? Sethos shuddered, or pretended to. Thank you, no. I would rather my liver, lungs, and intestines remained intact. I wouldn't get anything useful out of him anyhow. If my wily opponent has the wits for which I give him credit, he'll be playing the game as I did, skulking about by night, keeping conversation to a minimum, and never letting any of them get a good look at him. You'd be surprised how effective that sort of childish play-acting can be with people who... I don't want a lecture, Ramsay said, trying to keep his voice level. I want to know what started this game. What's the prize, and where is it? It's rather a long story. Quiet, Nefret raised her hand. Is that Nasir calling us? Nasir can go to the devil, Ramses said. I want answers, Sethos. They can wait, Nefret said. No, really, darling, he's going to ramble on and on until you hit him, or I hit him, or Nasir comes bursting in here. The only thing that matters now... She leaned over Sethos, her face so close to his that their noses were almost touching. If anything, anything at all, happens to Ramses tonight, she said in a voice as sweet as a chime of golden bells, and it happens because you concealed information that might, might have made a difference. For a long second, he stared as if mesmerized into her blue eyes. Then he swallowed with difficulty and turned his head away. There's nothing, you have my word, for what it's worth. Nasir's hails were becoming peremptory. Ramses left Sethos to his wife's tender mercies. She looked like a ministering angel as she lifted his head and held a cup of water to his lips, her hair a halo of gold. He got past the door of their room before Nasir appeared, still shouting his name. So far, they had managed to keep the staff in the dark about their visitor. The longer they could do so, the better. The word would be all over the boat and then all over Luxor. So preoccupied was he that it took a little time for the import of Nasir's announcement to sink in. Vandergelt Effendi, he repeated hollowly. Here? Cyrus was waiting in the saloon, impeccably garbed in his favourite snowy linen, radiating good humour. He gave his dishevelled host a long look, and his eyes twinkled. Hope I'm not disturbing you. Figured you'd be up and about by now. We were. We are. Ramses tried to smooth his hair and focus his brain. He still hadn't thought of a story to tell Cyrus. Always glad to see you. How's Bertie getting on? Real well. The twinkle intensified. Even better since our little visitor dropped by. Good Lord. Ramses dropped into a chair. Jumana. Nefret arrived in time to hear the last word. What's she done now? Paid a call on Catherine, proper as you please. Presented her with a pretty bouquet. Got the flowers out of my garden, I think, Cyrus added with a grin. That's quite a girl. She said you'd promised to teach her everything she needs to know to become an Egyptologist. What else did she say? Ramses asked apprehensively. Quite a lot. She was trying to impress us with how much she already knew about the subject. I do apologize, Cyrus, Nefret said. What for? No reason why she shouldn't pay her respects, even if she did have an axe to grind. It's a refreshing change to find someone who wants books instead of backsheesh. And I'll tell you something else. Bertie perked up like you wouldn't believe. Cyrus chuckled. He didn't make much headway with the young lady. Once he'd admitted he wasn't an Egyptologist, she ignored him as if he were a block of wood. As soon as she left, he went off to his room with a stack of books. Nefret looked at her husband. There was no meaningful exchange of glances this time. His face had gone courteously blank, and she knew he had stopped listening to Cyrus. There was enough on his mind, heaven knew, but Nefret had a feeling he wasn't taking this latest development seriously enough. Catherine would certainly disapprove of Bertie's attachment to an Egyptian girl, however innocent the relationship. 
I'll make damned good and sure it is innocent, Nefret thought, for Germana's sake, if not for Bertie's. She brought her attention back to Cyrus, who had launched into an animated discussion of his future plans. Bertie wasn't the only one who had perked up since they arrived in Luxor. I thought maybe you two would like to go around with me looking for possible sites. Ramses looked as if he'd been polaxed. Today? I'm anxious to get started, but if you folks have something else to do... I'm afraid we're busy today, Nefret said. What about tomorrow? Or the day after? Why, sure. Cyrus rose and picked up his hat. You'll have to excuse me. I got so carried away, I forgot you might have other plans. Not at all. Nefret said. We'd love to go with you. Soon. There's no hurry, Cyrus said amiably. Lots of other things I can do. I might have a word with Yusuf, ask if he has any suggestions. Excellent idea, Ramsey said. As soon as Cyrus had gone, he turned on Nefret. Tomorrow? He won't be recovered by then, will he? Probably not. We'll just have to put Cyrus off again. You didn't tell him about his ailing sister. I couldn't think of any explanation that made sense, Ramses admitted. My brain seems to have gone dead. Small wonder. Why don't you get a few hours sleep? He went to her and took her hands in his. You didn't get much sleep last night either. I don't have the kind of day ahead that you do. She freed her hands and put them on his shoulders. Go and lie down. I'll wake you in time for lunch. He hadn't supposed he would sleep, but he did waking of his own accord after a dream so outrageously horrific that he smiled drowsily as he remembered it. The boat capsizing, and Margaret calling him names as she sank, while he trod water and made no move to rescue her. Cyrus riding up and down the west bank, bellowing, That's not my sister, Emmeline! Sethos telling Nefret that he would turn back into a prince if she kissed him, Sethos again, perched on the tumbled ruins of his house, watching with a smile while Mubashir neatly removed Ramsay's lungs, liver, and intestines and put them into canopic jars. The carved human heads on the lids of the jars did not have the royal ureus on their brows, and Ramses had been about to object to this omission when he woke up. When he joined Nefret for luncheon, he told her about the first part of the dream thinking it might amuse her. The last two episodes almost certainly would not. You know what the Freudians would say about your letting Margaret drown, she said gravely. They'd be wrong. God knows I wish she hadn't complicated our lives, but I have a great deal of admiration for her. As soon as he's fully recovered, I'll hold his arms while she hits him as often as she likes. You don't suppose Cyrus does have a sister named Emmeline? I don't think he has a sister by any name. She did smile then. How did your unconscious come up with Emmeline? Someone I missed? The only Emmeline I've met was Mrs. Pankhurst, and I assure you I never got within ten feet of her, nor wanted to. They made conversation until Nasir had cleared the table and taken himself off. Ramses lit a cigarette. Is she ready? Nefret nodded. What about the dinghy? It might be recognized. I'll steal or hire a boat. See you in a bit. The first part of the plan went off without a hitch. By the time he got back to the Amelia in the small sailing boat he'd hired, after the usual intensive bargaining, the crewmen had settled down for their afternoon rest, and the only traffic on the river was a few commercial steamers and barges. With Nefret's assistance, he got the black-robed woman out the window and into the boat. Neither of them spoke much during the voyage. He was busy with the tiller and the sails, and she didn't seem inclined toward conversation. As they neared the east bank, she raised her bowed head. The veil hid all of her face except for her eyes. They were sunken and shadowed, but when she spoke, it was in her usual brisk voice. You'll let me know? Yes, in person, sometime tomorrow, if we can manage it. Remember what I said about sticking close to the hotel. It would make my life much more difficult if you were abducted. Or killed. That's the only positive aspect of the situation. If they do come after you, they will want you alive. Do you call that positive? 
It's much harder to carry off a healthy, hearty woman than to slit her throat. He didn't give her time to comment on that. I'm going to put you ashore as close to the hotel as I can. You'll have something of a scramble climbing the bank, but after what you did last night, I expect you can manage it. She managed, with a certain amount of slipping and swearing. Ramses waited until she had reached the top of the embankment before he followed, in time to see her dart across the road and start up the long, curving arm of the staircase that led to the door of the Winter Palace. She'd be all right now, if she remembered to divest herself of her Egyptian dress before she tried to go in. The wind had died down, and it took him twice as long to get back across, using the oars a good part of the way. He returned his hired vessel, removed beard, turban, and abba behind a tree, and headed for the Amelia, scratching absently at his jaw. He'd been trying to develop an adhesive that didn't itch without success thus far. The sun was sinking westward, and cool grey shadows stretched across his path. As soon as darkness had fallen, he could finish the rest of the programme. He was rather looking forward to it. Action of any kind was easier than waiting, and he didn't really anticipate any trouble. Nefret's part was the hardest. She wouldn't whine or cry, but she would be sick with apprehension until he came back. It had gone well so far. He wondered, with a complacency he was soon to regret, why he had let himself get worked up. This situation was no more complicated than the messes his parents got into all the time. It must be an unknown tomb Sethos and his rival were after. There were plenty of them in Thebes. In the past half-century alone, over fifty had been discovered, more than two dozen in the Valley of the Kings itself, three or more by the indefatigable Abed Era Saul family. To be sure, the majority had been unfinished or thoroughly plundered, and the rare exceptions to the latter condition had been those of officials, not royalty. But there were a number of pharaohs still missing. Horemhab, several of the Ramses, Tutankhamun. Golden visions swam about in his mind. Ashraf was sitting at the foot of the gangplank, smoking and staring placidly into space. He sprang to his feet when he saw Ramses. Nul Misol is looking for you, brother of demons. The golden visions were replaced by what his mother would have called a hideous foreboding. What has happened, Ashraf? Nothing, nothing. But she said... Ramses hurried up the gangplank, leaving Ashraf talking to himself. Nefret must have heard their voices. She came running to meet him, eyes wide, face strained. He caught her in his arms. Darling, what's wrong? Did he... She pushed him away. He didn't do anything... The next paroxysm has started. I've got to get back to him. But, oh, Ramses, you won't believe this. It's too awful. What? For God's sake, Nefret. There was a crumpled piece of paper in her hand. A telegram. He snatched it from her. Arriving Luxor Wednesday a.m. with Senia, Selim and others. Staying with Cyrus. No need for you to do anything. She had even paid for another extra word. Love, mother. Ramses drew the curtain aside and looked out the window. The night sky was brilliant with stars, and moonlight streaked the rippling dark water. He'd stripped his shirt and drawers and removed his shoes. Stimer was going. Are you sure you can handle him? The ghost of a smile touched Nefret's lips. Look at him. The first stage of the attack had passed, and fever reddened the sick man's face. Though his eyes were open, he didn't seem to be aware of his surroundings, and he hadn't spoken, except for incoherent murmurs. Nefret extinguished the lamp before she joined him at the window. Ramses felt as if he ought to say something, but he couldn't think what. Don't worry, but she would. I love you. That sounded as if he never expected to see her again. What was there to say after all? He kissed her upturned face, a hard, quick kiss, and slid out the window. Reaching up, he took the bundle she handed him. Don't be tempted to show off, she whispered, and withdrew from the window. Once ashore, he wrung out his dripping undergarments and put them on again. The fabric was uncomfortably clammy, 
but there was a chance he'd want to discard the robe, and he didn't fancy running about in his bare skin. The waterproof wrappings had kept the clothing dry. He put them on, robe, beard, turban, sandals, knife belt, and started walking. Though he kept a wary eye out, he had ample time for what his mother would have called radiocination during the mile-long hike. Unfortunately, he still couldn't think of any way of averting the catastrophe that would soon be upon them. He and Lafrette had discussed alternatives that afternoon, once he'd recovered from the shock of the telegram. Tell them they mustn't come, had been her first suggestion. Tell Mother not to do something. You're right. That would only make her more determined. What do you suppose brought this on? Why speculate? It could be anything from wanting to share a jolly Christmas celebration to... I'm afraid to think. They can't know about him. Can they? Anything's possible where my mother's concerned, but I don't see how that fascinating bit of information can have reached her. We've got to get him off the Amelia before they arrive, Nefret. Yes. They stared blankly at one another. How? Nefret asked. Where to? A rustle in the vegetation brought Ramsay's attention back to his surroundings. He was almost at the edge of the cultivation. To his right, the broken columns of Seti's temple glowed pale in the moonlight. Time to concentrate on the job ahead. One crisis at a time, he told himself. He was familiar with the village, though he'd never had any reason to linger there. It was one of several small settlements between the southern end of Dra Abul Naga and the Seti the First Temple. He circled the place, fingering the torch in his pouch and wondering whether he would have to use it. The moonlight should be bright enough if he could attract someone's attention. From the ridge he selected as his vantage point, the small huddle of huts looked deserted. Most of the villagers went to bed as soon as it was dark. Lamp oil was costly. A pile of rubble indicated the site of Sethos's house. He'd done a thorough job. Not a wall had been left standing. The locals had probably added their bit, rooting in the ruins in search of some object they could use, or, if one was charitably inclined, for a body, dead or alive. Ramses picked up a handful of stones and began pitching them in the general direction of the village, spacing them so that the sounds would suggest they had been set rolling by approaching feet. He waited for a bit, listening. He threw one more stone and was rewarded with the first response, a loud canine yelp. The stone must have struck a sleeping dog. He headed down the slope, impatient to get the business over. Several other dogs had added their comments to the original complaint. A light showed at the window of one of the houses, and a voice shouted imprecations in Arabic. All perfectly normal and harmless, just as Sethos had predicted. The aroused sleeper had his head out the window, cursing the dogs. They were now following Ramses, snarling and barking. He stopped a few feet from the house, full in the moonlight. A halt in the curses, followed by a cry of surprise, assured him he'd been seen. So he turned and trotted back the way he'd come. The dark form seemed to rise up out of the ground directly in his path. He flung himself to one side and flipped over, landing on his feet as a knife drove into the ground on the spot where he'd just been. He caught one glimpse of a scarred, distorted face before he broke into a run, hurtling obstacles in his path and resisting the temptation to look back. Footsteps pounded after him, but he didn't doubt he could keep ahead. And if he didn't lose the fellow before he reached the edge of the cultivation, there were a number of handy bolt holes in the temple ruins, with which he was thoroughly familiar. Mubashir, it had to be Mubashir, was as familiar with the terrain as he was. He avoided several pitfalls Ramses had hoped he'd fall into, and came doggedly on. Finally, though, the sound of footsteps stopped. Ramses was about to risk a glance back, when something slid past his ear and sliced through the shoulder of his borrowed garment, before thudding into the ground ahead of him. He ran faster. When he reached the back of the temple, he collapsed panting onto the ground behind a tumble of fallen blocks and took stock. There was no sign of his pursuer. The Syrian had thrown the knife only when he realized he was going to lose the race. It had been an incredible throw, in moonlight, and at a rapidly moving target. And Ramses was glad he hadn't looked over his shoulder. 
He might be missing the end of his nose instead of a bit of his earlobe. It had stopped bleeding, but the gash on his shoulder was still oozing. After removing his extraneous garments and beard, he entered the water, and before long he was pulling himself up to the open window. The fret was there. She took the bundle from him and stood back while he climbed in. Go and change those wet clothes, she ordered. Then her eyes widened. God damn it, Ramses, what happened? The cuts had opened up and he was dripping blood as well as water on the floor. I told you not to show off, his uncle remarked. He was sitting up in bed. The fever had passed. Fresh sheets were tucked neatly round him and he was wearing a nice, clean nightshirt. Except for his heavy growth of beard and a certain hollowness around his eyes, he looked reasonably healthy and extremely comfortable. You didn't tell me your Syrian friend could throw a knife, Ramsay snapped. I thought that was implicit in my description of his skills. Nefret's jaw was set. Shirt off, she said. It's nothing, honestly. Take it off. Her medical bag was on the floor by the bed. Fumbling a little, she took out various items while Ramses tugged the wet fabric over his head and tossed it into a corner. You got off lightly, said Sethos, inspecting him. I was running like hell. Wise move. Well? Ramses sat down rather squashily and recounted his adventures while Nefret splashed antiseptic all over him. Her hands were still shaking. It seems to have been an effective performance. Sethos conceded. You were somewhat careless. A wordless snarl from Nefret stopped him. She slapped a final bit of sticking plaster onto Ramsay's shoulder, reached into her bag and took out a hypodermic needle and a small bottle. Hold out your arm, she ordered, advancing on Sethos. What's that? Something to help you sleep? I don't need... But I, said Nefret, need to stick something sharp into you. If I hadn't taken the Hippocratic Oath, this would be a knife. Ramses, go to bed. You must be absolutely exhausted. I want to watch, Ramses said. As he knew from personal experience, Nefret had a light hand with a hypodermic needle. She jabbed this one into Sethos's arm with almost as much force as if it had been a knife. She had left a lamp burning in their room. He had barely time to close the door before she flung herself at him, winding her arms tightly round his neck and hiding her face against his breast. I'm going to kill him, she mumbled. Not you, me. After what you went through today, he didn't even thank you. Watching his uncle cringe away from the fret with her needle had made Ramses feel more tolerant. He resents accepting favours. I expect he hasn't had much practice at it. Don't try to make me feel sorry for him. Nothing you could do would annoy me more. He slid his fingers into her hair and tilted her head back and was about to kiss her when his jaws parted in a huge involuntary yawn. Sorry, darling. Bed, Nefret ordered. This instant. He hadn't realized how tired he was until his aching body came to rest on the mattress. But his mind wouldn't stop churning. I hope we're on shopping for sights with Cyrus tomorrow. I put him off. Nefret removed the pins and combs from her hair and began brushing it. The arrival of the family was a sufficient excuse. Oh, God, yes. What are we going to do about them? The long, waving locks fell over her shoulders in a golden shower. She smiled at him and extinguished the lamp. Don't worry about it tonight, darling. I've got a plan. Chapter 14 The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Continued. Tell them everything, Ramses said doubtfully. Tell everyone everything. Nefret gestured extravagantly with a slice of buttered toast. Her eyes were bluer than the morning sky and bright as the sun over the eastern cliffs. The knowledge that his exasperating kinsman was deep in drugged slumber had allowed Ramses to have the best night's sleep he'd enjoyed for days. What with one thing and another, he'd been in an excellent mood when they went up to breakfast. Until then. That's your famous plan? It solves the major difficulties, doesn't it? 
We're getting so tangled up in lies and omissions, we won't be able to keep track of what we've told whom. She planted her elbows firmly on the table and leaned forward. We agreed last year that we'd stop playing these games because it caused a lot of trouble in the past. And here we are, at it again. The parents have been hiding things from us, and we've been hiding things from them. I say we put an end to it once and for all. She bit into her toast and watched him think it over, weighing all the pros and cons in his methodical fashion. At least he was thinking, not raising indignant objections. To her, the argument was logical and sensible, but there were several things to which her eminently logical husband did not respond sensibly. It's mother, isn't it? she asked. What? His eyebrows tilted. She's the one you don't trust to behave. For heaven's sake, Ramses, your mother has passed unscathed through more hair-raising adventures than any woman in fact or fiction, and she's enjoyed every second of it. It's time you began treating her like an equal. For a moment she was afraid she'd pushed him too far. Then his tight lips relaxed into a sheepish smile. I will if she will. Nefret laughed. I'll have a word with her. You gave her a bad fright last winter, darling. Until then, she hadn't been able to admit how much she cared for you. And now she's making up for lost time. So you agree? Yes. It's amazing, he added ingenuously. I feel the way one of those poor, overburdened donkeys must feel when the last load is lifted off his back. What have I done to deserve you? The return of Nasir with a fresh pot of coffee prevented Nefret from telling him, in considerable detail and with appropriate gestures. She pushed the toast rack toward him. We need to work out a few of the details, she admitted. Quite a few. Everything to everybody is going a bit far. Are you planning to confess all to, uh, Emmeline? She'll do the confessing, Nefret said grimly. If it takes me all morning... I'm against mentioning the arrival of the family, though. He, she, would take a chance on trying to swim the river rather than face Mother. When do you propose to break it to Mother and Father? After all his resistance, he had finally accepted the inevitable. Nefret smiled fondly at him. As soon as we can get them to ourselves, then we can decide how much to tell Cyrus, and what to do with Emmeline, and... Now what's the matter? I was picturing how they'd react. Father heading straight for the Amelia, by the first means of transport he can steal or borrow, and Mother right behind him. We could take him somewhere else, give them time to cool off before they confront him. I've had an idea. Let him go before we forced him to confess? Certainly not. Nasir loaded a tray with food for the poor sick lady. They had managed to get Margaret away, unseen and unsuspected, but it would have been impossible to account for Nefret's frequent visits to the guest room without explaining that she had a patient. Nasir had been very sympathetic. Seth Osp was at the window. He had draped a sheet round him in a fair imitation of a toga, and with his three days' growth of beard and hostile eyes, he reminded Nefret of one of the wickeder Roman emperors, Nero or Caracalla. Get back into bed, she ordered, as Ramses put the tray on the table. I never want to see another bed as long as I live. Sit down and eat your breakfast, then. She shook two tablets from the bottle of quinine and held them out. He swallowed them with a grimace. Look here, you two. This has gone far enough. Does Vandergilt know he has an ailing sister? No, Ramses admitted. So he hasn't come round to see how she's getting on? Disgraceful. You can't keep this up much longer. It's becoming too complicated. You don't know the half of it, Ramses thought. If you're thinking of leaving us, said Nefret, arms folded, you'd better reconsider. You aren't over this yet. I'm recovering nicely, thank you, Doctor. All I need is enough quinine to get me through the next few days. I can swallow pills with no help from anyone. Where? Ramses asked. A hotel? That's absurd, Nefret exclaimed. Explain it to her, Ramses. Sethos returned to his eggs and toast. It was the same scheme that had occurred to Ramses. He gave his fuming wife a reassuring nod. It's the only possible alternative. He'll need a few more days of rest and creature comforts. 
which would be hard to come by in a cave in the hills. There's safety in numbers, and a certain anonymity in the role of a tourist. And if Sethos's enemies caught up with him, it wouldn't be here. Ramses did not underestimate them. They had already managed to discover several of his hiding places, and the longer he remained, the greater the chance of discovery. His epiphany as Haji Sethos the night before would put them off for a while, but the story about Emmeline wouldn't hold up for long. He didn't want to wake up in the middle of the night to see Mubashir climbing in their window. Exactly. Sethos had been eating with the grim determination of someone performing a necessary duty. He pushed his empty plate away. If I may have the loan of a suit of your clothes, and a razor, and a few other objects designed to add verisimilitude. What hotel did you have in mind? Nefred interrupted. A new and pleasing idea had replaced her indignation. It wouldn't be the Winter Palace by any chance. It's a matter of complete indifference to me, was the cat reply. Oh, really? She got there all right, but we haven't had a chance to communicate with her since yesterday afternoon. The briefest flicker of emotion passed over Sethos's face before it resumed its habitual blandness. If you agree, we'd better get started. It'll take a while to transform me into a debonair world traveller. Quite a while. Nefret was clearly enjoying herself. You'll need our cooperation to carry this off, and you won't get it until you've told us everything we want to know. Is blackmail allowed by the Hippocratic Oath? I can't recall its being mentioned. There's no hurry, Nefret added sweetly. You can't leave today in any case. But explain it to him, Ramses. You'll probably have another attack this afternoon, Ramses said. Right, Nefret? We can't complete the necessary arrangements and get you into the hotel before that. Right, Nefret said. Start talking. It was Nefret's idea that they lunch at the Winter Palace. We ought to make certain she's all right, and she'll want to hear about him. I did promise we'd let her know, but I should think she'd have recovered from her romantic fantasies. He's behaved like a brute. Ah, oh, well, said Nefret, enigmatically. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing of importance. She adjusted her hat and straightened her skirt. There, I'm ready. The tourist ferry appeared to be suitable for their purposes. At that time of day, there were hordes of people returning to their hotels after a morning of sightseeing. If they could get their unwilling and unwanted guest to the quay, he would blend in perfectly. After that, he would be on his own. And if he didn't have sense enough to stick to the plan, it would serve him right if his enemies caught up with him. He claimed he'd told them everything he knew. Having declared himself resigned to the inevitable, he had produced a glib, but, when you got right down to it, uninformative story. The devil of it was, there was no way of checking on its accuracy. The Ramses meant to ask a few questions of a few people. One of them was not available. Said must have found a tourist to victimize, for he was not at his usual post in front of the Winter Palace. They asked at the desk for Miss Minton, and were informed that she was in the dining salon. One would have supposed from her appearance, smartly dressed, carefree and smiling, that she hadn't a worry in the world. She must have been watching the door, though, for the moment they made their appearance, she stood up and waved, motioning them to join her. At the sight of her companion, Nefret stopped short. "'What the devil is he doing here?' The head waiter gave her a startled look. Ramses took her arm. "'Control your homicidal impulses and try to act like a lady.' "'Why didn't she tell us she knew the bastard?' "'Because she had no reason to suppose we would be interested,' Ramses said. It was sometimes necessary to belabor the obvious when Nefret's indignation got the better of her. Remember that we've never been properly introduced. Smile, or at least stop grinding your teeth. Smith was on his feet when they reached the table. After asking whether they were acquainted and receiving a prompt denial from Smith, Margaret introduced them, adding, "'Algy is with the Department of Public Works in Cairo.' Mr. and Mrs. Emerson are... I have heard of them, of course, Smith said smoothly. This is indeed a pleasure. Won't you sit down? It was a table for four, and the waiter was holding a chair for Nefret. She remained standing. We wouldn't want to intrude, 
Not at all, Smith said. I was about to leave in any case. An appointment. Aren't you on holiday? Ramses asked, avoiding the use of that preposterous name. The faintly sinister commonality of Smith suited the fellow better. The appointment is with a mummy. He looked quite different from the tight-lipped, hard-eyed man they'd met in London. Instead of the stark black and white of evening dress, he wore clothing suited to the climate and his announced programme. The suit showed signs of wear, and the pith helmet he had politely removed from a chair was somewhat battered. He'd spent some time in the East. India? Mr. McKay most kindly offered to show me around the Valley of the Kings this afternoon, Smith went on. One of the pharaohs is still in his sarcophagus, I believe. Amenhotep II, Ramsay said. So, you're a friend of McKay's? Never met him. Friends in Cairo gave me letters of introduction to a number of people. He summoned the waiter and asked for his bill before continuing. I have met most of the archaeologists in Luxor. Very agreeable chaps. Nefred appeared to be studying her menu. Margaret was listening politely, but Ramses noticed she was pleating her napkin into fold after fold. How much longer are you staying in Luxor? he asked. It was the sort of casual question anyone might have asked of a stranger, but the lines in Smith's cheeks deepened. A few more days. I'm finding Luxor much more interesting than I'd expected. He took his leave of them. Nefret barely gave him time to get out of earshot before she turned on Margaret and demanded, Is that man a friend of yours? Margaret spoke at the same time. How is he? He's much better, Ramsay said. There's been no sign of trouble. What about you? Nefret subsided, looking as if she'd regretted her impulsive question, as well she might. Excessive interest in Smith might make Margaret wonder what had prompted that interest. Margaret shrugged. Except for an invitation to join you for dinner last night at the Savoy, nothing has occurred. They didn't waste any time, Ramsay said. How did they know you'd got back? My entrance was somewhat conspicuous. "'Margaret said with a wry smile. "'I had to disrobe, or should I say unrobe, in front of the doorman. "'He wasn't going to let me in, "'and I made something of a spectacle of myself, "'dashing through the lobby in my less than impeccable clothing. "'Everyone stared. "'She reached into her handbag and took out a folded piece of paper. "'You'd made me nervous,' she added accusingly. "'I made the suffragi slip the note under the door. "'Very sensible.' Ramses examined the brief message. It's not my handwriting. I wouldn't have known that. But he couldn't be sure you wouldn't. The handwriting is obviously disguised. He passed the note on to Nefret. It's written in English, Nefret said thoughtfully. Good English. What there is of it. Only one sentence without embellishment. Still, it does raise provocative ideas. I'll keep this if I may, Margaret. Congratulations on refusing the invitation. I found it insulting. How could they suppose I'd be dim enough to respond to a disingenuous attempt like that one? It was worth a try. Ramsay slipped the note into his breast pocket. They'll try again, something less obvious next time. You're the only person who knows where he went that night. Be on your guard. You ought to have stayed in your room and not come down to the dining salon. I was about to start climbing the walls, Margaret said sullenly. If I hadn't run into Algy... How long have you known him? Nefret asked. I met him ten years ago when I was in India, doing a series of articles on the Northwest Frontier problem. I didn't know he'd been posted to Egypt. Has he told you why those men were after him? The second he obviously did not refer to Smith. Margaret's dismissal of him suggested that she had no suspicion of his real role. She'd have been quick to exploit their earlier acquaintance if she had known he was involved with intelligence. Ramses didn't believe in the public works department any more than he believed Smith was on holiday. The expected letter from Nefret arrived the day of our departure. Emerson was in a fairly lively mood that morning, since Gargery had refused to give up his turn to serve breakfast and went staggering round the room, groaning, softly but persistently, until my afflicted spouse ushered him gently but firmly out of the room. 
I'd been about to do so myself. I didn't begrudge Gargery his groans or limps, but the hands smeared with green ointment did put one off a bit. Refreshed and alert, Emerson resumed his seat and asked if there was anything of interest in the post. I handed him the letter, which I had already perused, and awaited his comments. Hmm, said Emerson. What do you make of it? I asked, after a long pause. You refer, I presume, to the precipitation of sundry objects on Ramses, said Emerson, buttering another piece of toast. I don't know what to make of it, and neither do you. Nefret is still concealing something from me, I mused. I sense that very strongly. You're quite right, Emerson. Conjecture is futile until we have all the facts. How glad I am that I had already made up our minds to go to Luxor. Everything was in order. The only matter yet to be resolved was the disposition of Mohammed, who was still languishing in the garden shed. It wouldn't have been expedient or humane to leave him there during our absence, which might extend to several weeks. I could not suppose it would take longer than that to put an end to the tomb robberies, identify the individual who had taken Sethos's place, and tidy up a few other little details. Since he'd been left alone to commune with his conscience, such as it was, and his fear of punishment, I expected to find him in a receptive mood when we visited him on Tuesday morning. His first words indicated that, like all persons of low intelligence and little imagination, he had only room in his head for a single idea. You will let me go, Father of Curses? If I were in your shoes, said Emerson, I would prefer to remain in custody. Sully is dead, murdered by the man you know as the Master. Neither by word nor look did the wretched man indicate regret for his associate's demise, or fear for himself. Is it true? The father of curses does not lie, said Emerson grandly. No, let me go then. I swear I will never... Emerson cut him short with a blistering Arabic oath. Repeat, word for word, every conversation you had with Saleh regarding the... Uh, master... Word for word would have been beyond the fellow, of course. Even after insistent interrogation, Emerson succeeded in getting little more out of him than he had admitted earlier. He'd never been in the presence of the master, never seen him or heard him speak. Saleh hadn't described him. Why should he? He was the master. He has a thousand faces and ten thousand names. When we left, we were still undecided as to what to do with him. I think he was telling the truth. Emerson remarked. Saleh would not have shared his favoured position with an underling like Mohammed. Shall we let him go? We could ask Mr. Russell to take charge of him while we're in Luxor. What would be the purpose of that? All Russell has done so far is complain. We present him with a perfectly good murder and leave him to investigate it, and what has he discovered? Nothing. I see no sense at all in telling him about Xenia. I wouldn't be surprised to discover that he's already heard of it. And so it proved. Shortly thereafter, we were in receipt of an extremely stiff note from Mr. Russell, demanding our presence in his office that afternoon concerning a matter of importance. No time, said Emerson, tearing the note to shreds and tossing the scraps onto the floor. He may have news about Assad's murder, I suggested. Bah, said Emerson. And with this... I was inclined to agree. The remainder of the day was spent in rearranging everyone's luggage. Fatima had packed all her cooking utensils, Senia all her toys, and Emerson every book in his study, despite the fact, as I was careful to point out to him, that Cyrus had one of the best Egyptological libraries in the country. Just before we left for the station, while I was counting heads and bundles, Emerson slipped out. He was back almost at once, I gave him a look of inquiry, to which he responded with a shrug and a nod. He had freed Mohammed. I hoped we wouldn't live to regret it, but reminded myself of one of my favourite aphorisms, What's done is done. It required all my considerable energy and talents of organisation to get our extensive entourage and their boxes onto the train. Senia was so excited, her feet seemed hardly to touch the ground. Even Khadija could not keep hold of her, so Dawood lifted her onto his broad shoulders. William met us at the station. He had only one sadly battered suitcase. The train was late in leaving, it usually was, 
As a rule, I sleep well on trains, but Emerson's grumbles about the narrowness of the berths and an occasional howl from Horus in the next compartment with Senia and Basima kept me from repose. I finally gave it up at sunrise and wakened Emerson, who had, in his provoking fashion, succumbed to sweet slumber at about the time I realized I was wide awake and would remain so. He didn't like it. But we were all up and dressed when the train finally pulled into the station, only three hours late. I was gratified to see a large crowd assembled, though I'd expected no less. The return of the father of curses to the scene of his many triumphs was an event, an occasion, a homecoming. They were all there, Yusuf and his family, Catherine in a particularly becoming green frock, Cyrus who swept his fine Panama hat from his head when he saw us at the window. I don't see Ramses in a fret, I said to Emerson. Emerson took a tighter grip on Senia, who was bouncing up and down and waving both arms. Don't begin fretting and fussing, Peabody. They will be here. Hello, Yusuf. How fat he's become. Salam alaikum, Omar, you old villain. Faisal, Ali. Senia's shriek hurt my eardrums. Ramses, here I am, Ramses. Aren't a fret. Then I saw them making their way toward the door of our carriage, Ramses bareheaded as usual, Nefret holding his arm. Emerson caught Senia, who had squirmed away from him and was making for the door. You'd better carry her, Dawood, or she'll be trampled underfoot. Good God, what a crush! Let me help you down, Peabody. But when I put my foot on the step, I was seized, firmly and respectfully, and drawn into a hearty embrace— the heartiest and most heartfelt I'd ever received from that particular individual. I looked up into the smiling, sun-browned face of my son. "'It's good to see you, mother,' he said, and kissed me on both cheeks. A good deal of hugging and kissing went on, accompanied by the ringing of hands and slaps on the back that represent exchanges of masculine regard. Bertie hadn't accompanied the others. His mother had felt he shouldn't tire himself— Cyrus's boundless goodwill extended even to William, whom he hadn't expected, and who hung back until his former employer seized his hand and welcomed him. Naturally, I was pleased by the warmth of Ramsay's greeting. I wondered what he was up to now. It wasn't until much later in the day that I found out. Emerson and I had agreed we'd consult Ramsay's in a fret before deciding how much to tell the Vandergelds but one cannot dismiss one's host and hostess immediately upon one's arrival. We had to eat a hearty breakfast, congratulate Bertie on his improved looks, and listen to Cyrus's animated schemes for excavating. Emerson joined in with almost as much enthusiasm, and while they discussed the relative merits of Dra Abul Naga and the Valley of the Queens, Catherine told me about Jumana. I informed her that Nefret had already mentioned the girl to me, and that she sounded like a worthy candidate for further education. Catherine was quick to agree. It seemed to me that the best scheme, subject, of course, to your approval, dear Amelia, would be for you to take her back to Cairo with you. None of the schools here can teach her anything more. Cyrus and I would be delighted to bear the cost of her education. I felt sure they would be, for Catherine at least no sum would be too great if it would remove the girl from her beloved and susceptible son. "'I see no objection,' I replied. "'I would want to meet her first, of course.' "'There'll be no difficulty about that,' Catherine replied somewhat snappishly. "'She's been here almost every afternoon. "'Bertie's begun studying hieroglyphs with Mr. Barton, "'and he suggested she join the class.' "'Cyrus had overheard. "'Well now, Amelia, doesn't that make sense to you? "'A little competition spurs a student to work harder, don't you think? "'He'll have to spread himself to keep up with her.' It was clear from his appeal that he and Catherine had had words on the subject. Naturally, I agreed with Cyrus. In my opinion, there was not the slightest possibility that a serious attachment could develop. The girl was only sixteen, and once Bertie was back in the world again, he would undoubtedly find other young women to whom he was attracted. In the meantime, anything that encouraged the boy to perk up was all to the good. Only time would tell whether his interest in Egyptology would last... I sincerely hoped so. It would be just the thing for him, and would please Cyrus a great deal. 
Before I could express my views more tactfully than I've done in this private journal, Senia interrupted. Tearing her attention away from Ramsay's, she announced, I can teach Bertie hieroglyphs. He doesn't need another teacher. I'm sure you could, Bertie said, with an affectionate grin. But we didn't know you were coming, Senia. And you will be going back to Cairo before long. I'd invite you to attend the class, but I'm afraid it wouldn't be advanced enough for you. This left Senia in something of a quandary, for though she obviously agreed with Bertie's assessment of her skills, she was loath to abandon her role as mentor. While she was thinking it over, Albert announced that luncheon was served, and we had to force down more food. I'd been watching Ramses closely, and as the meal went on, I began to see signs of fidgeting, not easy to observe in an individual so controlled, but clearly perceptible to his mother. My burgeoning suspicions were strengthened when he and the fret declined Catherine's thoughtful suggestion that we four might like a little time together. You'll want to rest for a while, surely, Nefret said to me. One doesn't sleep well on a train, and you must have been frightfully busy getting ready to leave on such short notice. Who needs to rest? Emerson demanded. Cyrus and I are going to Guna to talk with Yusuf about hiring a crew. A general outcry from everyone except Cyrus and William, who hadn't ventured to express an opinion on any subject whatever, put an end to this idea. I reminded Emerson that we had yet to unpack and settle in. And, I added with a meaningful look at my son, there is still a great deal of news to be imparted. Quite, said Ramses, rising in haste. After you've had a good long rest, uh, we'll come back for tea, if we may. Supposing Emerson and I come to you, I said. I yearn to see the dear old Amelia again. Nefret's countenance was a good deal easier to read than that of Ramsay's, but she rallied quickly. Of course, what a good idea. I managed to nag and prod Emerson into leaving earlier than he had intended. Not because I hoped to catch my dear children doing something of which I would not approve. Oh, well, if I must be honest, that was exactly what I hoped. That they had some private and secret activity planned for the afternoon was manifest from their behaviour. That they counted on completing it before tea time was equally obvious. We were at least half an hour before our time, but the untroubled countenances of my children informed me that I was too late. Whatever they'd been up to, it had been accomplished. At Nefret's invitation, I made a tour of inspection, solely to renew fond memories, as I assured her. And then we returned to the saloon, which was filled with the golden light of late afternoon. Accepting a cup of tea from Nefret, I gazed about with considerable emotion. How many happy hours had I spent in that room with those I loved, engaged in amiable conversation, or upon occasion in equally pleasurable arguments with Emerson? Except for new curtains and coverings, Nefret had made few changes but I observed with some surprise that my portrait had been replaced with a copy of one of the scenes from Tetisheri's tomb. "'Did you tire of having me glare down at you from the wall?' I inquired, laughing to indicate it was just one of my little jokes. Ramses came at once to sit beside me. He put his arm round my shoulders. "'What is it?' I cried in alarm. "'Why are you doing that?' "'Because he loves you and is happy to see you,' Nefret said. "'Ramses had gone a trifle red in the face. "'Oh,' I said. "'Well, my dear boy, I'm happy to see you too.' "'We're all happy to see one another,' declared Emerson. "'Why is it necessary to say so? "'What the devil have you done with your mother's portrait, Ramses?' "'That's a rather long story,' Ramses said. "'Then I will tell mine first, I declared.' I believe you are au courant about our adventures in Cairo, except for the latest, which occurred this past Sunday. I was informed that they knew all about that, too, since Senia had treated Ramses to a highly coloured account of her adventure. I had asked her not to speak of it for fear of worrying Bertie, thinking that that admonition would prevent premature disclosure to all parties. Nor had she. She had only told Ramses during a brief interlude when she had got him off by himself. I allowed Emerson to relate the results of our investigation while I indulged in a few cucumber sandwiches. He called himself the master, Ramses said in an odd, flat voice. 
Apparently that is the case, said Emerson, in the same sort of voice. His eyes locked with those of Ramsay's. I have never believed that complex messages can be exchanged by means of glances, except in the case of Emerson and myself. But Ramsay's pensive face broke into a smile. It's all right, father. He's got a perfect alibi. It would be impossible to convey in a few sentences the effect of that simple statement or the incoherence of the succeeding exchange. As Ramses later admitted, he had been racking his brains to think of a tactful means of breaking the news. I can't say that it came as a complete surprise. Naturally, the possibility had already occurred to me. What hurt most of all was not the duplicity of my children, but that of Emerson. You knew, I cried in poignant reproach. You've known from the first. Emerson, how could you have kept it from me? Emerson began. General Maxwell swore you to secrecy. Such oaths do not, should not, cannot apply to the relations between husband and wife. My attempt to put him on the defensive did not succeed, I am happy to say. I don't care for meekness in a husband, and Emerson is particularly handsome when he's in a rage. His cheeks turned a becoming shade of brick red, and the cleft in his chin vibrated. Be damned to that, he said hotly. His survival was a military secret, and furthermore, Amelia, it was none of your confounded business. I was about to reply, in equally heated terms, when Ramses cleared his throat. Forgive me for interrupting, but that is beside the point now. You haven't heard the worst of it. We need your advice. The reminder was well timed. I hadn't finished with Emerson by any means, but that discussion was best conducted in private. And when I heard the worst of it, I could only agree that a council of war was badly needed. It had obviously come as a considerable relief to Emerson to learn that Sethos could not have been the man behind Senia's abduction. I would never have believed him capable of such a thing, but evidently I had greater faith in Emerson's brother than he did. The knowledge that Sethos had resumed his criminal activities was disappointing, but not wholly unexpected. The news that he was threatened by a ruthless new competitor aroused some concern, but was of interest primarily because it explained much that had been a mystery thus far. "'The attacks on us in Cairo were meant to keep us there "'and induce Ramses to return,' I said. "'You remember, Emerson, that I remarked upon how ineffectual they were?' "'We both remarked upon that,' said Emerson, with a sour look at me. "'I had begun to suspect, as had I, my dear. "'Poor Mr. Assad's death was the only real tragedy. "'And now we know why the body was brought to us.' The killer obviously expected that when Ramses heard of it, he would come rushing back to Cairo in order to wreak revenge and defend us from danger. We had settled ourselves comfortably by then, Emerson smoking his pipe and Nefret curled up on the settee next to him. I smiled pleasantly at my son, who began to protest. No, mother, you would have, you know. That is why I tried to keep the facts from you. But, I went on quickly... I was wrong to do so. We were also wrong to divide our forces. Now that we are together again and in perfect confidence with one another, I do not doubt we can deal expeditiously with the remaining difficulties. Emerson opened his mouth, but his expression warned me that I'd better go on talking. I presume that before you removed your uh, guest, you persuaded him to confide in you? Precisely what I was about to say, Emerson grunted. What is it thereafter? A new tomb, I suppose. It must be located in some relatively populous area, or this fellow wouldn't be so determined to get you out of the way. Surely not the East Valley? Well reasoned, Father, Ramsay said. We'd arrived at the same conclusion. It can't be anything but a tomb, and if the site were remote, they could clear it without fear of interruption. This fellow... What do you call him? I asked. Ramsay's looked blank. We don't call him anything, Mother. We don't know who he is. "'References to him would be simpler if we gave him a nom de guerre,' I explained. Nefret chuckled. "'Quite right. Would you consider X too trite? "'We ought to be able to come up with something more inventive. "'One of the more unpleasant pharaohs, perhaps. "'Or El Hakim, the cruelest and most fanatical ruler of the Fatimite dynasty.' 
It's just like you, Amelia, to waste time on something so trivial, Emerson exclaimed. Where is the damned tomb? The sooner we get at it and clear it... That's just the trouble, Nefret said. Sethos claimed he doesn't know. Emerson jumped to his feet. He lied. Just give me ten minutes with the bust with him. I think he was speaking the truth, father, Ramsay said, glancing at his wife. If you'll allow me to continue, I'll tell you what he said. Sethos had admitted that when he returned to Egypt in September, it was with every intention of resuming his former business activities. He hadn't been in communication with his old associates for several years, so he was surprised to learn from one of them that they'd been expecting to hear from him since the previous spring. All the Cairo underworld knew that the master had returned. One of the most notorious, a man named Mubashir, had boasted of having spoken with him. It was apparent that someone had taken advantage of his formidable reputation and habit of anonymity for reasons which were not difficult to deduce. He was reluctant to approach Mubashir directly, so he decided to throw down the gauntlet, so to speak, by carrying out several thefts, including the robbery of Legrand's storage magazines and the removal of the statue of Ramses II. This had the desired effect of informing the impostor that a rival had appeared on the scene. It had the unfortunate effect of inspiring the impostor to violent attempts to remove the said rival. One could almost feel sorry for the bewildered criminals of Luxor. It didn't take them long to realize there was not one master, but two, since each of them was attempting to identify the other, and claiming to be the true and original master criminal. Some had spoken with Sethos, some with the impostor, and they had no way of knowing which of the two was genuine. Recruitment suffered. The more cautious of the fellows refused to have anything to do with either. It is still a mystery to me why, if this whatever hopes to become the new head of the illegal antiquities game, he hasn't stolen anything, Emerson said. Apparently, Sethos was responsible for the thefts of which we heard. Nothing of interest has come on the market recently. Why hasn't he begun removing smaller objects from the tomb, as the Abed er Rasuls did at Deir el Bahri? That is how the authorities caught up with the Rasuls, Ramses pointed out. This fellow has probably learned from their mistake. If he can make a clean sweep of the place over a period of only a few days, he can be well away from here before the objects appear on the market and leave no trail the police could follow. But at this point, the very existence of such a tomb is pure conjecture. Sethos arrived at the same conclusions we did, on the basis of the same clues, or so he claims. If there is such a place, its location is known only to its discoverer. He'll need assistance when he removes the contents, but it's only common sense to confide in no one until that day comes. Hmm, <laughs> said Emerson, round the stem of his pipe. A hail from Ashraf, standing guard at the gangplank, made me realize how much time had passed. There is Cyrus's carriage come for us, I said. We mustn't keep him waiting. Emerson, put your coat on. Ramses, are you ready, my dear? Nefret ran off to get a wrap, and while the men collected their scattered garments, I considered Sethos's story. It made perfectly good sense, but then I would have expected nothing less from my old adversary and present brother-in-law. Believing him dead, I had not had sufficient opportunity to adjust to that relationship. It would take some doing. The thought of seeing him again, as I meant to do next day, induced confused emotions— Memories of long years of aggravation and impertinent advances. Equally strong memories of his noble sacrifices for us and for his country. Apparently, the latter sacrifice had been only a temporary arrangement. Mentally, I added a new task to the list I had composed. Sethos would have to be reformed and made to remain reformed. He could not be allowed to return to his old ways. There was one other little matter that was of equal importance, and I brought it up after we were on our way to the castle. It shouldn't be difficult to identify El Hakim. He is an archaeologist, not an Egyptian, and since there are only a few remaining in Luxor... Curse it, Amelia! There you go again, Emerson shouted, stating as fact what is as yet only an unproved theory. 
I knew why he was in such an acrimonious frame of mind, so I replied calmly, All the evidence points to that conclusion, my dear. This fellow would not be able to masquerade successfully as the master had he not many of the latter's skills and attributes, including his ruthlessness. He has committed three murders. And tried to commit a fourth, said Nefret. Yes. I turned to Ramses, who immediately assumed an expression of wary expectation. I am not going to criticize you, my dear, I assured him. I understand why you felt it necessary to divert attention from the presence of a guest aboard the Amelia. But speaking of that, Nefret said quickly, we've been unable to think how to break it to Cyrus that he has an ailing sister. Oh, dear, I murmured. He's bound to hear of it sooner or later, I suppose. We were counting on you, mother, said my son, to come up with a convincing explanation. Lie, you mean, grunted Emerson. That is your forte, Peabody. Well? Not now, Emerson. We have arrived. Just leave it to me. I was guilty of a slight amount of hubris when I implied that I had, on the spur of the moment, invented an explanation for a particularly inexplicable situation. However, I am accustomed to having such tasks thrust upon me, and I did not doubt that, given sufficient time, a solution would come to me. Unfortunately, I was not given any time at all. Cyrus was waiting at the door to greet us, as was his hospitable habit. Hospitality was not his only aim, however. As the others passed on into the drawing-room, he drew me aside. All right, Amelia, what's going on? Hoping he did not mean what I feared he meant, I attempted to equivocate. I beg your pardon, Cyrus. How is... Emmeline. A grin spread across his lined countenance as he waited for an answer. None was immediately forthcoming. I defy any reader to produce one. Selim was kind enough to ask after her, Cyrus went on. He had heard from his uncle Yusuf, who had heard from Jamil, who had heard from your steward about my poor sister. Sure came as a surprise to me that I had one. What did you say to Selim? I asked, still sparring for time. Why, I thanked him for his interest. Who is the lady? Bless you, Cyrus. It is a somewhat uh, complicated story. I'll explain it to you later. Catherine will be wondering what's keeping us, and Emerson... Tonight, Cyrus said firmly. Yes, of course. Tonight. I hope I may not be accused of braggadocio when I say that by the time we joined the others, I had arrived at the obvious solution. Having cleared my mind of that matter, I was able to concentrate on my suspects. We were quite a large party in ourselves, but Cyrus enjoyed nothing more than seeing every seat at his dining table occupied. He had only managed to collect two other guests that evening. Mr. Barton, who'd been persuaded without difficulty to stay to dine after giving Bertie his lesson in hieroglyphs, and Mr. McKay, whom Cyrus had caught on his way home from the valley. Owing to the impromptu nature of the gathering and Emerson's well-known aversion to evening dress, attire was casual, and so was conversation. Emerson did most of the talking, so I was able to study my suspects, three of them, including William. I was acquainted with McKay, but I hadn't met Mr. Barton. The poor lad was not prepossessing. His features were rough-hewn and his movements awkward. Some of the awkwardness might have been occasioned by the fact that he never took his eyes off Nefret, which rendered the neat consumption of food and drink difficult. Sentimentality and youth were irrelevant, of course. I had known a number of criminals with those characteristics. His relative lack of experience in the field might suggest that he was unlikely to have discovered a new tomb, but such discoveries are often serendipitous. It was safe to assume that he was familiar with the name and career of Sethos. That gentleman's exploits, along with our own, had become part of the legendary of Egyptology. Mr. Barton appeared to have a solid alibi for at least one incident. He had been with Nefret and Ramses when the body fell from the cliff, so it could not have been he who pushed it off. 
However, I was not prepared to accept unquestioningly Ramsay's belief that the man had been deliberately murdered. I respect my son's acumen, but he is sometimes mistaken. In fact, I could think of no sensible reason why anyone, Bedouin, Senussi, Turk, or tomb robber, would drop a rock and then a body on Ramsay's. It could not have anything to do with the matter of the missing tomb. It must have been an accident, and therefore Mr. Barton was still a suspect. I transferred my attention to Mr. McKay, who was talking to Cyrus about the Valley of the Kings. He'd been in Egypt longer than Barton, and was reputed to know every square foot of the valley. If the tomb was there, he was the most likely person to have come upon it. The other considerations I have mentioned applied equally well to him. I knew nothing to his discredit. Indeed, his reputation was of the best, but even the most honest scholar might be seduced by a discovery as rich as this one could be. William Amherst, shy, harmless William, had been in Cairo when the attacks on us took place. To be sure, he hadn't been in Luxor when Sethos and Ramses were attacked. The reverse was true of the others. But was it? I would have to find out. Another possibility was that there were two people involved, one in Luxor, one in Cairo. The more I thought about that, the more likely it seemed. William had come to us seeking a position on our staff after Ramses left for Luxor. He'd been in Egypt for many years and had worked with Cyrus in the valley and at other sites. His career had not been particularly successful. His self-confidence had been eroded and his means were limited. He admitted to having been in Luxor, among other places, the previous year. Was his seemingly candid admission of moral collapse following his alleged attempt to enlist a way of concealing his true activities? William began to squirm and look nervously at me, so I turned to Bertie, who was on my left, and asked him how he was getting on with his studies. The conversation had already taken an archaeological turn. Poor Catherine was the only one present who had not a consuming interest in the subject. But she had become accustomed to enduring such discussions with a courteous appearance of interest, and she was anxious to encourage Bertie. I joined in at appropriate intervals, but never believe, reader, that I had lost sight of what must be, for a time, my primary consideration. Deduction alone might lead us to discovering the identity of our unknown opponent, but if we could induce him to seek us out, it would save time and trouble. I was considering ways of doing this when a chance question from Mr. McKay gave me the opportunity. It was only a courteous inquiry as to how long we meant to remain in Luxor, but I immediately took advantage, catching Emerson with his mouth open. We are giving serious thought to spending the rest of the winter in Luxor. We've almost finished the task with which Herr Juncker was good enough to entrust us, so there is nothing more for us to do at Giza, and Emerson believes that a detailed survey of the Luxor sites would prove useful. Emerson closed his mouth with an audible click of teeth. Cyrus expressed his delight and approval, and Mr. McKay frowned. Not that you haven't done your best, I added graciously, but it is too large a task for one man. The young fellow's troubled brow cleared. Candidly, Mrs. Emerson, it would be a great relief to me. For some time I've been torn between my duty to my profession and my duty to my country. Were you and your family here, I could leave with a clear conscience. He sounded sincere. Was he? Ramses had spoken very little. Observing his enigmatic look at McKay, I realised his thoughts had been running along the same lines as mine. McKay and Barton did not linger over coffee, and both declined a postprandial libation. Their working day began at dawn. Soon thereafter, Catherine took Bertie up to bed, and Cyrus suggested she retire as well. I was about to administer a tactful hint to William when he murmured something about being tired from the trip and effaced himself. They were scarcely out of the room when all eyes focused on me. Some in hopeful inquiry, some, Cyrus's, in stern expectation. You aren't going to wiggle out of it this time, Amelia, he remarked. 
I'll sit here all night if I have to. So you've heard, Emerson said resignedly. About Emmeline? Yep. Now, I've kept mum, folks. Didn't deny or admit anything. Seems to me I'm entitled to hear the whole story. Who is the mysterious lady? That is no lady, I said, unable to resist a touch of humor. That is the master criminal. Cyrus's jaw dropped, and Emerson let out a strangled oath. Nefret's face rounded in a smile. Ramsay said nothing. "'Now, Emerson, don't roar,' I said. "'I realized immediately that we have no choice but to confide wholly in Cyrus. "'Why should we not? "'He's been our staunchest ally and dearest friend.' "'Cyrus let out a choked gurgle and cleared his throat. "'Thank you, Amelia. "'I, um... "'I thought I was used to your shenanigans, "'but you knocked the breath clean out of me with that one. "'Why are you folks sheltering your worst enemy?' Or are you holding him prisoner? Why? Holy gee, Osaphat, I thought the fellow was dead. Ramses would explain, I said. Ramses started violently and so forgot himself as to scowl at me. It seemed to me only fair that since he and Nefret had initiated the deception, they should render the necessary explanations. But I gave him a brief breathing space by remarking, Cyrus, I believe that instead of brandy... I'd like a whiskey and soda, if you'd be so good. Ramses then launched into his narrative, to which I listened with as much interest as Cyrus, since I was curious to know how Ramses was going to avoid certain matters which could not be divulged even to Cyrus, namely, and to wit, Sethos's relationship to Emerson, which was a private family matter, and the former's career as a secret agent, which was a private government matter. I must say that, after a somewhat faltering start, Ramses did credit to my training. His mention of a lost tomb fascinated Cyrus to such an extent that his critical faculties were dulled, and our friend readily accepted Ramses' explanation that he had come to Sethos's aid because he was, in a sense, the lesser of two evils. His rival is completely ruthless, a killer, Ramses said. And I'm sure I need not remind you of the numerous occasions upon which Sethos risked his life to protect the lady he loves devotedly. He proceeded to remind them of those occasions, at unnecessary length, and in a prose style that was reminiscent of Miss Minton's more romantic passages. Oh, well, I thought, as Emerson chewed fiercely on the stem of his pipe and my son pretended to look apologetic, I suppose I had it coming. I did not doubt that Ramses enjoyed getting back at me for putting him on the spot. Our relationship was developing in quite an interesting fashion. Ramses was able to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about Miss Minton's involvement, which explained to everyone's satisfaction how Sethos had ended up at the Amelia. He ended with an apology for involving Cyrus, which the latter, now bright-eyed as an adventurous boy, brushed aside. I understand. Had to keep those thugs away from the Amelia and your lady. Getting them off the boat was a good idea, too, but you better make sure the word spreads that you no longer have a guest. How about if I tell the world that poor old Emmeline's decided she wants nothing more to do with this unsanitary, sickly country? Packed her traps and gone off in a huff. I could take you to the train tomorrow, Amelia. Bid you a brotherly farewell. You can get off at Hamadi and catch the next train back. Well, what's so funny, Nefret? <laughs> you? Nefret sputtered. We ought to have taken you into our confidence from the start. You're almost as good at invention as Mother. Quite, said Ramses, giving Cyrus a look of alarm. It won't wash, Cyrus. We can't prove Emmeline was ever here at the castle, because she wasn't. All we can do is add another lie to the rest and say she's gone and the sooner the better. I'll tell Nasir and Ashraf tomorrow, and if they wonder how the bloody hell... Excuse me, how we got her away unseen, they can speculate to their heart's content. Cyrus was obviously disappointed. Well, if you say so. Now, how are we going to go about finding that Galdern royal tomb? 
A thump and a click brought us all to our feet. It sounded as if someone had slammed a door which had been slightly ajar. Yet I had made certain both doors to the sitting room were tightly closed before I began to speak. Emerson dashed toward one door, and Ramsay's, whose hearing was slightly more acute, for the other. He flung the panel wide, and there, blinking and emitting little bleats of alarm, was William Amherst. Chapter 15 William stuttered out a series of incoherent phrases. Couldn't sleep. Came down to get a book from the library. Fell against the door. Frightfully sorry. He was holding a book, and he was attired in pyjamas and dressing gown, but no sensible conspirator would neglect such obvious precautions. We didn't bother asking whether he'd overheard all or part of our conversation, since he wouldn't have told the truth anyhow. It might have been only idle curiosity that had prompted him to ease the door open, or someone else might have opened it before he came along. Cyrus was loath to admit that his former protégé could be guilty of wrongdoing. He sure has changed, though. He used to be a swell young fellow who'd look you straight in the eye. He's a different man. Hmm, I said. No. Emerson's shout rattled the crystal. No, Amelia. We already have two experts in disguise in this group. I refuse to admit even the slightest possibility of a third. We did not linger long after that. I persuaded Cyrus that since Sethos's murderous rival was, presumably, the only one who knew the location of the hypothetical tomb, our first priority should be identifying him, which would have the additional advantage of preventing further violence. I also felt obliged to scold Cyrus a little for his own good. There is absolutely no reason to suppose that the tomb is that of a royal personage, Cyrus. I know that it has been your greatest ambition to find such a tomb, but the greater your expectations, the greater will be your disappointment should those expectations fail to materialize. Let imagination flourish freely, my friend, but do not pin your hopes. You've made your point, Amelia, said Emerson. I hope that you will take it to heart. I rose before my spouse, as I usually do, filled with ambition and energy. I had believed, before we arrived in Luxor, that life had become somewhat complicated. Little had I known... Stimulated though I was by the tasks that awaited me, I admitted the necessity of organizing them in order of priority and feasibility. I therefore slipped out of bed without wakening Emerson, assumed a dressing gown, and went into the sitting room that adjoined our bedchamber. We had, of course, been given Cyrus's best suite of rooms. They were even more elegant and comfortable than when I had stayed in them before. The same fine oriental rugs covered the floors, and the light of early morning filtered through the beautifully carved mushrabia screens that covered the windows. Catherine's thoughtful hand was visible in the new draperies, the luxurious appointments of the adjoining bath chamber, and the nice little desk in the sitting room. Nothing had been overlooked. Note paper and envelopes, writing materials and blotting paper. I settled myself into the comfortable chair and drew a sheet of paper toward me. Interview the other archaeological suspects was the first item of business. Despite Emerson's jeers, I felt certain that I'd been right in believing that the man behind the mystery was an Egyptologist. I was acquainted with all of them, but never before had I had occasion to study them as possible murderers and criminals. I wanted to interview the ones who hadn't been present the previous evening. Under this heading, I added, alibis. I doubted anything would come of this. It is only in fiction that detectives are able to extract verifiable statements from their suspects. Memories are faulty, and witnesses, particularly to nocturnal activities, are often lacking. Still, it was worth a try, and a timetable of attacks might be useful. I wrote this phrase under alibis. Find the tomb was my second heading. 
Two methods of inquiry suggested themselves, aside from the obvious one of catching the villain and forcing him to confess. Yusuf and the other members of the family in Gurna might know something. I did not suppose they would deliberately conceal information, but they might consider it unimportant. Emerson and Selim were the best persons to ask such questions. The other line of inquiry was to search for the place ourselves. This was not such a hopeless endeavour as it might sound, since logical analysis had limited the number of likely areas, and the villain might have left signs of his presence that would be visible to expert eyes like ours. A further advantage to this procedure was that if we came anywhere near the actual location, it might inspire our adversary to attack us. I had got this far when I heard a rustle of bed linen and a querulous oath from the adjoining room, and Emerson abruptly appeared in the open doorway. So there you are, he exclaimed. Where did you think I would be? With you, one never knows. Emerson leaned against the doorframe and rubbed his eyes. He is not at his best in the morning, physically or mentally, but even his present state of dishevelment, hair tousled, eyes half-closed, chin bristling, did not detract from his splendid looks. Since we were not in the comfort of our own home, he had agreed to wear a minimal amount of sleeping attire, pyjama trousers, to be precise, which exposed to my fond eyes the admirable musculature of his chest and shoulders. I was a trifle out of temper with him, however. My attempts the previous night to carry on a conversation had failed. All he would do was grunt. Since you're awake, I'll ring for tea, I said. I could do with a cup. I've been working for over half an hour. Emerson stumbled across the room and leaned over my shoulder. Another of your confounded lists, he said disagreeably. Find the tomb. Good God, you make it sound as simple as scrubbing a floor or... But at that point, the sitting room door opened. The service at the castle was always first rate. And Emerson retreated, mumbling irritably. Your dressing gown is in the wardrobe, I called after him. He was wearing it when he returned, and his expression was a trifle less forbidding. I hate it when you creep away like that, he said. When I reach out for you and you aren't there, drink your tea, I said. That might have been meant as an apology, but it had sounded more like criticism. A cup of the genial beverage, heavily loaded with sugar, restored Emerson. Reaching out a long arm, he took my list from the writing desk and studied it. I don't see any mention of your favourite method of identifying an enemy, he remarked. Something along the lines of wait to be attacked, or instigate an attack, or... I've already taken care of that, I replied. Hmm, yes. Your announcement last evening that we intended to remain in Loxall for the rest of the winter. Really, Amelia, I wish you would warn me of these little schemes of yours. If I were not so accustomed to your methods, I might have blurted out a denial... You do realise, I hope, that your entire theory and methodology are based on pure surmise? We don't know that there is a tomb. We don't know that the discoverer is an Egyptologist. We don't know why, assuming that the first two premises are correct, he has refrained from removing the artefacts. He may, note the word may, have attempted to keep us from coming here. But now that we are here, he may simply wait until we leave, however long it takes... He doesn't appear to be in any particular hurry. Anything is possible, my dear. However, he went to considerable lengths to induce us to remain in Cairo, and he is now aware that Sethos is also after his treasure. Were I in his position... Yes, yes, I know what you would do, Emerson muttered. Speaking of my... of Sethos, I don't see his name on your list. I expected your first move would be to head for the Winter Palace. The idea had, of course, passed through my mind, but greatly as I yearned to come face to face with the remarkable individual who had returned again from the dead, I knew that we must avoid drawing undue attention to the hotel. It was well known in Luxor that Emerson never went to such places if he could get out of it, and our appearance at an early hour would be so unusual as to arouse curiosity. I explained this to Emerson. 
I will pen a brief missive to Miss Minton, asking her to join us for luncheon at two. Ah, yes, Miss Minton, said Emerson thoughtfully. You haven't put her on your list either. I hadn't finished the list. Rest assured, I'm well aware that we owe her a debt of gratitude for rescuing your... Uh, Sethos. I have it all worked out. Now hurry and dress, Emerson. We must get an early start. When we went down to breakfast, we found the Vandergelts already at table. I had expected Cyrus would be raring to go, as he quaintly expressed it. But I was somewhat surprised to see Bertie also dressed for riding. On second thought, I was not surprised. Our appearance had interrupted a rather brisk discussion between mother and son. Catherine turned to me in appeal. I have been trying to dissuade Bertie from going, Amelia. He isn't fit enough yet. Rapidly, I considered what advice I ought to give. Bertie's presence would inhibit our conversation to some extent, since we had agreed that for the time being at least, Catherine should be spared the knowledge that we were involved with not one but two groups of criminals. She had seen the advantages of Egyptology as a profession for Bertie, but she would most probably consider that a distinct disadvantage. The young man was too well-bred to say more than, I assure you, mother, I am up to it. But his mutinous expression made it clear he meant to have his way. So I patted her hand and reassured her. We'll only be out for a few hours, Catherine, and in the coolest part of the day. The fret and I will make sure he doesn't overdo. Quite right, said Emerson, pausing in his brisk intake of nourishment. You can't keep the lad wrapped in cotton wool forever, Catherine. Let him have his head. We will look after him. Having mixed his metaphors and thoroughly vexed his hostess, he returned to his eggs and toast with the complacent air of a man who has been the soul of tact. Unconvinced but outvoted, Catherine said no more. We had arranged the night before that Nefret and Ramses should meet us at the castle. When they turned up, they were accompanied by two youthful Egyptians, whom I had no difficulty in identifying as Jumana and her brother. Dowd's description of the girl had not done her justice. What made her remarkable was not only her pretty face, but the vivacity that animated every feature. Her brother bore a strong resemblance to her, but that morning his handsome face was disfigured by a swelling that had almost closed one of his eyes. As soon as we set off, Jumana attached herself to Emerson, so I joined Bertie, whose attempt to ride beside her she had coolly ignored. His eyes fixed on the slim little figure of the girl, who was gesticulating so vigorously she appeared to be in danger of falling off the horse, he did not respond to my innocuous, if pointless, remark that it was a fine morning. I nudged him gently with my parasol. "'I beg your pardon,' he said, starting. "'Well?' Nefret had joined us. "'What do you think of her?' "'I haven't had time to formulate an opinion,' I replied. "'If she is as intelligent as she is enthusiastic, "'she is also a conniving little minx,' said Nefret with a smile. "'You see how she is making up to father. "'Before you got here, Ramses was the object of her attentions.' "'Oh, I say,' Bertie exclaimed. "'She's not a... she's not like that. "'Really, she's not.' Her interest is purely professional, Nefret explained. She's a Muslim female. She assumes that the men in the family make the decisions, and she's dead set on becoming an Egyptologist. Bertie's ingenuous face brightened. Well, so am I. He drew himself up, straightened his shoulders, and looked about with an air of great interest. Cyrus mentioned we were going to Dera Bahri. That's Queen Hatshepsut, isn't it? "'Very good,' I commended, and launched into a little lecture on the career of that illustrious woman. Nefret, who of course knew all about it, fell back to where she had wanted to be all along. With Ramses, that is. The Queen's Mortuary Temple was one of the favoured sites on the West Bank, and one of the most conspicuous.' 
As we approached, I explained the architectural features to Bertie and attempted to conjure up a picture of how it must have looked in Hatshepsut's time. With flowering trees lining the causeway and huge statues adorning the columned terraces. He was listening attentively and had asked several intelligent questions when Emerson took it upon himself to interrupt. Don't let her give you too much at one time, he advised. She'll drown you in facts if you allow it. Bertie insisted that he enjoyed every word. But Emerson obviously wanted a private conversation with me. He suggested that Bertie join Jumana, which pleased everyone except possibly Jumana. Find the tomb, said Emerson in a low growl. Rather a formidable task, isn't it? Even for you. His gesture took in the long curve of the cliffs that enclosed Hatshepsut's temple and the ruins of the one next to it. Even in that limited area, there were a hundred possible hiding places. It fit one of our criteria, however. It was certainly public enough. There were not as many tourists as there had been in past years, but they were all over the place, in clumps and pairs. The second member of the pair being, in all cases, a dragoman or guide. It required force majeure to be left alone. Ah, well, we can only do our best, I replied. No one can succeed unless he tries. Life, one more aphorism, particularly one beginning life, and I will divorce you, Peabody, said Emerson. But he smiled as he said it. It's not going to be easy exploring with this entourage trailing us. What the devil are we looking for, anyhow? A signpost labelled this way to the lost tomb? I always allow Emerson his little touches of sarcasm, which give him the illusion that he is being witty. Smiling back at him, I said, We are supposed to be looking for a sight, Cyrus. That provides us with a reasonable excuse to go anywhere we like. We can't allow Bertie to clamber about the cliffs, though. Leave it to me. I always do, said Emerson. Jumana had left Bertie and was trotting briskly towards us. I told Emerson to go on and summon the girl to my side. We had a little chat. I do not believe in beating about the bush, particularly with young persons. Subtle hints pass right over their heads, and this young person appeared to be even more determined and self-centered than most. I reminded her that Cyrus was extremely wealthy, dedicated to archaeology, and devoted to his stepson, and added, I want you to stay with Bertie today, and on future occasions, while the rest of us engage in activities that would be too strenuous for him. "'Ah,' said Jumana, her smooth brow wrinkling as she thought it over. "'It did not take her long to catch my drift. "'If I do that, you and Mr. Van der Gelt will like me very much?' "'I assured her that we would. "'At least she hadn't demanded a direct quid pro quo. "'Leaving her and Bertie to stroll slowly about, "'we set off in a southerly direction, "'trailed by Jamil, who was carrying the water bottles.' He fell farther and farther behind as we followed the steep path toward the base of the cliffs. "'He is certainly a reluctant assistant,' I remarked to Ramses. "'How did he get those bruises?' "'According to Jumana, he got into a fight at one of the Luxor coffee shops. "'In her opinion, she has a good many opinions,' Ramses interpolated with a sidelong glance at me." He spends too much time in such places, with companions who are of questionable reputation. He is the apple of Yusuf's eye, though, and the old rascal refuses to discipline him. Watch where you step. It's rather rough going here. He caught hold of my arm. I could have recovered from my stumble without assistance, but I thanked him and explained, I am quite familiar with the terrain, my dear. I was scanning the cliffs for two entrances. They, the cliffs, not the entrances, hung over us. Countless years of weathering by wind and water had shaped the stone into bizarre formations, some roughly columnar, some reminiscent of molten stone that had flowed over the top and then hardened. I did not need Emerson or Ramses to tell me that looking for an opening in that broken surface was almost certainly futile. Ramses felt obliged to tell me, though. "'One never knows,' I replied. 
Your father must believe there is some purpose in this expedition. Has he confided in you? No. However, I think he wants to have a look at the place Kuwentz showed us. Where someone dropped various objects on you? Hmm. I'd forgotten to put that on my list. Wait just a minute. I removed the list from my pocket and opened the pencil case attached to my belt, while Ramses watched with unconcealed amusement. Why don't you join Cyrus and rest for a bit? he suggested. Emerson and Nefret had forged ahead, leaving Cyrus seated on the ground with his back against a boulder. When we came up to him, he was mopping his flushed, sweating face with a handkerchief. Are you all right, Cyrus? I asked. Never been happier, said Cyrus, between wheezes. Take me a day or two to get back in shape. I told Ramses to go on and beckoned at Jamil. After handing each of us a water bottle, he seated himself on the ground a little distance away. You don't appear to be enjoying yourself, Jamil, I remarked. Jamil shrugged. This is not work for a man, Sitakim. What kind of work would you like to do? Another shrug. You must have some idea, I persisted. Some of your cousins and your uncles work for us. They earn good money and are respected. A slight curl of the boy's lip indicated his view of that idea. If archaeology does not interest you, there are other worthwhile careers, I went on. Cook, police officer. Waiter, house servant, said Cyrus, whose Arabic was good enough to enable him to follow the conversation. His opportunities are limited, my dear. It isn't right or just, but that's the way the world is. Ambition can o'erleap limitations, I said. Look at David, and at Selim, and Abdullah, for that matter. Jamil did not respond, even with a curl of the lip. So I poked him with my parasol to get his attention and went on in Arabic. You come from an honored family, Jamil. You too can be honored and respected if you work hard and study. There are those who will gladly help. Yes, Sitakim. His smile would have been as charming as his sister's, if it had had her warmth. I am surprised to find such lack of ambition in a member of that family, I remarked, as we continued on our way. Perhaps my kindly little lecture will have some effect. He appeared to take it to heart. Huh, said Cyrus. You'd better concentrate on Jemana. She's got enough ambition for both of them. It wasn't long before we caught the others up. They'd found the place without difficulty. The body had been removed by predators or the police, probably the latter, since there were no indigestible bits scattered about. Has the fellow been identified? I inquired. I asked to be notified should that occur, Ramses replied. But I don't expect they will go to much trouble, unless someone reports a son or a husband missing. He was a poor man, worn cheap garments, not even a pair of sandals. Emerson looked up. Confound it, Ramses, there must be something there, or the fellow wouldn't have attempted to prevent you from finding it. Kuhn's must have been mistaken about the location. I didn't see any sign of an opening. And anyhow, he says the place contained nothing of interest. Hmm, said Emerson, fingering his chin. I need to have a talk with Kuhn's. And off he went, with his long stride. Emerson, come back here, I shouted. You can't walk all the way to Deir el Medina. He could have and would have had I not prevented him. I was also forced to forbid him to climb the cliff in search of Mr. Cowens's purported tomb. In my opinion, it would have been both dangerous and unproductive, and we had to return in time to keep our luncheon engagement. The going was easier on the way back, since it was downhill most of the way, but by the time we had collected Bertie and Jumana, both of whom looked very pleased with themselves, for I sincerely hoped different reasons, we decided that Emerson and I would go to the Amelia with the children and freshen up a bit there before proceeding to our appointment. Cyrus's face fell. The arrangement left him no choice but to escort Bertie back to the castle. I had never intended to take him along anyhow, I had a number of things to say to my brother-in-law that could not be said in Cyrus's presence. 
The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. As they got ready for their visit to the Winter Palace, Ramsay's nerves began to twitch. The interview with Sethos promised to be awkward, if not actually explosive, and he was worried about Margaret. Smith's presence added another disturbing element. He wondered if his mother had him on her list and what she had written under what to do about it. She was the coolest of them all, inspecting them to make certain they were tidy enough to meet her standards and giving Emerson's dusty coat an extra brushing. Ramsay's half expected her to demand he hold out his hands, as she had done when he was a child. When they were in the dinghy and underway, she whipped out her list, and Emerson, who'd been scowling and rubbing his chin, snarled, "'Did you overlook something, Amelia? Reform Sethos, for example? I see you have your parasol, but shh!' She indicated the boatman. "'Leave it to me, Emerson.' "'Curse it,' said Emerson." Ramses, I presume you know what he looks like. At the moment, I mean. He was wearing Ramses' clothes, Nefret said. The brown and grey tweed he bought in London last summer. Ramses also supplied him with a moustache and a sunburn. In return, he supplied us with the name under which he intended to register. She put her hand over Emerson's clenched fist. Father, promise you won't start shouting at him. And mother, you won't be rude to Margaret, will you? Both of them looked at her in shocked surprise. "'I am never rude,' said his mother stiffly. "'I never shout,' his father shouted. For once, Emerson did not linger in front of the hotel, exchanging witticisms with dragomen, beggars and vendors. He marched straight to the reception desk, where he was greeted effusively by the assistant manager. "'Welcome back to Luxor, Professor and Mrs. Emerson. "'We heard of your arrival and were hoping you would honour us with a visit. "'Are you lunching? I will have a table prepared.' "'Yes, very good,' said Emerson. "'You have a guest who registered yesterday, a Mr... Um, "'The Honourable Edmund Whitbread,' Ramsay supplied. "'Oh, um, Honourable, of course,' Emerson muttered. "'What's his room number?' The gentleman left us this morning. He was on his way to Aswan, I believe. Oh, dear, I'm very sorry, Professor. You appear a trifle uh, put out. Had he expected you to call? Evidently, said Emerson, in a choked voice. He said he would be back in a few days. He asked us to keep his room for him. Key, said Emerson, holding out his hand. It was strictly against the rules, but the fellow didn't even hesitate before he produced the key. How does he do it, Ramses wondered enviously. He doesn't threaten. He doesn't even raise his voice. Emerson maintained a simmering silence as they proceeded to the lift. His wife was the first one who had the courage to break it. Bad luck, she said. It wasn't your fault, Ramses. Ramses realized, to his surprise, that he had no intention of apologizing. Perhaps letting Sethos go had not been a wise move, but he didn't regret it. It was the news of your arrival that made him bolt, he said. What do you expect to find in his room, father? Do you suppose he's had the common decency to return my best suit, or leave us a note of apology? One never knows, his father said with a grudging smile. We'll have a look later. First we will collect the lady, assuming she hasn't taken herself off too and have lunch. I'm hungry. Ramses knocked and announced himself, but Margaret refused to open the door until Nefret had spoken to her. The room was in disorder, the bed unmade, the furniture shifted round, and Margaret was equally dishevelled. Her clothes looked as if she had slept in them. Thank heaven, she exclaimed, clutching at Emerson's arm like a drowning woman who has found a lifeline. I haven't been out of this room since yesterday afternoon. I didn't dare even open the door for the waiter, and I wasn't sure the invitation was from you, and... and I'm ravenous. Now, now, said Emerson, glancing uneasily at his wife, who remarked, There is no excuse for hysteria, Miss Binton. We will go down to luncheon at once. First smooth your hair and put on your hat. Of course, it wouldn't do to appear in public without a hat, would it? She pressed her hands to her flushed cheeks. I beg your pardon. I've been under something of a strain. 
Their table was ready, and Emerson insisted she eat something and have a glass of wine before she explained. A lady in distress always brought out this chivalrous side of his nature. He even called her Margaret. His wife did not. If you are yourself again, Miss Minton, we would appreciate a brief, coherent narrative. Half a glass of wine and a roll had restored Margaret's self-possession and her sense of humour. Are you sure you wouldn't rather wait and borrow my written account? Just tell us, Ramsay said quickly. By all means, said his mother. You may wonder why I asked Nefret to speak before I opened the door. Yesterday afternoon, just as I was about to go down for tea, there was a knock at my door, and a voice. Your voice, Ramsay's. Ramsay's bit off an oath. His father didn't. Bloody hell and damnation! What did he say? It's me, Margaret. All right, are you? It sounded exactly like you, Ramsay's. It would, Ramsay said between his teeth. So, of course, I unlocked the door and started to open it. He slammed it practically in my face and ordered me to lock it and keep it locked. He didn't sound like you then. He went on to tell me what a bloody idiot I was and that there were at least three people in the hotel, including himself, who would lay violent hands on me if I put my nose outside that door and that he wasn't the only one who could imitate your voice and... She smiled wryly. If he meant to frighten me, he succeeded. When he stopped listing all the things that could happen to me, I asked several questions. You can imagine what about. But there was no answer. The waiter brought their soup, and with a murmured apology she began to eat. Two other people, Emerson muttered. Who the devil? It may not have been true, Ramses said. I couldn't take the chance, could I? Margaret demanded. And later that night, after I'd gone to bed, someone rattled the doorknob. I'd just got up nerve enough to turn out the light, and I was half asleep. I yelled, who's there? Nobody answered. Then, just before dawn... Good God, Emerson explained. Again? He said he was the suffragi, with my breakfast. I hadn't ordered breakfast. Three in all, Nefret murmured. I wonder how many of them were Sethos. I'm glad you find this amusing, Nefret, Margaret said. Nefret hastily wiped the smile off her face. Ramses didn't understand her amusement either. Sethos's intentions might have been honourable, but his methods were deplorable. He'd have had time to pop by just before he went to catch the Aswan train, Nefret went on. Margaret dropped her soup spoon. He's gone to us one? Not bloody, not likely, said Emerson. But he has left the hotel, the bust, the ungrateful wretch. Ramsay's got him over here yesterday, since the presence of a stranger on board the Amelia had become known. Good idea, really. Confuse the trail. Thank you, father, Ramsay said. Hmm, yes. You can't stay here either, Margaret. Uh, Miss Minton. Please use my given name, Professor. Formality is somewhat absurd under the circumstances. Uh, thank you. As I was saying, we need to get you away from here. Peabody? Quite right, Emerson. She is going back to the castle with us. I've already spoken to Cyrus about it. Of course she had, Ramses thought. She had probably put it on her list, Move Miss Minton. Neither of the Vandergelds would have had a word to say about it. She and Nefret went with Margaret to help her pack, while Ramses and his father investigated the room Sethos had occupied. It was on the same floor as Margaret's, a few doors down the hall. The servants had been there that morning. The bed had been made, and fresh towels placed on the table by the washstand. The wardrobe was empty. The only sign of occupancy, past or future, was a book on the bedside table, a popular guide to the antiquities of Upper Egypt. When Ramses picked it up, an envelope fell from between the pages. It was addressed in a bold black scrawl to Professor Radcliffe Emerson. Emerson read the enclosed letter and handed it to Ramses. Sorry to have missed you. I had business elsewhere, 
be good enough, I beg, to present my compliments to the ladies of your family and to Miss Minton, who, I understand, will be leaving Luxor immediately. Sincere regards. It's signed Whitbread. His father's unnatural calm augured poorly for someone. Probably Sethos. The ladies of your family, Emerson said, in the same cool voice. Good of him to include Nefret. Tis rather, considering how she bullied him. Father, he had to be careful what he wrote. The chance of anyone other than you finding the message was remote. But he doesn't take chances, even remote ones. What annoys me most, said Emerson reflectively, is his ability to anticipate our movements. He could have left us at the desk. How did he know I'd search his room? Anyone who was familiar with your habits could anticipate that, sir. Oh? Hmm. It was certainly the safest method of communicating with us. That's a fairly pointed hint about Miss Minton. Well, well. Let us join the ladies and pass on his compliments. Bring the book along. Yes, sir, said Ramses. I had intended to do so. They looked into Margaret's room, where the three women and two suffragies had almost completed packing her bags. We'll meet you in the lobby, Emerson said, retreating in haste as his wife fixed him with an inquiring stare. You are going to tell her, aren't you? Ramses asked, lengthening his stride to keep up with his father. Emerson rang the bell for the lift, waited two seconds, and plunged down the stairs. Yes, yeah, certainly. It's a waste of time trying to keep things from your mother. She always finds out anyhow. And then she... Um, I've been meaning to ask. Not that it's any of my affair. But uh, you wouldn't have fret. Um, the same, Ramsay said with a smile. Ah, and the two of you... Um, uh, getting on well, are you? Yes, sir. He couldn't leave it at that. He knew what his father wanted to hear, even if he was unable to ask a direct question. We are exceedingly happy. Ah. Emerson's hand rested briefly on his shoulder. Good. Let's see if we can locate that rascal, Said. He charged across the lobby, pausing only long enough to toss the key and its massive brass tag onto the desk. Hurry before your mother catches us up. I meant to interview Said earlier, Ramses admitted. He wasn't here yesterday. The usual assemblage of putative guides and hopeful dragomen had gathered at the foot of the stairs, which was as close as they were allowed to get. They surged forward when the doors opened and stopped with a certain amount of shoving and jostling when they recognized Emerson and Ramses. Nor is he present today. Emerson said, scanning the upturned faces. Salam alaikum, Mahmoud, Ali, Abdul Hadi. Where is Said? An eager chorus replied, not only from the ones he had addressed, but from the entire group. Not here, Father of Curses. I can serve you as well. What is it the Father of Curses desires? Said, Emerson descended the stairs. When did you last see him? It took them a while to compare notes, but Ramses was conscious of a sinking sensation at the pit of his stomach even before they reached a consensus. Said hadn't been seen for at least three days. "'He's been murdered,' I remarked, drawing a somewhat wobbly line, occasioned by the motion of the boat, through one of the items on my list." For once, not even Emerson objected to what some might consider a premature conclusion. Miss Minton had gone pale. The only face that did not reflect some degree of distress was that of Ramses. The stony mask did not deceive me or Nefret, but it was Emerson who uttered the words I had intended to say. You couldn't have got to him in time, Ramses, even if you had not had more pressing matters to deal with. He must have been killed the night of the failed raid. But you haven't even looked for him, Miss Minton exclaimed. He may have gone off with a party of tourists. Ever courteous, Emerson gave her the explanation the rest of us did not need. Said is always at the Winter Palace. Even if he had been hired by a visitor, his associates would know of it. 
They would know of his death, surely, Miss Minton persisted. His body will probably never be found, Ramsay said. If I had arranged the business, I'd have carried him, dead or alive, to the Jebel and tossed him into one of the more remote wadis. By the time he's found, if he ever is, there won't be enough left to identify. I decided it was time to change the subject. I was sorry about poor Said, who had been annoying but harmless, but there was nothing more we could do for or about him. Did you find anything in Sethos's room? I inquired. Emerson produced the letter and read it aloud. It was a singularly uninformative document, as we all agreed. The reference to Miss Minton was not well received by that lady, but she said only, What about the book? Are any of the words underlined? Or any of the sites marked? Feel free to look through it, Ramsay said, handing her the volume in question. I doubt Sethos would do anything so trite, however. Cyrus's carriage was waiting for us at the dock. When she saw it, Miss Minton hung back. I feel awkward imposing on Mr. and Mrs. Vandergelt. Would you prefer to return to the hotel? My tone was somewhat sharp. Instead of snapping back at me, she lowered her eyes and murmured, I wish you didn't dislike me so much, Mrs. Emerson. What more can I do to win your acceptance, if not your goodwill? The most sensible course would be for you to leave Luxor at once. I can't do that. You can. But I didn't suppose you would. A journalist in pursuit of a story. Do me the credit to believe that is not my primary motive. I want... I want to help. No, you want to find our elusive acquaintance. Didn't your latest encounter with him destroy your romantic fantasies? A dark flush mantled her cheeks. You are a merciless opponent, Mrs. Emerson. I do want to know what became of him. Is that so surprising? Whether he liked it or not, and he made it clear that he did not, we shared a terrifying experience. She hesitated briefly and then burst out, I may have been the innocent cause of his betrayal, but I was also his salvation. And by God, before I'm through with him, he's going to admit it and thank me. I said no more, since the men had finished putting her luggage into the carriage and Emerson was calling us to come along. But her outburst, whose genuineness I did not doubt, had made me think better of her. A woman who would accept meekly the rudeness to which he had subjected her was not a woman I could admire. In fact, she had a number of admirable qualities. If only she hadn't been a confounded journalist. Nefret and Ramses refused Emerson's suggestion that we leave them off at the Amelia. The carriage would have been uncomfortably crowded with five persons, but it was clear to my sympathetic imagination that they preferred to be alone. As they walked away, I saw his arm go round her waist and her head come to rest against his shoulder. Miss Minton was watching them too. She sighed. Instead of standing hospitably open as they usually did when the Vandergelts were in residence, the gates of the compound were closed, and the aged gatekeeper had been replaced by a sturdy youth whom I recognized as one of Yusuf and Dawood's kinsmen. Cyrus and Catherine came out to greet us, and I knew at once from Cyrus's self-conscious look and Catherine's stiff smile that he had confessed some, if not all, the truth. No one else noticed anything amiss, I believe. Catherine was always a lady, and her reception of Miss Minton was perfectly cordial. She announced that tea would be served in an hour, sent Miss Minton off with one of the maids, and then turned to me. I anticipated her. Yes, Catherine, I owe you an explanation and an apology. Shall we retire to the library? Where is William? In the library, Cyrus said, tugging at his goatee. At least that's where he was last time I saw him. The sitting room, then, I said, and led the way. I had to tell her, Cyrus burst out. Of course, I replied graciously. There should be perfect confidence between husband and wife. We only wanted to spare you worry, Catherine. I know, Amelia, I would willingly, gladly risk myself and even Cyrus to help you. But... But not Bertie... 
My dear, I understand, and I don't blame you one particle. If I believed there were the slightest possibility he could come to harm, I would leave at once. In fact, I had already considered moving our inconvenient menage to our old quarters. Emerson's countenance brightened. I had thought the idea would appeal to him. When he is a guest in someone else's home, he has to mind his manners. Excellent thought, Peabody. Yusuf won't mind doubling up. A flush of shame, as I took it to be, warmed Catherine's cheeks. No, you mustn't even consider it. You would be much more open to attack there, and I'd never forgive myself if anything happened to one of you, especially to the child. I mean it, Amelia. I really do. Cyrus, I am sorry for the horrid things I said to you. I behaved like a shrew and a miserable coward. I won't do it again. He took her hand. Quite all right, my dear. Bertie will be fine, you'll see. Matter of fact, Amelia, I was kind of disappointed you didn't bring him along, too. I've been curious to meet the fella after that trick he pulled on me some years back. What'd you do with him? Nothing, Emerson growled. He'd gone. At my suggestion, he elaborated working himself up into a state of considerable indignation as he described the way Sethos had played on Miss Minton's nerves. He ended by reading the note that had been left for him. I was pleased to observe that Catherine appeared more intrigued than fearful. As for Cyrus, he made no secret of his amusement. "'Fella has a certain style, hasn't he? Kind of a mean stunt he played on the lady.' "'But necessary,' Catherine interrupted. From what you have told me of her, Amelia, she wouldn't have been deterred by a courteous warning. Quite right, Catherine. Well, I guess maybe he was trying to keep her out of trouble, Cyrus conceded. Doggone it, it's a shame he got away from you. He must know more than he's telling. Any chance of tracking him down? I can't think how, Emerson admitted. He must have prepared a number of hiding places when he was in Luxor in the old days. Some, if not all, are known to his adversary. After that near miss the other night, he won't be foolish enough to use them again. I am at a loss as to where to look for him. Naturally, I was not. I was on the verge of saying so when Miss Minton entered the room, hoping she was not too early for tea, and Catherine immediately took up her duties as hostess. After tea, when Emerson and I were in our room changing for dinner, he exclaimed, Damnation! We forgot to ask about that fellow, um, Smith, when we were at the Winter Palace. You could not have done so if you were unable to remember his real name, I replied. Well, whose fault is that? You were the one who kept referring to him as Smith. Did you make inquiries? I saw no reason to admit that I had also forgotten that ridiculous appellation. I could hardly have done so, Emerson, while Miss Minton was with me. We don't want her to know of our interest in the fellow, but I will inquire as soon as I can. I meant to inquire about someone else as well. The interval had given me time to reconsider my first impulse, and I determined to keep my own counsel until I could confirm my hunch. Emerson had no self-control. Our quarry would have to be approached cautiously as one stalks a wild animal. I was undoubtedly the proper person to do it. Chapter 16 He was waiting for me at the top of the cliff as I climbed, moving with the effortless ease found only in dreams. I took the hand he extended, and he drew me up to stand beside him. I came, I said. You were slow in coming, said Abdallah. I sat down on the ground and wrapped my arms round my raised knees. The morning air was as refreshing as cool water against the skin, but it was still a little chilly and I wasn't wearing a coat. I had some difficulty convincing Emerson, I explained. You know how stubborn he is. No, that is not the reason. Tall and straight, black-bearded and finely dressed as he always was in these visions, he towered over me. 
he had covered his mouth with his hand to conceal a smile. No, I admitted, smiling back at him. I was on the wrong track, wasn't I? Yes. If you had come before, you would have saved yourself and those you love trouble and danger. Not more of your enigmatic hints, Abdallah, I exclaimed. Trouble and danger are your constant companions, Sit. It would serve no purpose to warn you of what lies in store, even if I were allowed. In avoiding one peril, you would run straight into another. Hmm, I said. What about the tomb, then? You must know where it is. Tomb? Which tomb? I know them all. Three more in the Bibban el Muluk, six in the Queen's Valley, seventeen, three in the Valley of the Kings, two of a richness hitherto unknown, Abdallah said meditatively. He sat down beside me. But they are not what you seek now. Never mind that, I exclaimed. Two rich tombs in the Valley of the Kings? Where? This time he did not bother to hide his smile. They will be found in the fullness of time, by those who are destined to find them. Do you know why I summoned you to Luxor? Obviously it was not to help me find lost tombs, I muttered. Why then? Because this is your place. Look about you. He gestured. The rim of the sun showed above the eastern cliffs, a crescent of fiery red. The valley lay in shadow, from the dim outlines of the Theban temples across the river to the pale porticoes of Hatshepsut's temple directly below us. Slowly the crescent widened into a glowing orb, and the light spread, sparkling on the water, brightening the luxuriant greenery of the fields, turning the silvery sand to pale gold. The world had wakened to life after the sleep of darkness. How beautiful is your rising, I murmured. The living Aten, who... The Lord amun -re, Abdallah corrected, somewhat snappishly. Your Aten was a short-lived god. "'invented by a heretic. "'I had always suspected Abdallah was a pagan at heart. "'Since I did not care to engage in a discussion about religion "'with a man who was presumably in a position to know more about it than I, "'I said mildly, "'They were both sun-gods, aspects of the same divine force.' "'Bah!' said Abdallah. amun -re was the great god of Egypt, "'ruler of heaven, lord.' Of the silent. Yes, I said dreamily. Abdallah, you were right to bring me back. I wonder if I could persuade Lord Carnarvon to give up his concession in the... Abdallah interrupted me with a shout of laughter. I should not have spoken of rich tombs, he said, rising and taking my hand to lift me to my feet. I was boasting, Sid. But there is no danger that you will break the thread of the future, for the Lord will not let you have the valley. I must go now. Think on what I have told you. You haven't told me anything useful, I grumbled. He turned my face up and kissed me on the brow, as a father might have done. God, go with you, Sid. May all the gods go with you. The dream was clear in my mind when I woke in the morning, and I am sure I need not tell the reader what part of it was clearest. Emerson was still asleep, flat on his back, with his arms folded across his chest like a mummified pharaoh. I leaned over him. Emerson, there are two rich undiscovered tombs in the Valley of the Kings. Emerson said, <clears throat> and rolled over, turning his back to me. His recalcitrance, which I ought to have expected, gave me time to have second thoughts. Prudence overcame archaeological fever. I returned to a supine position and proceeded to have them. 
Emerson would not consider a dream a sufficient guide to excavation. It was impossible to explain to someone who hadn't experienced them how vivid and real those visions were. I could still feel the pressure of Abdallah's lips on my brow. Had I been gifted with artistic talents, I could have reproduced every line and every whisker on his face. What the devil had been the point of that particular dream? Surely those tantalizing hints of tombs in the valley had only been meant to tease me. Hints were of no use if I couldn't get the confounded Furman. He must have said something else. I was going over that conversation in my mind when Emerson turned and flung out his arm. As he later admitted, he had been dreaming too, of fighting with an opponent whose identity he claimed not to remember. The blow he directed at this phantom landed squarely across my ribs, evoking a cry of indignation and pain which was loud enough to rouse Emerson. He was still apologizing and looking for bruises when the servant brought our tea. I sent my spouse off to bathe and dress and consulted my list. In fact, I had already determined on a course of action which did not include describing my dream to Emerson. There was only one other person who might give credence to it, and she was the very individual I had meant to consult about an equally important matter. She and Ramses arrived at the castle as we were finishing breakfast and joined us on the veranda with their little entourage. It was a pretty shaded spot, curtained with vines, a place conducive to friendly social intercourse. One would never have supposed that the smiling faces hid so many dark secrets. Jumana pounced on Emerson. She had been reading his history and showered him with questions which were not so much designed to obtain information as demonstrate how clever she was. The innocent man, bemused by fluttering lashes and wide dark eyes, nodded and smiled, while Bertie tried to get a word in. My tall son was holding his wife's hand under the table. He thought no one noticed, but of course I did, and chatting with Senia, who had pulled her chair next to his. It occurred to me that I might have some difficulty getting the fret to myself. And how were we to elude Miss Minton, whose cool black eyes moved from face to face as if trying to read the thoughts those countenances concealed? Finally, Cyrus pointed out that they had yet to decide where they would go that day. Many of the most promising sites, including the East and West Valleys and the Asasif, had already been allocated to other excavators. There were a number of pleasant ruins scattered about, but Cyrus was only interested in tombs. They finally settled on the Valley of the Queens. Six unknown tombs in the Valley of the Queens. Remembering Abdullah's words, I was gripped by a brief spasm of archaeological fever. But no, I told myself, duty before pleasure. It wasn't likely that they would find any of the missing tombs that morning. I informed Emerson that I would not accompany him since I had other tasks, including some necessary shopping in Luxor. My remark fell into one of those silences that sometimes occur, though not often with us, I admit, and a number of heads turned in my direction. I had expected Emerson would be suspicious, but since he could not force me to go with him, and since he would rather have been hanged than go to the shops with me, he would have no choice but to acquiesce. Suspicious he unquestionably was. His sapphirine eyes narrowed. Then they opened wide in an unconvincing display of affability, and he said, Very well, my dear, whatever you say. This was an extremely disconcerting development. Emerson must be up to something. Ah, well, I thought. I can't be in two places at once. I had hoped Nefret would offer to accompany me, but she did not, so I had to ask her point blank. Needless to say, she agreed. Ramses was even more suspicious than his father. As we left the table, he took me by the arm and drew me aside. Now see here, mother, he began, his eyebrows forming an alarming angle. Ramses, I said, just as firmly, do you suppose I would do anything to endanger Nefret? Not intentionally, but you 
It is high time you got over treating her and me like children. His finely cut lips relaxed into a half smile. That's what she said. I'm trying, mother. It isn't easy. I know, dear boy. We feel the same about you and your father. About us? But we aren't feeble, helpless women. Ramses threw up his hands. All right, mother, you win. Try not to. Oh, confounded, you know what I mean to say. Nefret isn't. Uh, she isn't the only one I care about. One of his hands had come to rest on my shoulder. I patted it affectionately. And your father is not the only one I care about. Look after one another, and don't let him do anything foolish. I know the signs. He is up to something. Unlike you. I decided to ignore this. We finally got them off, including Bertie. Catherine tried to prevent him, but I felt obliged to oppose her wishes. The boy had improved amazingly in the past few days, and in my opinion, maternal fussing is deleterious to young persons. I never fussed over Ramses, I pointed out to her, and see how well he's turned out. There were several domestic matters to be dealt with before we could leave for Luxor. I had always envied male police officers and detectives their freedom from such distractions. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, for example, never had to concern himself with ordering meals, settling disputes with contentious servants, or coping with small, sulky children and large, sulky cats. Then there was Christmas, now less than a week away. It had to be celebrated in proper fashion for all our sakes, but especially for Senia's. She'd been happily occupied with nursing Gargery and Bertie, but with both her patients on the way to recovery, she had begun to complain about being forced to remain inside the stout walls of the castle, about seeing too little of Ramses. It was hard on the child, but I could hardly tell her why we dared not let her go abroad. Then there was Fatima, who was baking Christmas cakes and biscuits in Cyrus's kitchen, to the extreme exasperation of Cyrus's chef. And Horace, who had taken to prowling up and down in front of the door where the Vandergelt's cat Sekhmet dwelt in more than oriental splendor. Sekhmet had belonged to us before Cyrus and Catherine adopted her. She had only been bred once, to Horace himself in point of fact, and I had my suspicions about Horace's present interest. With my usual tact, I soothed the chef, set Senia to making paper ornaments for the tree, wondering where the devil I was to find one, instructed Gargery to keep her amused, and asked Nefret to remove Horace long enough so that the terrified servant, who was supposed to look after Sekhmet, could get into the room. Unfortunately, Sekhmet whizzed through the door as soon as it opened, thus confirming my diagnosis of her condition, and Nefret was rather badly scratched before we managed to capture both animals. Nefret laughed, though. Life is never so interesting without you, mother, she said affectionately, while I painted her scratches with iodine. When are you going to tell me what scheme you've formed? I don't believe for an instant that you really mean to shop today. I will tell you all about it as soon as we're alone, my dear. It is certainly a nuisance to keep track of what various persons know and what must be kept from them. I was forced to give Catherine some idea of my plan to prevent her from accompanying us. So all that remains is to get away without Miss Minton. Mark my words, she will be lying in wait for us. In fact, the cursed woman was seated in the carriage when we came out of the house, elegantly attired in a shepherd's check suit, and wearing a jaunty little hat tipped over one eye. I hope you don't mind my accompanying you, she said, baring her teeth at me. Her black eyes looked like jet beads. Out of the question, I said. I won my point, naturally, but not without an argument. She tried every underhanded trick she could think of, from threats and promises of assistance to pleading. She was forced to give way at last. When she pushed past me on her way to the door, I saw there were tears in her eyes. She really cares for him, Nefret said, as I joined her in the carriage. Those were tears of rage, I expect, I replied. But I have no sympathy for bathetic sentimentality. She ought to have more pride. So, you have discovered my little scheme? 
It wasn't difficult, Lefret said with a knowing smile. You are aching to confront him. Do you know where he is? At one of the other hotels, I expect. One wouldn't expect such a devious man to do anything so obvious, but that is why it is so clever. One is reminded, is one not, of Mr. Poe's purloined letter trick. I wasn't, Lefret said. But the same idea had occurred to me. It's only been five days since he fell ill, and who knows there is danger of a recurrence if he doesn't take proper care of himself. Have you mentioned your idea to Ramses? No, not yet. But I will, Mother. And if we locate Sethos, I will tell him that as well. I can't lie to him. So, if you'd rather leave me off at the Amelia... Good gracious, no. I will tell them all about it myself. This evening. I just didn't want them along, shouting and cursing and confusing the issue. The line between the frets' brows smoothed out. What are you going to do with him if you find him? That is one of the matters I wanted to discuss with you. I mean to question him intensively, of course. I feel certain he knows more than he admitted. So far, we are at an impasse. Oh, I expect that eventually I can work it out. But my investigations may take a little time, and I'd like to settle the business before Christmas. Christmas, of course, Nevret murmured. The corners of her mouth twitched. We may want to bring him back to the castle with us. I continued. Good Lord, Mother, you can't do that to poor Catherine. Hasn't she enough to contend with already? Her face underwent a series of strange alterations. In some alarm, I reached for her. She waved me away, sank back into the corner, and laughed so hard, tears filled her eyes. I handed her my handkerchief. I do apologize, she gurgled. I was picturing Christmas at the castle, with Horace trying to get at Sekhmet, and Bertie trying to get Jumana off in a dark corner, and Catherine trying to keep him away from her, and the chef storming out of the house because Fatima won't let him use the ovens, and and in, and in the middle of it all, Uncle Sethos disguised his father Christmas. I allowed the girl to enjoy her moments of merriment. Far be it from me to mar those moments by reminding her that if we did not succeed in identifying the villain, he might be among the guests. We took the ferry across, and as we leaned against the rail, holding firmly to our hats, I told Nefret about my dream, and the one that had preceded it. But how unkind, she exclaimed, her eyes twinkling. To tell you of rich tombs and not disclose their location... He was teasing me. He enjoys doing that. Never mind the unknown tombs, Nefret. I've been haunted by the feeling that I missed something of importance. One of those confounded mysterious clues Abdullah is so fond of dropping. Tell me again what he said. I repeated the conversation. She shook her head. I can't think what it might be. You don't really believe in my dreams, do you? It is good of you to pretend to take them seriously. How could I be arrogant enough to deny the possibility? Even if they are the product of your sleeping mind, they cannot be dismissed as meaningless. I don't believe in the libido, I warned her. Nefret's face dissolved into laughter. Of course not, Mother Darling. Anyhow, Abdallah would never be vulgar. We're about to dock. Where are we going first? There were, at that time, eight European-style hotels on the East Bank. Two of them were clean but inexpensive. The other six offered greater amenities along with higher rates. Again, I would welcome your advice, I replied. He might have doubled back to the Winter Palace under another name. Not in the same suit of clothes, Lefret said. And not on the same day, I agreed, thinking what a pleasure it was to deal with an intelligent, intuitive female mind. The closest hotel to the Winter Palace is the Luxor. Watch your step, my dear. The key is very slippery. So we're going to the Luxor? No. Sethos told the clerk at the Winter Palace he was going to the railroad station. I believe that is exactly what he did. If he had taken a carriage to any other destination, the driver might remember him, and that he would avoid at all costs. 
It's easy to lose oneself in the crowd waiting for the train and slip away. The Hotel de la Gare is within easy walking distance of the station. That's very ingenious, Mother, Nefred said. I smiled modestly in acknowledgement of the compliment and waved my parasol at a passing carriage. We went first to the Winter Palace, where I learnt that Mr. Brace Dragon Boy's Girdle, whose eminently forgettable name I had fortunately noted in my diary, had taken his departure two days earlier. This was most satisfactory news, for it confirmed one of my theories, not that I had ever doubted its accuracy. I then directed the driver to take us to the Hotel de la Gare. The best Baedeker could say about the station hotel was that it was clean. It certainly did not measure up to my standards. The threadbare carpet in the lobby was gritty with sand, and the desk clerk had obviously been wearing the same collar for several days. His jaw dropped when he saw us. It was not the sort of place where ladies of our distinction were likely to come. Good morning, I said pleasantly, placing my parasol on the desk. I am looking for a gentleman who arrived yesterday morning. The clerk looked from me to the parasol to the fret and back to me. It took him several seconds to get his jaw into operation. Yes, it, uh, there were several. Let me see the register, please. Seven persons had checked into the hotel the previous day. Two were man and wife, or claimed to be, and there had been a party of three gentlemen. That left two possibilities. It wasn't necessary for me to elicit descriptions from the clerk. One man had given the name of Rudolf Rassendil. His bizarre sense of humour will prove to be his downfall one day, I remarked in a fret as we started up the stairs to the third floor. The lift was out of order, of course. How many people have read The Prisoner of Zender? Quite a lot, I should think. It was careless of him. The door was at the end of a dismal corridor, lit only by a nearby window. The advantages of the location were manifest. No one could get at him via his windows, of which there were probably two, since his was a corner room, and they provided convenient exits. No doubt he had already knotted one of the bedsheets into a makeshift rope. "'Are you going to pretend to be a servant?' Nefret whispered. I looked at her in surprise. No, why should I do that? I removed one of my gloves and knocked emphatically on the door. It is I, Amelia. Let me in at once. Utter silence followed. I knocked again. I have no other appointments today, I said in a louder voice. You may as well open the door. The portal was flung wide, and there he stood. I thought I had prepared myself mentally for the meeting. I had been mistaken. The last time I'd seen him, he'd been lying on a litter, dead or dying, as I believed, drenched in blood, and wearing an auburn wig and moustache. It might have been Emerson who confronted me now. Ruffled black hair, prominent chin, squared shoulders. Even the scowl was familiar. He was wearing a dressing gown I recognised as one of Ramsay's, and his feet were bare. I found myself somewhat short of breath. Quite right, he said. You would stand there all day shouting. He stood back and beckoned us in. Is that all? he inquired. Where are the rest of them? Ratcliffe, Ramsay's, Miss Minton? Let us not waste time in irony. I said. How did you find me? That is also irrelevant. The room did have two windows. It also had a narrow bed, a wardrobe, a small table, a single chair, and a set of chipped bathroom utensils, blatantly displayed without so much as a curtain to conceal them. Goodness, how unpleasant, I said. You can't stay here. Not any longer, no. My knees were a trifle unsteady. I sank into the chair. It wobbled but held. Sit down, I ordered, removing a bundle of cloth from my bag. 
You don't look at all well. For God's sake, don't cry, Sethos exclaimed. He began to back away. You never cry. You didn't shed a tear when I died in your arms. You... The room was too small for him to retreat far. He fetched up against the edge of the bed and collapsed onto it. The fret had closed and bolted the door. Since there was not another chair, she sat down next to Sethos. I have no intention of crying, I said, shaking out the bundle. What the devil, Sethos began. Don't swear, I said automatically. It is, as you have no doubt observed, a gullabier. I took the liberty of borrowing a long scarf from Catherine. It will serve as a turban. You must leave here this evening. I doubt we were followed. Your adversary can't be everywhere. But he may be clever enough to investigate the other hotels. It was foolish of you to use that pseudonym. I, said Sethos, trying to pull Nefret's hand away from his forehead. No fever, she announced. How much quinine did you give him? Enough for five days, half a grain per day. Hmm, I'd have recommended more. How many days has it been? I've rather lost track, Nefret admitted. She began counting on her fingers. Sunday, Monday. Sethos said... Why, never mind, we'll have to risk it. He should be over the worst by now. Sethos said, How? Through the window, of course, I said impatiently. Mr. Rassendil will renege on his bill. No doubt they are accustomed to that sort of thing at the Hotel de la Gare. Go straight to the landing and take the ferry across. Someone will be waiting for you on the West Bank. Where? The castle? Nefret inquired. Sethos gave her a look of abject horror. No, Selim will take him to our old house. Dowd is staying there too. That should be ample protection. I do not see any dirty crockery, so I assume he hasn't eaten today. It is necessary to keep one's strength up. Nefret, would you be good enough to go down and order food? She did not demur by so much as a raised eyebrow. Her sympathetic imagination told her that I wished to be alone with him. After she had departed, I locked the door and returned to my chair. I had believed my thoughts were in perfect order, but strangely, I found myself mute. We contemplated one another for a few moments. His eyes were the first to fall. "'We shouldn't have come here,' he said. I swore never to see you again, and I meant to keep my promise this time. There is a fatality that shapes our ends, I remarked. Or is it the war office that has shaped them? Don't bother to deny that you are still working for British intelligence. You deceived Ramses and Nefret, but you cannot deceive me. It was on your account that Mr. Smith came to Luxor. You were to report to him... And that is one of the reasons why you were so anxious to get to the Winter Palace. He left the day after you arrived. You had been to Kaga. Why would you go there unless it was to spy on the Senussi? Much of what I had said was pure surmise, logical but unproved. He remained silent, head bowed, until I added, You accepted the assignment. Ramses refused. I had been sure that would stir him up. He stiffened and scowled at me. If you think I did it on his account, you are mistaken. I would never accuse you of being guided by altruism or affection, I assured him. He couldn't have carried it off. If he'd dropped out of sight, Sidi Ahmed's men would have tried to rip the beard off every stranger who approached the camp. Your official job is a side issue now. The interesting attentions we have recently received are directly related to the matter of the missing tomb. What do you know that we do not? He had recovered his composure. He rubbed his bristly chin and gave me a cynical smile. You do go straight to the point, Amelia, dear. I am ignorant of the answers to the two most important questions, the location of the tomb and the identity of my rival. There was a knock at the door. Curse it! I didn't suppose she'd be so quick, I said. We must have a council of war. There isn't time for it now. Give me your word. 
The rapping became louder and more peremptory. Sethos leapt to his feet. That isn't a threat. Amelia, don't open the door. He was too slow to stop me. Ramses had taught me a rather nice little trick of letting an adversary start into the room and then slamming the door hard against his face. I was anxious to try it and hopeful of capturing one of our foes. Unfortunately, the person in the hall was not a foe. It was Margaret Minton. Confound it, I said. Hell and damnation, said Sethos. I seized Margaret's sleeve and pulled her into the room. How did you find us? I hired a boat and then located the driver who brought you here. Didn't you realize you were leaving a trail anyone could follow? And you... She turned furious eyes on Sethos. Rudolph Rassendil. I will not tolerate criticism from you, Miss Minton, I said coldly. Forgive me. Accept my abject apologies. She stamped her foot. I always say the wrong thing, and I'm sorry. I truly am. But it doesn't matter. We've got to get him away from here as soon as possible. I was about to make those arrangements when you... Another knock at the door. We were all a trifle tense. I started. Miss Minton let out a little scream, and Sethos swore. Nefret, I called. The answer was in the affirmative. Nefret, the waiter, and the tray crowded into the room. After some complex manoeuvring, we got the tray on the table, the waiter out, and the door locked. Perched on the side of the bed, arms folded, Sethos said, this is becoming positively farcical. Are we expecting any other guests? The question was addressed to the company in general, not to Miss Minton. He hadn't spoken to her or looked directly at her. Eat your breakfast, I said thoughtfully. Lunch, said my brother-in-law, inspecting his plate. The vegetables had been stewed into grey ambiguity and the chunks of meat were burned. I may as well. I won't be allowed to say anything. Please, Amelia. Margaret clasped her hands and looked at me imploringly. Don't be angry. I only want... What the devil is she doing here? Nefret demanded. He must leave now, Margaret insisted. I had arrived at the same conclusion. The advantage of darkness, which had affected my first plan, was now outweighed by several disadvantages. Luxor would soon be gossiping about the procession of well-dressed females who had come calling on the amazing Mr. Rassendil. Anyhow, it had been naive of me to assume Sethos would go where I told him to go and stay where I ordered him to stay. He was eating the horrible mess with more appreciation than it deserved. The placidity of his countenance aroused the direst of suspicions. "'You are correct,' I said." Sethos choked. His countenance was no longer placid. The enthusiastic cooperation of two other sensible persons, i.e. women, made the arrangements much easier. In fact, I doubt I could have managed them by myself. Nefret was the first to leave. We gave her ten minutes start and then proceeded to the next stage of the plan. I left Miss Minton to stand guard outside the door, while I hurried down and went round the hotel to wait under the window. Sethos had not objected. He appeared to be somewhat stupefied. The back of the hotel bordered on an empty space occupied only by weeds and mangy dogs. An obscenely fat rat sauntered across the dusty ground, giving me and the dogs an insolent look. I didn't blame the dogs for not wanting to tackle it. I was beginning to fear Sethos had found some way of getting past Miss Minton when the rope of twisted sheets, it had been under the mattress, tumbled out of the window with a suitcase tied to the end. Sethos came down hand over hand. He was wearing the turban and galabilla, but his face was too pale. I scooped up a handful of dirt. Amelia, don't, he said, fending me off. Let me go out of your life. I'm no good to you or anyone else now. Dear me, how tragic, I remarked. You left out the part about returning to your gutter. I was saving that, 
said Sethos. His smile lessened his resemblance to Emerson. It had a quality of mockery that was never to be found on the candid countenance of my spouse. Very well, Amelia. Miss Minton came trotting round the corner of the building, her hat tipped over one eye. Good, you've got him, she gasped. As I was about to say, remarked my brother-in-law, I can deal with one dominating female, possibly with two, but not with three. Do me one small favour, if you will. Don't dash about looking for a killer. I'll take care of her myself. Ah, I said, I thought so. You mean to make a target of yourself in the hope that he will attack you. That's all well and good, and we may yet have to resort to some such expedient. But what, may I ask, is the point of going through the performance unless we are on hand to catch the fellow? Stop arguing and come along before someone sees us. Nefret was waiting at the dock with the boat she had hired and a pile of parcels. She shoved them into Sethos's arms. The boatman gave him a critical look, wondering, no doubt, why we employed such a dirty fellow. I had accidentally got some of the dirt into his eyes, but that was all to the good, since they now had the red-rimmed look of the infection from which many unfortunate Egyptians suffer. "'What did you purchase?' I asked, once we were underway. Some of the boatmen understand a bit of English. "'The first large objects I could lay my hands on,' Nefret said, "'including a perfectly hideous model of the façade of Abu Simbel.' "'We'll give it to Gargery for Christmas,' I said. "'Our unkempt servant, squatting in the bows, let out a strangled cough. "'He made one more attempt to dissuade me as he put our parcels into the carriage. "'Aren't you being rather cold-blooded about the risk to Selim and Daoud and the rest of the clan? "'My enemies will track us eventually. "'But not immediately. It may take them a day or two. "'By then we'll be prepared.' We drove straight to the house. Had I not been preoccupied with more serious matters, my heart would have swelled with nostalgia at the sight of our old home, which held so many memories. The climbing roses were dead, of course. Abdallah had never watered them either. But what did that matter? He'd been right. This was where I was meant to be. My spirits received a slight check when I learned that the only men in the house were Yusuf and his youngest son. They were both in the parlour, smoking and drinking coffee, and before I could get down to business, I had to refuse refreshments and apologise to Yusuf for not coming to call earlier. The house was in perfect order, and the parlour looked much as we had left it, even to the ornaments on the whatnot. "'I thought you'd gone to the Queen's Valley,' I said to Jamil. "'The young Effendi was weary,' Jamil replied, staring curiously at Sethos. "'We took him back to the castle. "'Selim and Daoud are with the father of curses, "'but we are at your service, Sitakim, my father and I. "'And about as much use as Senia, I thought. "'Is Khadija here?' Nefret asked. "'She had been waiting for a summons. "'Nefret's question was enough.' When she appeared in the doorway, black-robed but unveiled, I could have kissed her. Nefret did. Khadija folded her in arms almost as brawny as those of her husband, Daoud, and then looked inquiringly at me. "'Thank goodness!' I exclaimed. "'Listen carefully, Khadija. "'This man,' I indicated Sethos, "'this man is my prisoner. "'He must be kept hidden and secure.' Ah, oh, said Jamil eagerly. I will guard him, Sitakim, with my father's gun. A suitable occupation for a man, I thought. I said firmly, no gun, Jamil. He is to be well treated and unharmed. May God bless you, Sit, Sethos whined. You are merciful, you are kind, you are... I leave him in your charge, Khadija, I went on. This is the most important thing. No one outside the family must know he is here. The father of curses and I will return tonight to question him. Studying the boy's weak, handsome face, I decided I had better reinforce my warning. Jamil, 
Yusuf, no one is to leave the house until I give permission. Except, of course, for Daoud and Selim. They will take the horses to the Dahabiya tomorrow morning. Is that clearly understood? If either of you mentions the presence of our... prisoner... I did not finish the threat. The parasol and the invocation of Emerson should suffice. Sethos slunk off with Khadijah, and we returned to the carriage. The skulking and whining were rather overdone, I said. I hope he won't be carried away by the role. It is one of his weaknesses. The role of prisoner, Margaret murmured. How did you think of that? It would never have occurred to me. I could hardly have described him as an honoured guest or a new servant, now could I? Besides, I wanted him locked up. I don't trust him. It was a brilliant idea, Mrs. Emerson, Margaret said sincerely. I smiled at her. You may call me Amelia. I consulted my lapel watch. I hope we're not too late for luncheon. It has been a busy morning. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses found it difficult to concentrate on archaeology when his wife and his mother were off somewhere, bent on mischief. He consoled himself with the thought that they couldn't get in too much trouble on the streets of Luxor. Perhaps his mother meant to perch on a bench somewhere, examining the faces of passers-by. She'd always claimed she would recognize Sethos anywhere, in any disguise. Perhaps she really intended to shop. Christmas was approaching, and he'd never known his mother to be distracted from those festivities by anything as unimportant as a murderer. Perhaps. Bertie had tried to speak to him twice before he took note of his surroundings. I beg your pardon, he said. I only wanted to ask a few questions, if you don't mind. I didn't want to interrupt Cyrus and the professor. I doubt you could have, Ramses said. His father and Cyrus were some distance ahead, with Selim and Jamil in close attendance. Somewhat guiltily, he turned his attention to his companion. He ought to have been looking after Bertie. But Jumana was riding close on Bertie's other side, and Daoud was behind him, and although Bertie was flushed and perspiring, he seemed to be all right. They had taken the road from Medinet Habu into the cliff-enclosed valley. Few tourists came that way. The cook's tours allowed only enough time for the major sites, the East Bank temples, the Ramaseum and Medinet Abu, the royal tombs, and a few selected tombs of the nobles. It was likely that Sethos had maintained his role of tourist. He wouldn't risk. Is this where Cyrus wants to dig? Bertie asked. What? Oh, sorry, it's one possibility. There have been over seventy tombs found already, but most are unfinished and undecorated, more like caves, really. They date from the 19th and 20th dynasties and include tombs of royal princes as well as queens. Are we going to see any of them? Bertie passed his sleeve over his forehead. It looks that way. His father and Cyrus were talking with an Egyptian who had emerged from a rough shelter. The most important tombs are closed. The custodian has the keys. They inspected three of the tombs, finishing with that of Queen Nefertari Merenmut, where Emerson fulminated about the damage to the exquisitely painted reliefs. There's a worthwhile project for you, he declared. You should be spending your money on repairing scenes like these, instead of exposing more antiquities to be looted and damaged. I haven't exposed anything yet, Cyrus retorted. Jumping Jehoshaphat, Emerson, all I want is one tomb. One good tomb. That's not asking much. The sun was high overhead when they settled down in the mouth of an unfinished tomb and opened the basket of food. That's enough for you today, Bertie, Emerson announced. I feel perfectly fit, sir, Bertie protested. Of course you do, Emerson smiled paternally. It's a long ride back, though, and you mustn't overdo. Tomorrow is another day. Daoud wanted to take Bertie home, but Emerson had other ideas. 
As soon as they had finished eating, he sent Bertie off with Jamil and Jumana. That's got rid of them, he announced, taking out his pipe. Now we can get down to business. Will you be all right? Ramses asked, watching the little cortege wind its way along the valley floor toward the entrance. She'll look after him, Emerson said. Pack up, sell him, and let's be off. Where? Ramses asked. Where do you think? Dera Medina. Very good, Emerson said. Is it the man Coens you suspect? Selim asked, jumbling crockery and leftover food into the basket. Apparently Cyrus and Emerson hadn't been talking archaeology with him. I think he's our man, yes, said Emerson. The broken stealer Senia found, Ramsay said. Well done, said his father. I don't get it, Cyrus said blankly. The bottom part had been knocked off, Ramses explained. It was a fresh break. The name and titles of the owner were missing. That's why it took me a while to remember where I'd seen others like it. In those cases, the owners were described as workers in the place of truth, the Valley of the Kings, that is. The men who cut and decorated the royal tombs lived at Dera Medina. Emerson's pipe had gone out. He gave Ramses an encouraging smile and struck a match. The stealer was planted... Ramsay said, not only to capture our interest, father might well have insisted on excavating the entire damned rubbish dump, which would have taken the rest of the season. Your mother wouldn't let me, said Emerson, grinning. If I may finish, father, it also got Senia interested in the dump site and made it easier for the kidnapper to approach her. But it's not proof of Quince's guilt. Bah, said Emerson. He's the one who sent you to the spot where the rock fell, Cyrus pointed out. And the body. I think I've figured out why. So do I, said Emerson. The poor devil was an innocent bystander who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yes, sir, I agree. But even if we are right, it doesn't necessarily incriminate Coens. So let us go and make him confess, said Daoud. He tried to hurt the little bird. Well said, Daoud. Emerson knocked out his pipe and rose. We don't know that he's guilty, Ramses insisted. Leave the questions to us, Daoud. Of course, said Daoud. After handing over the keys and tipping the custodian, they rode back between the rugged, sun-bleached cliffs to the road and took the turning that led to the workman's village. A word with you, Ramses, said Emerson. The others obediently fell back. Yes, sir, said Ramses. Um, did I sound patronizing? Yes, sir. Habit, my boy. Didn't intend to. That's all right, sir. It was more of an apology than he had counted upon, and perhaps more than he deserved. He added, I shouldn't have been so defensive. You are leaning over backward, to be fair. Wasn't... Coence, one of Nefret's swains, a few years ago. Yes, sir. Is this true? Damn it, father. Jealousy, said Emerson, takes people differently. I, for example, shout and threaten. It's the best method. Get it out of one's system. Women are... Uh, they don't think the way we do. My God, Ramses thought... I'm about to get that kindly lecture fathers are supposed to deliver before their sons marry. He's a little late. More than a little. I don't think I can stand it if he starts telling me how... I agree, sir, he said quickly. You, said his father, carefully not looking at him, try to be fair and reasonable. I don't recommend that approach. Your mother, for one, doesn't like it at all. Ramses was at a loss for words. After a moment, Emerson went on. Don't keep your thoughts to yourself. I never do, and neither does your mother. And so we, well, we thrash it out, you see, and that's all to the good. I expect you're right, sir. I appreciate your advice. Hmm, said Emerson, who was brick red with embarrassment. One more bit of advice, then. Don't always give the other fellow the benefit of the doubt. Your instincts are good enough, guides. What do you suggest? Instead of shaking hands with Coens, I should walk up to him and punch him in the face? Emerson grinned. It might not be such a bad idea. 
Well, that's all I wanted to say. He loosened the reins and urged his horse into a trot. Ramses followed more slowly. He'd been touched and amused by that exchange. It wasn't easy for Emerson to talk about personal matters, but when he did, he went straight to the point and hit the nail square on the head. Now all I have to do is follow his advice, Ramses thought. If I can. Had he been too inclined to give Coens the benefit of the doubt? The evidence was mounting up. Another point against Coens, which no one had mentioned, was the fact that he hadn't always been at the dig at times when most excavators would be working. Their opponent must be busy these days, trying to find Sethos, keeping track of their activities, guarding his find, if he wasn't there today. He was, though. He had a crew of ten or twelve men at work, and a good twenty square metres had been cleared since Ramses had last seen the site. He greeted them with his usual exuberance and shook the hands of everyone except Daoud, who folded his arms and fixed Coons with an intimidating frown. Emerson explained that Cyrus was looking for a site. "'What about you, Professor?' Coons asked. "'Possibly, possibly. We've decided to stay on in Luxor for a while.' Coons was full of suggestions. They included almost every site in Luxor, where the omissions significant— Damned if I know, Ramses thought, watching in growing distaste as Cohen slapped people on the back and emitted genial roars of laughter and finally turned the conversation from professional advice to general gossip. How was Miss Minton getting on with her story about tomb robbers? He owed her a dinner invitation, though he wouldn't be able to match her generosity. The Winter Palace was too expensive for a poor, hard-working archaeologist— the Vandergelts must excuse his failure to call on them, as courtesy demanded. He would come by one day soon, if he might. How was Mrs. Emerson? Had Nefret recovered from her shocking experience the other day? I feel responsibility, he explained to Emerson. No reason why you should, Emerson said, stroking his chin. The tomb you mentioned was empty anyhow, I believe. Except for broken pieces of Roman mummies. They looked as if someone had danced on them, Cohen said with another guffaw. Teeth and bones and scraps of linen. He turned abruptly. What are you doing? He shouted at one of the workmen, who was holding up an object that appeared to be a broken pot. I told you not to remove anything. Damn these people, they have to be watched every second. We are keeping you from your work. Emerson said. Time we were getting back anyhow. Time for tea? Another hearty laugh. You, English, must have your tea. I will see you soon again, I hope. Sure, said Cyrus. We'll have a little dinner party. You and Barton and Lansing and a few others. It will be an honor. Coens shook hands all round again and hastened back to his crew. They heard him shouting Arabic curses as they mounted and started off. Did he confess? Dowd asked, hopefully. No, Emerson said. But there were a few points of interest, eh, Ramses? Yes, sir. Roman mummies, disgusting objects, all in pieces, too. Yes, sir. Not the right place. Don't say yes, sir, again, he added. No, sir. Excuse me, Cyrus began. Later, Vandergeld, later. I'm anxious to get back. If Amelia isn't there, I will be forced to take steps. She was up to no good. She went looking for Sethos, Ramsay said. His father nodded. Do you suppose she found him? I wouldn't be at all surprised, Emerson said gloomily. Chapter 17 When Emerson burst into the sitting room and found me placidly drinking tea, his expressions of pleasure and relief took a predictable form. Well, what the devil have you been doing? Good afternoon to you too, I replied. Close the door, Emerson, and make sure there is no one lurking in the corridor. 
Cyrus kissed his wife and joined her on the settee. Ramses did not kiss his wife. However, he took the hand she extended and continued to hold it as he stood beside her. "'And how was your day?' I inquired. "'Speak up, Emerson. Perty is resting, but he'll be down soon, and so will Senia, and William may take it into his head to do more reading.' "'I beg,' said Emerson, slamming the door, "'that you will not provoke me, Peabody. "'You first. I presume you found the... Uh, "'You found him. You're looking particularly smug. Where is he?' "'It was really very clever of her,' Margaret said. "'The way she deduced where he'd gone. "'I don't give a damn where he was. "'I want to know where he is now,' said Emerson. "'At our house, locked up and guarded. "'By Jamil and Yusuf. "'Good God, Peabody! "'And Khadija. "'Oh, that's all right, then. "'Selim and Daud will be there by now. "'What did he tell you?' He maintained he does not know the identity of his rival or the location of the tomb. He lied, said Emerson, starting for the door. For pity's sake, Emerson, sit down. I told Khadija we would come round this evening. It's all arranged. Now tell me what you did this afternoon. Did you find the tomb and capture the villain? We are getting closer to a solution, I think, Ramses said over Emerson's growls. Father and I agree that Kuhn's is the most likely suspect. There are several circumstances. You needn't explain, I interrupted. I had come to the same conclusion. He must have had a confederate in Cairo. William Amherst? Emerson rolled his eyes in that way he has, and Ramsay said, Not necessarily. We haven't made out a timetable. Unless you have, Mother? I haven't got round to it yet. I believe you will find when you do that Kuntz could have been in Cairo on the significant dates. He maintains two residences, if they can be called that. It's a useful device, since people would assume that if he's not in one place, he's at the other. Whereas in reality, he could be somewhere else, on the train to Cairo, for instance. William has been behaving suspiciously, I said. Whether he's involved or not, said Ramses, somewhat impatiently. Kuntz is the man we must watch. "'You intend to follow him?' Nefret asked. "'It's the only way, Nefret,' Emerson said. "'With Daud and Selim, we should be able to keep him under surveillance, "'at least during the hours of the night. "'He's got to do something soon. "'The longer he waits, the greater the chance someone will find his prize, "'and the word has got about that we are engaged in a survey of the Western Valley sites.' "'Perhaps he will attack one of us,' I said, giving Catherine my cup. Don't get your hopes up, Peabody, Emerson said amiably. A cup of the genial beverage had refreshed him, and I knew he was looking forward to trailing Cohen's. Emerson loves disguises, though he's not very good at them. An attack on us would be futile, Emerson went on. Catherine, who'd been watching Cyrus anxiously, let out a sigh of relief. Emerson gave her a reassuring smile. He can't wipe out the lot of us. By descending on Luxor en masse, we have left him with only one viable alternative. He's got to clear that tomb before we find it. Christmas Eve, I murmured. Even Emerson, who ought to know me better, stared at me in surprise. Strangely enough, my son was the first to comprehend. Of course, he'll expect us to be absorbed with holiday merriment that night, decorating the tree and eating Fatima's plum pudding. Well done, mother. I heard voices outside, Senia's high bird-like chirps and Bertie's laughing responses. There is only one person who is in danger now, I said hurriedly. We must... Ah, Bertie, how are you feeling, dear boy? Naturally, I did not intend to wait until Christmas Eve to apprehend our suspect, nor did I believe it would be practical to follow Kuntz. He might not be our man after all, in which case the real culprit could go about his business unseen and undetected. A much easier method, one I had always favoured, was to make him come to us, or in this case, to Sethos. 
his attempts to track Sethos down and murder him strongly suggested that either A. Sethos did know where the tomb was located, and El Hakim, I preferred my nom de guerre to the anonymous X the others used, was aware of this, or B. Sethos did not know, but El Hakim believed he did. In either case, Kuntz, or whoever he was, would try to dispose of Sephos before he emptied the tomb. I explained this to Emerson while we were changing after tea. Hmm, said Emerson, aside from the fact that some might consider it callous to stake my... to stake him out like a goat for a tiger. It was his idea, so you say. Hurry and dress, we'd better get over there. He is in no danger as yet, I assured my husband. The gossip mills in Luxor work quickly, but not instantaneously, and no one, except the family, knows there is a stranger in the house. We will see to it that the word gets out tomorrow afternoon. That will give us time to arrange for protection. I don't like this, Emerson muttered, lacing his boots. It is an eminently logical, practical plan. All your plans are said Emerson, until they fall apart. I had thought Margaret would insist on accompanying us, but she didn't so much as ask. I had some trouble dissuading Cyrus, who was understandably curious about the man who had once taken his place, and even more with Senia, who declared she was bored and was only prevented from throwing a tantrum by Bertie, who requested another story and a lesson in hieroglyphs. In the end, the party consisted of Emerson and me, Ramses and Afret, just as I had planned. Emerson set the pace, which was rapid enough to make conversation difficult. At one point, when we were slowed by a heavily loaded camel, I said to Nefret, "'Touching, is it not, how concerned Emerson is for his brother? "'I wonder how they will greet one another.' "'So do I,' said Nefret. The men of the family were on the veranda, watching for us. "'Everyone here?' Emerson asked, counting heads. "'Selim, has Yusuf explained to you and Daoud?' "'I explained,' said Jamil, caressing his moustache. "'Where is Jumana?' Nefret asked. "'In her room, reading a book. "'We do not want women involved in men's business.' "'It's a pity he has to be involved,' Nefret said angrily. "'as we hastened down the corridor. "'I don't trust him to hold his tongue. "'We will let him loosen it tomorrow,' I said. "'By that time... "'Ah, Khadija, how is our guest?' "'I was about to take him food, said Hakim. "'You will stay and eat with us? There is plenty. "'Yes, thank you, after we've talked with him. "'The room, it had once been David's, "'was lit by the soft glow of oil lamps.' There was only one window, and the shutters, opening onto the courtyard, were closed and barred. Sethos had been lying down. The sheets were wrinkled, but he was on his feet when we entered. Shoulders braced and jaw tight. Khadija had cleaned him up, possibly by force. She wouldn't have tolerated such a filthy person in the house. His black head was bare. Emerson tried to enter first, but I slipped past him. Clenched fists and a dark skull are not evidences of brotherly concern. I took Sethos by the shoulders and pushed him back onto the bed. He was unable to offer much resistance. Lie down, I ordered. You are having another paroxysm, aren't you? Sethos looked at Emerson. Can't you stop her? No, said Emerson. Never could. Um, are you, um... Having another paroxysm, Sethos admitted. This one's not so bad. When did it start? Nefret asked. I reminded myself that she was the doctor and stepped away as she approached. She made a quick examination and asked a few more questions and then said, He's better. The first stage lasted less than an hour and the fever isn't as high. I'll stay with him tonight. No, you will not said Sethos, galvanized into speech. I refuse to go through another session with you and your Hippocratic oath. What the devil is this, a medical consultation or a council of war? 
or possibly a social gathering. Do sit down, all of you, and make yourselves comfortable. I'm sure Khadija will serve coffee. So much for the brotherly greetings, I thought. The atmosphere was marginally more cordial, however. Emerson's fists had unclenched, and Ramsay's was smiling. I'll keep Nefret away from you, he offered, if you tell us what we want to know. Yes, let's get down to business, said Emerson gruffly. No more beating about the bush. We believe Coens is the man we're after. We intend to follow him until he leads us to the tomb. There's a simpler way, Sethos said. Pass the word that I'm here. He thinks I know the location of the tomb. That's why he's been so hell-bent on killing me. Ha! I exclaimed. I thought so. Emerson gave me a forbidding scowl. Where is the damned tomb, then? I don't know. That, said Sethos, with a fair imitation of his infuriating smile, is what comes of having a reputation for omniscience. The master knows all, but I've wondered lately whether he has firmer grounds for his suspicions. He may not be the only one who knows the location. If the original finder was a local man, a man who once worked for me, old loyalties or higher bakshish, might induce him to seek me out. No such devoted former follower has approached you, I take it, Emerson said. There aren't that many of them left, and the Luxor lads are so bloody confused they run for cover at the very mention of the master. Then Kuntz, if it is Kuntz, has only three men on whom he can rely, Ramsay said. Yes, well, even if it's true, that's not such good news. You encountered one of them. The other two are almost as deadly. Khadija knocked and entered to announce that the meal was ready. Shall I bring his food here? she asked. Later, I said. He's not feeling well enough now. We'll be with you shortly, Khadija. Let's finish making our plans. Tomorrow we will allow the word to get out that there is a mysterious prisoner in the house. He will attack tomorrow night, or at the latest, the night following. We will be ready for him. Them, Sethos corrected. If he's determined to make an end of me, he won't come alone. And who the hell do you mean by we? The four of us and Daoud and Selim, I said. That should be sufficient. Not Margaret and the Vandergelds, Sethos demanded. His face was slick with perspiration. For the love of God, Radcliffe, you can't let her. Um, yes said Emerson. Leave it to me. The fever's breaking, I announced, wiping Sethos's brow with my kerchief. That's good. Rest now. You'll be perfectly safe tonight. It might be a good idea, though, just as a precaution, if you were armed. Take my pistol. I don't want your damned pistol, Sethos said violently. Shoot someone yourself. Radcliffe. Yes, yes, said Emerson. It'll be all right. He came toward the bed, his feet dragging, and stood looking down at his brother. Well, um, good night. You might at least say you're glad to see one another, I said with a sniff. I'm not glad to see him, Sethos declared. I never meant to see him again. Emerson's tight lips relaxed. That is probably the kindest thing you've ever said to me. He took Sethos's hand and shook it. Aduma, he said, in his execrable French accent. Dieu est donc, said Sethos. His accent was perfect. Men, I said. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. With a flourish, Nasir placed a plate of boiled eggs in front of Nefret. The plate was flat, and the eggs rolled wildly from side to side. One of them must have fallen off while he was carrying it up the stairs. It was cracked and leaking. Thank you, Nasir, Nefret said. Do you remember what I told you about egg cups? Nasir scuttled off, and Ramsay said, You forgot them on purpose. I refuse to eat the cracked one. No one expects you to, darling. She gave him a bright smile. It's a lovely day. 
They had had another argument the night before. Ramses had lost. The aftermath had been even better than usual, but he was still uneasy. So far, he said, I hate these complicated schemes of mothers. Something's bound to go wrong. No, it's not. And if it does, you can't blame her. We all agreed. Can you think of anything we overlooked? Well, sensing his mood, Nasir timidly proffered an egg cup rather in the manner of a supplicant offering to a notoriously temperamental god. Ramses took it and grunted a thank you. Mother and I, Nefret said patiently, will stand guard with Daoud while you and father and Selim climb all over the damned cliffs, looking for Alain's tomb of Roman mummies. I think father's theory about that is somewhat far-fetched, but never mind. In the meantime, Khadijah will make sure no one leaves the house until after midday, at which time Jamil will head straight for the nearest coffee shop, and Yusuf will tell everyone in Gurna, in strictest confidence. Jumana thinks she's helping Khadijah, and Jamil thinks he is mounting guard over a dangerous prisoner. What could go wrong there? If I knew, it wouldn't go wrong. He stood up and looked over the rail. Selim and Daoud have left the horses and gone on. Father wanted to get an early start, but we needn't rush. We're to meet them at Deir el Bahri, and you know Father. He'll be perfectly happy inspecting the Metropolitan's excavations and criticizing Mr. Lansing. You're determined to cheer me up, Ramses grumbled. You could very easily, if you would agree to stay at the castle tonight. Mubashir is a killer and a fret. Even Sethos has avoided him. I thought we'd settled that. She went to him and he turned, his back against the rail, and put his hands on her waist, enclosing the delicate bones and soft curves in the cage of his fingers. "'I love you,' he said. "'That's no excuse,' she laughed, and stood on tiptoe, face lifted. He was about to make the obvious response when the muscles under his hands went rigid, and her eyes widened. "'Good Lord, is that—' The person approaching the boat looked like an old woman, stooped and stumbling. By the time Ramses realized who it was, Nefret was racing down the stairs. When he caught her up, she had reached Jumana. The girl had fallen, but she was still conscious. She raised a face smeared with dried tears. Dust coated her long lashes. It was Jamil. He... The sense of vague apprehension that had bothered Ramses all morning coalesced into a tight knot. Nefret had removed Jumana's headcloth. The hair on her temple was clotted and stiff with blood. You must listen, Jumana gasped. Later. You can pick her up, Ramses. Nothing seems to be broken. The little body was as light as a child's and trembling with pain and fear but she kept trying to talk as he carried her to the saloon. He locked me in my room. I was not asleep. I heard the key turn, but I had another key. He had done it to me before, and when I opened the door, I saw him going to the stables, and I thought, he has disobeyed the Sid Hakim. He is going to the Dahabiya without me, and... ah, I'm sorry, Ramses said. He lowered her gently onto the divan. Is her leg broken? Just a sprained ankle, I think, Nefret said. Get me some water and a napkin. You must listen. I followed. I was angry. But he did not come here. He went to Naga El Tod, to the hotel. Coence, Ramses said, handing Nefret the dampened napkin. Yes, it was he. I saw them talk together, and I knew I must tell you. What has he done? Has he done wrong? Fresh tears slid over her dirty little face. Did Jamil hit you? Ramses asked. I'll strangle the young swine, he thought. No, I ran away, and I was afraid they had seen me, so I ran very fast, and I fell and hit my head, and I fainted, and... Get me my medical bag, Nefret said. No time. Ramses lifted the girl and went down the gangplank at a run, with Nefret following. Take the stallion, he said. He'll carry two. You can hold her, can't you? Yes, but you... If Jamil told Kuntz what we've planned for tonight, 
He may decide to act now. There's no one at the house but women and children, and poor old Yusuf. Nefret had scrambled into the saddle. Ramses handed Jumana up to her and began shortening the stirrups. Go straight to the castle. Don't let anyone or anything stop you. If they did catch a glimpse of her, they may come here. I understand. She gathered Jumana into a firm grip and smiled down at him. She did understand, not only what she must do and why, but how much it cost him to let her go off alone, encumbered with a half-conscious child. Events had conspired to force him into a decision he hadn't had the courage to make before. She was braver than he. She hadn't tried to dissuade him or told him to take care. All she said was, I'll join you at the house as soon as I can. Yes, Ramses said, and saw her blue eyes flash with pride. Send mother and father too if you can find them. I may need all the help I can get. Ramses mounted the mare without bothering to adjust the stirrups and urged her into a trot. It was impossible to go faster. There were too many people, donkeys, camels, carts, carriages on the road. He hoped and prayed he was worrying unnecessarily. But Jamil had deliberately disobeyed orders and gone straight to their chief suspect. They had never suspected Jamil. The members of that family were above suspicion, almost by definition, but the clues were there. Hadn't Jumana boasted of her brother's knowledge of the West Bank Mountains? Looking for tombs was a popular amusement. If Jamil had found the tomb, and Kuentz had caught him in the act, and had proposed an alliance. Once he left the main road, he made better time. How long had Jumana been unconscious before she woke and dragged herself with a sprained ankle and a possible concussion to warn them? She'd get her chance all right, and anything else she wanted, including Bertie. Yusuf's two youngest children were playing on the veranda. Ramses let out a long breath of relief. Nothing had happened, yet. He left the mare standing and took the children into the sitting room, where Yusuf was enthroned on the settee. Leaving Yusuf in the middle of one of his long-winded greetings, he ran along the corridor. Better safe than sorry, his mother would say. The older children and the women were in the courtyard, busy with domestic chores. He cut their greetings short, too. There may be trouble, he said, addressing Khadija. Get everyone into the sitting room and keep them there. She didn't waste time asking questions, not Khadija. Herding Yusuf's assorted wives and descendants ahead of her like a flock of bewildered sheep, she disappeared into the house. They came over the wall, agile as weasels. Three of them. Only one of the faces was familiar, and it wasn't that of Kuentz or Mubashir. Ramses had seen the man somewhere, on the street in Luxor or outside the hotel. The sight of him stopped them for a moment. They had expected only women and children. Then he realized that Khadija was behind him, silent and solid as a rock, holding a granite statue of a centaur by the neck, like a club. She had snatched up the first heavy object that came to hand. Go in, he said urgently. Stay with the children. Lock yourselves in. He pushed her into the house, slammed the door, and put his back against it. After a whispered conference, the three men drew apart, one on either side of the courtyard, the other in the centre. Rudimentary tactics, but effective, considering the odds. One was as dark-skinned as a Nubian. The other two had the sharp features and long limbs of the western desert peoples. Their robes had been pulled up and tucked into their belts, and the blades of the knives they held were a good eight inches long. He drew his own knife. The shutters of the room on his right opened, and his uncle climbed out the window. He had discarded his galabilla and was wearing only a pair of loose drawers, probably Yusuf's, since they were bunched up round his narrow waist. Get back inside, Ramses ordered. Can't let them in the house, can we? I don't suppose you had sense enough to accept that gun. You gave it to Nefret, not me. Where did you get the knife? Khadija. Here they come. You weren't planning to fight fair, I hope. No. We'll take the one on the right. 
That would put him between Sethos and the other two. He wasn't counting on much help from his uncle, whose lean body showed the debilitating effects of his illness, but he felt his spirits lift. Fighting side by side with a man of his own blood, as his mother might put it. On the whole, a stranger with a pair of revolvers would have been preferable. Now, he said, Faced with two opponents heading for him at a dead run, their quarry hesitated for a brief but vital second. Sethos slashed at his face. Ramses struck his arm up and plunged his own knife into the man's belly. Spurting blood weakened his grasp on the hilt, and when the man fell, his weight pulled the knife out of Ramses' hand. He felt the tip of a blade slice across his back as he bent over, trying to free his knife. It was stuck, caught on a rib, and the hilt was slippery with blood. He snatched up the knife the dead man had dropped, rolled to his feet and kicked out, deflecting the blade that was aimed at Sethos's back. Sethos was on his knees, streaming blood from hands and face. Ramses patted a slash at his knife hand and chopped at an arm with the flat of his other hand. The explosion sounded like a charge of dynamite, freezing all four of them for an instant. Christ almighty, Ramses thought. It must have been that antique martini of Yusuf's. I hope it didn't blow up in his hands. He stood over his uncle, trying to watch both men at once. They had got over their momentary paralysis and were coming at him again from different directions. Ramses' ears were still ringing, but he thought he heard... The back gate gave way with a crash almost as loud as that of the gun. Hands on his hips, black hair wildly wind-blown, Emerson took in the scene in a single glance, his lips curled back, baring his teeth. It was over in less than ten seconds. One of the two men was sprawled on the ground, with his neck bent at an impossible angle. Emerson had hit him in the throat. The other writhed in Ramsey's grasp, his arm twisted painfully behind his back. Thank you, Father, Ramsey said. Again, just saving you a little time, said Emerson, with what his son could only regard as a wildly optimistic assessment of the situation. He wasn't even breathing hard. Um, all right, are you? It was his usual question, but Ramsey's knew it was not directed at him. Sethos, now sitting up, raised his head. Just a few scratches, nothing serious. Flesh wounds. You aren't very good with a knife, Ramses said. He didn't want thanks, and he was pretty sure he was not going to get any. His uncle's blood-streaked face broadened in a grin. I've always preferred to hire other people to do the fighting. Except on certain occasions, said Emerson. I still have a scar. Well, well, shall we tie that fellow up or kill him? We might want to ask him a few questions before we kill him, Ramses remarked dryly. Only one of my little jokes, Emerson said with a chuckle. He lifted the prisoner with one hand and held him on tiptoe. Where is your master? Answers to his questions were quickly forthcoming, but not as informative as they had hoped. The master had had other urgent business that morning, no, he had not explained what it was. He had sent the trio to rid him of Sethos, and was to have met them later to settle their accounts before he left Luxor. Now, the prisoner admitted with refreshing candour, he would as soon not keep that appointment. The master did not accept excuses or tolerate failure. He may be telling the truth, Emerson mused. These lads are killers and criminals. Coons wouldn't tell them anything more than they needed to know. Damnation! He's probably looting the tomb at this very instant. We'll tie this fellow up and toss him into a shed. Khadija! It had been Khadija who fired the gun. The recoil would have broken the shoulder of a normal person. Khadija admitted that hers felt a little sore. The others arrived before long, and while his mother was sorting things out in her usual brisk manner, Ramses asked... Didn't Nefret come with you? His mother was slapping bandages on Sethos. He'd been lucky, or very, very agile. None of the cuts were deep. 
She felt obliged to stay with Jumana. The poor little thing had lost consciousness, and Nefret is afraid of concussion. But do you run along, my dear? She'll be worrying about you. We can take care of Mr. Cohen's and the tomb. Ramses knew she would be worrying, and he was anxious to reassure her. But his mother's bland self-confidence was somewhat alarming. It was possible, probable in fact, that Cohen's was already at work, frantically trying to clear the tomb, hoping his other men could keep them occupied. Cohen's won't be alone, he warned. The more the merrier, said his father, flexing his hands. He may be armed. So are we, said his mother. The implements hanging from her belt jangled as she stood up. He couldn't leave Nefret wondering and fretting. He'd done it too often. Wait half an hour, he said urgently. I'll meet you at Deir el Bahri. No, no, my boy, Emerson said. He'll be in a hurry. He may damage some of the artifacts. His eyes were shining. If there was anything he enjoyed more than a fight, it was a new find. He fully expected to get both. I'll come as soon as I can, Ramsay said. His mother's peremptory voice followed him as he hurried along the corridor. Ramses, come back here this instant. You need... The mare was where he had left her, browsing on the petunias and the flower boxes. He hadn't gone far when he heard hoofbeats behind him and glanced over his shoulder. He reined the mare in and waited for the other man to come up to him. Why didn't you go with them? With luck, you could have rescued mother again. Sethos shook his head. She'd have ended up rescuing me. In either case, Radcliffe wouldn't like it. I stole his horse. That should slow them down a bit. Ramses knew that if he asked any of the questions that bubbled in his brain, they'd end up in one of those interminable discussions. It was a family failing. Without replying, he set the mare to a gallop. Sethos wasn't much good with a knife, but he rode well, guiding the big gelding with expert hands. God help Margaret, Ramses thought. When she sees him romantically bloody and bandaged, is that what he wants? What does he want? Why didn't he stay at the house? The gates of the castle were open when they arrived, and Cyrus was in the courtyard, about to mount his placid mare. Well, thank goodness, he exclaimed. Everybody all right? Is this... Mr. Cyrus Vandergelt? Allow me to introduce Sethos, Ramsay said, alias quite a number of other people. Including me, said Cyrus, his leathery cheeks wrinkling in a smile. Come on in. You look as if you could use a drink. I can't stay, Ramsay said. I only stopped long enough to tell Nefret. Where is she? She left. Can't have been more than half an hour ago. Maybe less. The little girl's going to be fine, so Nefret and Miss Mitten went charging out of here, heading for the house. They wouldn't wait for me. His smile faded. You didn't run into them? No. Ramses turned on his uncle. You expected this. I was afraid of it. Your wife's impulsive habits are well known. And if Coens could get hold of a hostage, he'd have us right where he wants us. He's obviously got more manpower than we thought. One of them must have been watching the Dehabir. Ramsay snatched the mare's reins from the groom and swung himself into the saddle. Tight-lipped and no longer loquacious, his uncle mounted the gelding. Wait for me, Cyrus shouted. No, you can't help with this. If you want action, go after mother and father. Somewhere along the cliff south of Deir al-Bahri. Take a weapon. As he turned the mare toward the gate he saw Cyrus run back into the house. Are we going to ride furiously off into the sunset? Or have you any bright ideas about where to look for them? Sethos inquired. God damn you, Ramses said. I expect he already has. Half an hour or less. They must have been intercepted before they left the valley. Plenty of cover near the entrance. There may be signs of a struggle. What there was was a dead horse and the motionless body of Margaret Minton, and a puddle of blood that shone wetly in the sunlight. The place was only ten feet from the road, a miniature wadi walled in by boulders. There was no sign of Nefret or her horse. Sethos was out of his saddle before Ramses could move. 
Kneeling beside the body, he said, Margaret, in a whisper, with almost no breath behind it. He didn't touch her. There was no room in Ramsay's mind for sympathy. He went to them and pushed his uncle roughly out of the way. She's not dead. Get the canteen off my saddle. She stirred when he bathed her bruised face, and then she tried to sit up. Easy, Ramsay said, bracing her shoulders. Her eyes opened. They passed uninterestedly over him and Sethos, and focused in a concentrated glare. Nefret, he took her. I tried. He killed my horse. Who? She rubbed her eyes. The boy, Jamil. He called her, begging for help, and she went to him. You know, Nefret, there was another man hiding behind the rocks, ugly, scarred face. He cut her short. How the business had been managed was unimportant now. Any idea where they might have taken her? No. I'm sorry, Ramses. I tried. It's all right. He couldn't reproach her. She'd done her best. Fortunately, there was another scapegoat close at hand. Sethos was still on his knees, motionless as a statue. A hell of a lot of help you are, Ramses said. Get her back to the castle. Sethos edged closer. What are you going to do? I can only think of one place. If she's not there... He pushed Margaret at Sethos. He had to catch hold of her or let her fall. But it would have been hard to say who was supporting whom. Shock and loss of blood had drained the colour from Sethos's unshaven face. Margaret glared at him. Go with Ramses. He needs... No, he doesn't, Sethos said. He looked up at Ramses. The grey-green eyes were sunken but clear. I'd only be in his way. Kuntz didn't blow up the German house. I did. You can guess why. Good luck. The war office had nothing on Sethos when it came to dribbling out information only as it was needed. That bit of news strengthened Ramsey's hopes. Kuntz had been using the German house as his base for antiquities dealing, and perhaps for other purposes. He couldn't have many hideaways left. Anyhow... Secrecy was no longer an issue. With Nefret in his hands, he could clear the tomb in broad daylight while they looked on, helpless to interfere. How had they got her away? She'd have fought them tooth and nail. Maybe the blood wasn't hers. Dead, she would be of no use to Coens. Mubashir wouldn't dare kill her. He could do other things, though. Remembering the distorted face he had glimpsed in the moonlight, Ramses felt his throat contract. He couldn't swallow. His mouth was too dry. At least he knew he was on the right track, forcing himself to stop long enough to question a woman working in the fields. He heard of a rider carrying something before him on the saddle. He had been heading for the river. The rundown hotel appeared to be uninhabited. A few scrawny chickens scattered, flapping their wings and squawking as he rode into the courtyard. The place had a dishevelled sort of charm, picturesque, as Baedeker might say, with vines sprawling over the baked mud walls and partially veiling the famous bathtub. Apparently the chickens were the only creatures that hadn't had sense enough to run from a man with a knife and a prisoner. Ramses dismounted and forced himself to stand still while he got his breathing back to normal and considered his next move. He was unfamiliar with the layout of the hotel, the back of his hand was still bleeding. He wiped it on his shirt and eased his knife out of the sheath. He'd got most of the blood off, but he couldn't risk it sticking. Half a second might make all the difference. The vines along the wall rustled. Ramsay spun round and saw a face, wide-eyed with terror, peering out from among the leaves. It was the proprietor, Hussein Ali. Ramses dragged him out by the collar and broke into his protestations of ignorance and innocence. Where are they? Which room? He threatened me with his long knife. How was I to know he had offended the great and powerful... Which room? It was at the back, the best room in the hotel, Hussein Ali explained. A suite, in fact. Two adjoining rooms, one for sleeping, the other... 
obviously not for bathing. Ramses left him salaming and explaining and went to the door. It had once been quite beautiful, painted with bright designs like so many of the doors of Gurner houses, before time and neglect had taken their toll. It stood ajar. There was no point in reconnoitering. He knew what places like this were like. The windows at the back would be high and narrow to keep thieves out. The Syrian must know he was here. He hadn't bothered to lower his voice, and Hussein Ali had yelled even louder. He kicked the door back against the wall. No one there. The doors lining the narrow hallway were closed, except for one at the far end. The need to see her, to know she was alive, was so strong, it pulled him like a cable straight down the hall to the open door. Sunlight streamed in through the windows, high under the eaves. It shone on her hair. She was lying on the filthy divan, her feet and hands bound. Her eyes were open, blue as cornflowers, and limpid with relief. She had been afraid for him. Mubashir sat beside her. "'Welcome, brother of demons,' he said. "'Come in and drop your knife.' His own blade rested on her cheek. "'I cannot imagine how I could have been so careless "'as to let both of them get away from me. "'I hadn't seen the blood on the back of Ramsay's shirt till he turned, "'but he pretended not to hear my call. "'When we found Sethos had slipped away too, "'and that he had taken Emerson's gelding, "'my indignation could not be restrained. "'The foolish man is in no condition to ride,' I exclaimed, "'and if he were, he ought to have come with us "'and offered what assistance he can, "'after all we did for him.' "'Get me a horse,' said Emerson, as single-minded as Richard III. "'Perhaps we don't require further assistance,' I conceded, as Selim ran toward the stable. "'Selim and Dawood and you and I should suffice. "'Supposing we find him, that is. "'We have disposed of three of his followers. "'He can't have many left.' "'The devil with the horses,' said Emerson, who obviously had not heard a word I said. "'We may as well go on foot.' "'Go where?' I demanded. "'You don't know the precise location.' "'Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin. "'It has to be somewhere between Deir el-Bakhri and Deir el-Medina, "'probably less than a hundred yards beyond the place where the accident occurred. "'Kuhns was afraid they might notice something if they went any farther. "'It's less than half a mile as the crow flies. "'We are not crows, and it's all up and downhill for... "'Pity's sake, Emerson, use your head. "'Ramsay said he would meet us at Deir el Bahri. "'If we start there and follow the cliff south... "'Then where is my damned horse?' Emerson demanded. "'Sell him! Here, father of curses!' "'Emerson's jaw dropped, and Selim, anticipating his protest, "'explained defensively, "'There are no others.' "'He was leading Yusuf's fat mare. "'I can't ride that!' If she can carry Yusuf, she can bear your weight, I remarked. It was all to the good, really. Gripped by intense archaeological fever, Emerson would have outstripped the rest of us had he been properly mounted. Before he could propose a change of horses, I ordered Selim and Dao to follow me. It took Emerson a while to catch us up, though I expect the mare, encouraged by Emerson's pleas and curses, hadn't moved so quickly in years. We went on at as rapid a pace as the placid beast could manage. Even in the extremity of passion, Emerson would never mistreat an animal, but he was livid with annoyance when we reached Deir el-Bahri, and he started up the path toward the cliff without waiting for the rest of us. Ramses was not there. It hadn't been very long since he left, I told myself. Nevertheless, I felt a faint quiver of uneasiness. Our best-laid plans had already gone agley, to quote Mr. Burns. Had some other unforeseen catastrophe occurred? Vague forebodings should not be a guide to action, I reminded myself. Ramses would come when he was able, and he was aware of the path we meant to follow. My first duty was to my impetuous spouse. We left the horses with one of the gaffiers and hastened after him. I had to stop occasionally to catch my breath for it was all uphill and over rocky terrain. The hour was still early, but the shadows were shortening, and the morning chill had left the air. I had braced myself for a long, exhausting walk, 
or climb, rather, with no promise of success at the end of it. But soon after we had passed the spot where the body had fallen, I heard voices and the sounds of activity ahead. Hurry! I cried, for one of the voices had been Emerson's, raised in a vehement curse. Scrambling over loose scree, we made our way round a rocky spur and stopped, thunderstruck at what we beheld. It was no wonder Coons had been reluctant to open the tomb. The place was within a few hundred yards of the busy bay of Deir el-Bahri, and only a short distance from one of the paths that crossed this part of the Jebel. It lay in a shallow declivity from where Coons stood. His rifle aimed at Emerson. He was protected on three sides. Behind him, Half a dozen men were at work, furiously digging away a heap of stony debris. We had indeed underestimated his manpower. We had also been wrong about the location of the tomb. It was not high in the cliff, but at its base, like the royal cache. I was too short of breath to speak, so Emerson got in first. Go back, Peabody. I'm afraid I cannot allow that. Cohen said jovially. Come ahead, Mrs. Emerson, and stand by your husband. Dowd and sell him, too. Dowd looked hopefully at me. I took hold of his arm. We must do as he says, Dowd. He would kill Emerson first. Ah, uh, Dowd nodded sagely. It is true. You will make a plan, Sit, and tell us what to do. I sincerely hoped I could. At the moment, nothing occurred to me. You may as well make yourselves comfortable, Coons remarked as we joined Emerson. This will take a while. Sit down. Seated, we presented less of a threat. I was afraid I would have to lecture Emerson about the advisability of obeying the orders of a man with a rifle. But he had got over his annoyance and was watching Coons with a cold calculation. Shakespeare notwithstanding... A lean and hungry-looking villain is no more dangerous than one who laughs too much. Coons's broad smile and easy stance aroused the direst of forebodings. The brown hair that covered his hands and forearms and showed at the neckline of his shirt gave him the look of a loup-garou halfway through the transformation. "'You cannot hope to succeed in this endeavour, Mr. Coons,' I said. "'Reinforcements are on the way.' Your rival lives, and the three men you sent to murder him are dead or prisoners. He was not as cool as he pretended. His smile lengthened into a snarl, and the barrel of the rifle shifted toward me. Then he shrugged. You are probably lying. Even if you are not, it is of no consequence. Your reinforcements, if they exist, wouldn't dare attack while I hold you at gunpoint. No doubt, but how long can you do that? I asked. Clearing an entire tomb will take... Tomb? Coons let out a guffaw. You are in for a surprise, my friends. Not a tomb? What is it then? I asked. Emerson gave me a sour look. He was also burning with curiosity, but he was too proud to ask questions. Speculate, Coons chuckled. It will help to pass the time. Be quiet, Peabody, Emerson growled. Don't give him the satisfaction. So we sat in silence. The temperature rose as the sun did the same, and the surface under me was hard as stone and lumpy with pebbles. The ambience was not conducive to ratiocination, but I do not allow physical discomfort to distract me. I had been correct in believing that the body, the most recent body, I should say, was that of an innocent bystander whom Cubans had cold-bloodedly murdered when the poor fellow came upon him while he was levering out a section of rock. Emerson's original theory had been incorrect, though I doubted he would ever admit it. He had suspected the great find lay concealed behind the nasty bits of mummy. Nonsense, of course. Coons must have known that a minor inconvenience of that sort wouldn't prevent us from investigating. That there was such a tomb of Roman mummies seemed probable. Coons would not have admitted its existence had that fact not been generally known. 
Putting aside these now irrelevant facts and my raging curiosity about Coons's discovery, I considered various options. There were not many. Ramses and Nefret would walk into the same trap, since we couldn't warn them. Coons could not let us go. Most probably he would force us to enter the hole in the ground once he had emptied it of its contents. What the devil could they be? And shovel the debris back into place, sealing the entrance. I was about to ask our jolly adversary whether I might drink from my canteen when I heard the rattle of rock. Someone was coming. Surely not Ramses. He never moved so clumsily. Unless his injuries had been more severe than I believed them to be. Emerson let out a muffled swear word when Cyrus came into view, puffing and sweating, and I beheld with considerable alarm, with a rifle slung over his shoulder. "'Don't shoot, Cyrus!' I shrieked. "'He has the drop on us!' "'I had never admired my old friend more. "'A single glance informed him of the futility of resistance "'and the danger of failing to respond instantly to my order. "'He let the gun slip to the ground and raised his hands. "'Coentz let out another of those infuriating guffaws. "'So this is your reinforcement. "'You are a sensible man, Mr. Vandergelt. "'Go and sit by the others. "'We are getting to be quite a nice little party.' "'Cyrus dropped heavily to the ground "'and passed his sleeve across his wet face. "'Guess I better not risk reaching for a handkerchief,' "'he remarked coolly. "'What's going on?' "'He says it isn't a tomb, Cyrus.' Well, right now I couldn't care less. But his eyes moved past Coens to the back of the little bay. We could see the opening now, black against the pallor of the rock. How deep was the shaft, and how much longer would it take to empty it? One of the diggers called out. I could not make out the words, but Coens's response made the question clear. Come in, wait! He wasn't laughing now. His eyes moved over us one by one. We are within seconds of death, I thought. As it turned out, I was wrong. Seeing my hand move toward my pocket, Cohen said, Don't be foolish, Mrs. Emerson. There is an alternative to violence on either side. I have a card up my sleeve, you see. Nefret. Emerson went rigid. What do you mean? Mubashir is holding her prisoner. You've heard of him, I expect. A very unpleasant man. If anyone except myself approaches, he will kill her. I would hate to have that happen. You're bluffing, I said. My little scheme may not have succeeded, Cohen admitted. But if it did, the charming lady is now with one of the most accomplished killers in Egypt. Are you willing to take the chance? Discuss it among yourselves, he added, grinning like an ape. But don't move. He backed slowly away. The little bay was not deep. He could keep us in his sights even when he was at its far end. Let me kill him, Sit, Daoud begged. He would kill you first, I said, watching Coons. Wait, Cyrus, where is Ramses? I don't know. Cyrus's face was grim. He's not bluffing, Amelia. I was on my way here when I met Margaret and your old pal Sethos coming back to the castle. That young devil Jamiel helped ambush the ladies. The other fella knocked Margaret unconscious and carried Nefred off. Ramses has gone after them. Alone? I gasped. Sethos wasn't in any condition to help him, Cyrus said heavily. He fell out of the saddle as soon as we got to the castle. Anyhow, if she's where Ramses thinks she is, he'll have to sneak into the place and pull some cute stunt to get to her without being spotted. If she's not there... Well, folks, there's only one alternative that I can see. Quite, I agreed. We must capture Coens alive. Alive, Daoud, did you hear? And force him to tell us where she is. How shall we go about it? I have my knife and my pistol. 
And Dowd and Selim are armed, and there is Cyrus's rifle, and... Emerson hadn't spoken. His broad forehead was furrowed. His eyes glittered like sapphires. Control yourself, Peabody, he said, in the purring voice that betokened the wrath of the father of curses. To quote Dowd, let me talk to the bastard. He rose slowly to his feet, hands spread and empty. Coerns, he shouted. The risk of movement was not as great as it seemed. Our vile opponent knew that a fusillade of gunfire would draw attention. And if he killed one of us, the others, especially Dawood, would run amok. Coerns came back to the mouth of a bay. Don't try anything, Professor. Just stretching a bit, said Emerson, suiting the action to the words. The cards are all in your hands, to continue your unimaginative metaphor. You will release Nefret after you've got your prize safely away. Of course, I bear her no ill will. I loved her once, you know. Then the sooner your aim is accomplished, the sooner we will have her back. Emerson said. How can we help you? A rather disingenuous offer, Professor, Cohen said. Your life is dearer to me than my own at this moment, Emerson assured him. You are the only one who can save her from the Syrian. True, Cohen stroked his beard. I am tempted to let you have a look. It's a sight you have never seen and will never see again. And you are among the few who can appreciate it. I will let Selim and Daud help my workmen finish clearing the shaft. Then you can go down, one by one, before I have it out. Agreed, Emerson said. Coence made me unfasten my belt of tools and told Cyrus and me to remove our coats before he let us proceed in single file. Daud and Selim first. The workmen stopped and stared when we entered the bay. Quickly, I assessed them. They were local men, some of whom had worked for us at various times, and I had the distinct impression that they were not at all happy. Kuntz had hired them for what appeared to be an ordinary excavation, but when he pointed a gun at the father of curses and the Sita Kim, the unfortunate fellows realized something unpleasant was about to happen. I knew we could not expect help from them, however. If they got the chance, they would run like rabbits, and none of them was courageous enough to attack an armed man. Coens ordered Cyrus and Emerson and me to stand against the rock face and took up a position far enough away so that even Emerson could not have reached him in a single bound. All right, Selim, he said. Get to work. One false move and I fire. Selim's tight lips parted. I obey the father of curses. We will clear the shaft for him. Come, Daud. Yes, get out of my way, Daud added, pushing assorted Gurnawis back from the opening. There was not much left to do. They must have started work before daylight, and the shaft wasn't deep. I could see the top of Daud's head when he stood at the bottom. Lying flat on the ground beside the opening, Selim shone his torch down, while Daoud filled one basket after another and handed them up. It took two of the workers to lift the basket he had raised with one hand. It is open, his voice echoed up the shaft. There is a chamber beyond. Come up, Coens ordered. His face was aglow, and for a moment I saw the ardent young scholar he had been, before he was corrupted by greed and, as I was beginning to suspect, something else. Ladies first, eh, Mrs. Emerson? Daud, lower her down. The rest of you stand still. Emerson mumbled a protest, but wild horses could not have kept me away. As he had done so often before, Daud took my wrists in his big hands and let me down slowly and carefully, till my feet rested on the rough stone that floored the shaft. The opening at the bottom on the right side was less than five feet high. I could see nothing of what lay beyond. 
Mr. Coons, I require a source of illumination, I called. You made me discard my torch. Yes, to be sure. Sell him, give her yours. Daoud handed it down. I had to bend over to traverse the short passage. When it ended, I rose cautiously to my feet. It was not a tomb. It was a shrine. Against the far wall, wrapped in folds of time-browned linen, stood the god. The light of the torch reflected in the subtle golden curves of the face. Eyes inlaid with crystal and obsidian returned my unbelieving stare with calm indifference. He was crowned with twin plumes of gold, and lapis lazuli outlined his brows, and at his feet lay a tumble of golden vessels containing the dried remains of his last offering. Amun Re, ruler of Karnak, king of the gods, lord of the silent. Chapter 18. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. It is difficult to think clearly when you are hanging head down across a surface that is in jarring motion with a rough cloth covering your face. Nefret made the mistake of trying to struggle. She knew it was a mistake even before her head was seized and slammed against a hard object. When she came back to consciousness the second time, she was still dangling head down, still muffled in fabric from head to foot. Not a horse this time, a man's shoulder. After a few steps, he lowered her onto a lumpy surface that smelled of mildew and unwound the cloth. She had no idea where she was, but she recognized her captor from Sethos's description. His mouth drew up in a grotesque smile, distorted by the scars that had slit his cheeks. The smile and the hand that stroked the hair away from her face made her skin crawl. Lie still, he said softly. I will come back. He went out the door, leaving it open. Her wrists and ankles were tied, and a gag covered her mouth. She began twisting her hands, trying to loosen the ropes as Ramses had taught her. Please let him be alive, she prayed. God, Allah, Amun Re who hears the words of the silent, anyone, please. Remembered images flashed through her mind, recapitulating the events that had led up to the disaster. Jumana's dead weight numbing her arm, the horrified faces of the family when she rode into the courtyard, Emerson snatching the girl from her, her mother-in-law's crisp orders, watching them ride off, knowing she couldn't leave until she was sure Jumana didn't need her. Margaret Minton's fixed white face. Margaret understood the danger, but she didn't feel the sickening terror that had seized Nefret. She knew what it meant. She had felt it before. The knowledge, inexplicable but sure as sight, that he was at that very moment in deadly peril. As soon as she was at ease about Jumana, she had left the castle, driven by the need to go to him, unable to wait another moment. She had eluded Cyrus, but not Margaret. They had been together when Jamil appeared from behind a pile of rocks, waving and calling piteously for help. His galabia was ripped off one shoulder, and there was blood on his face. She only hesitated for a moment. They might have been wrong about the boy. He might have had an innocent reason for seeking Cohen's out. 
or he might have failed to realise how dangerous his ally was. If he had tried to remonstrate or had threatened to confess... It was not blood on Jamil's face, only dirt. But by the time she realised that, it was too late. She managed to draw her pistol and heard Jamil yowl as she fired, blindly. But the other man, the man with the scars, struck it out of her hand and took her by the throat. She couldn't scream for help. She couldn't see Margaret or the horses or, in the end, anything but blackness. What had happened to Margaret? She raised her head and looked around the room. It had a pathetic, faded look, as if someone had been trying to imitate the ambience of a proper hotel without the money or the knowledge to do it right. Worn matting on the floor, tattered curtains at the window, a set of chipped, soiled bathroom utensils, and slung carelessly over the back of a chair, a man's shirt, a European shirt. The pieces weren't hard to put together. It was Alain, then. She had liked him. She had hoped they were wrong. He had killed at least three people, and Ramses had gone alone to face him and his accomplices, and Margaret might be dead, and the ropes weren't any looser. Please, God! Mubashir came back carrying a bottle of water and a glass smeared with greasy fingerprints. He sat down beside her, too close, his hip against her thigh, and in spite of herself she cringed away. He smiled again. Are you afraid? I could hurt you. I would like to. But my master has said not. Unless someone comes looking for you. You are hoping it will be your husband, yes? You should hope he will not come. I have heard of the brother of demons, but he cannot get the better of me. His fingers fumbled at her face, pulling the gag down. Do you want water? The master said you could have it. And food, if you wish. No. She was dry-mouthed with fear, and her throat hurt. But she couldn't bear the thought of his arm raising her, the filthy glass against her lips. Untie me. The ropes are too tight. The master said not to hurt me. Ah, but then I would have to hurt you. Because you would try to get away. His calloused finger stroked her cheek. You fought hard for a woman. I like that. Do you want the water? Nefret shook her head. If you change your mind, you will have to ask, he said, with another of his grotesque smiles. He filled the glass and drank, and then he began talking. Stories of all the men he had killed and how he had killed them, in loving detail. He doesn't realize he's speaking to a woman who has probably disemboweled more people than he has, Nefret thought. A lot more neatly, though. She would have to persuade him to untie her feet, at least. Knees up while he was bending over her, catching him under his chin, hoping she had strength enough to knock him out or even down, then a dash for the door. Had he left it open in order to tantalize her with a glimpse of freedom? He must be safe, she told herself. I always know when he isn't. The agonizing irrational terror had faded, but cold reason told her there was more than sufficient cause for worry. He wouldn't rest until he had found her, and she did not doubt he would, some way, somehow. But what could he or anyone else do? The hateful voice droned on. The sunlight paled. It was midday or later. She would have to beg. She hated the idea, but she had to do it soon, before her legs were too numb to function. Then she heard the hoofbeats. That was why the door had been left open. The Syrian was taking no chances on being caught by surprise. She knew who it was even before she heard his voice. He had come alone, hadn't even tried to conceal his presence. She tugged at the ropes binding her wrists, and the Syrian grinned at her and drew his knife. Ramses stopped in the doorway, his feet slightly apart, his own knife held low and loose. When he saw her, some of the colour came back to his face, and he let out a long, controlled breath. "'I'm all right,' she said. The blade of the Syrian's knife was cold against the skin. "'Yes,' his mouth softened into a smile. 
Marhaba, brother of demons, Mubashir said. Come in and drop your knife, or I will cut her face open before I kill you. Ramses glanced at his weapon and tossed it carelessly away. It struck the floor, point down and quivering, ten feet from him. Are the odds more to your liking now? he asked. Or do you only fight with women? The arrogant challenge had the desired effect. The Syrian's nostrils flared. He leaped up and lunged. Later, when Nefret tried to describe the encounter to a fascinated audience, she failed. They were both so quick, the Syrian's bulky body almost as agile as her husband's taller, slimmer frame. Ramses moved with the efficiency of a machine and the grace of a cat, twisting and dodging and turning so that time after time the long blade slipped past his body or left only a superficial cut, using his hands and knees for defence since attack was impossible. He kept retreating, but gradually he manoeuvred the heavier man around until he was between him and Nefret. Both were breathing quickly, but Mubashir was livid with mounting fury. He hadn't expected any trouble with an unarmed opponent. Stand there and fight, he shouted, adding an unprintable epithet. Ramses planted his feet. Both hands locked round the other man's wrist, halting the descent of the knife inches from his face. For an instant they stood braced in matching strength. There was a blur of movement so fast she couldn't make it out. Ramsey's left hand lost its grip, and he dropped to one knee, ducking his head to avoid the wild swing of the Syrian's fist. Then Nefret understood that every move, even the last, had been part of a deliberate and desperate plan, calculated as precisely as the steps of an intricate dance. Ramsey's free hand closed over the hilt of the knife that stood upright and ready, as he had placed it. His long arms swung under and up and around in a close, deadly embrace, and the blade entered Mubashir's back under the left shoulder blade. The wound was not mortal, the penetration not deep enough to kill. The Syrian jerked away, breaking Ramses' hold, and Ramses, on his feet, lashed out with his fist. The Syrian's blade slashed his sleeve from shoulder to elbow, but the blow landed square on Mubashir's face, toppling him over backward. The impact and the man's own weight plunged the knife home. Ramsay stood staring down at the twitching body. Second time today, he said obscurely, and stooped to take the Syrian's knife from his lax hand. Knowing that the slightest sound or movement might break his concentration, Nefret had forced herself to remain mute and rigid. Now that it was over, she was too short of breath to speak. As he came toward her, she turned, offering her bound wrists. He cut the ropes, and then he caught her to him in a grip that made her ribs ache. She lay still, content to be in his arms, to feel under her cheek the rapid beat of his heart. It was some time before it slowed to normal, and he relaxed his hold. Sorry, Nefret said, trying to speak steadily. I was careless. Pure bad luck. Happens to me all the time, he added, with a smile that faded into a frown of concern as his eyes examined her. Did he hurt you? There's blood on your dress. It's your blood. The sleeves and breast of his shirt were slashed into strips and stained red from a dozen cuts. She couldn't control her voice any longer. Tell me again that you're a coward. What? Oh, but... No one else could have done it. Not even father. I've never seen anything so... So wonderful and so brave and so... So breathtaking. I was absolutely terrified. So was I. Don't look at me like that or I'll lose what's left of my wits and kiss you and... And this isn't an appropriate venue. I can't walk when my feet are tied, she pointed out. Is Margaret safe? And Sethos? Yes, but God knows what the rest of them have got themselves into by now. He freed her ankles, but when she started to stand, he picked her up and carried her toward the door, stepping unconcernedly over the fallen man's sprawled legs. 
the Syrian looked as formidable in death as he had in life. His eyes were open and staring, his scarred face distorted in a snarl. My beloved coward, she said softly. It was unbelievable, preposterous, incredible. No cult statue had ever been found, in situ or anywhere else. And this one had to have come from one of the great temples. Seated, it was over three feet high, and it appeared to be of solid gold, as were the vessels scattered at its feet. No wonder Coons hadn't dared to remove them. The appearance of such objects on the market would have started alarm bells ringing throughout the scholarly world. Nor could he move the statue until he was ready to take it away, out of Egypt, and to a buyer who had already agreed to pay extravagantly for it. But do not suppose, reader, that the stupendous sight distracted me for more than a few seconds. I would have exchanged the statue and everything else in the small shrine for Nefret or any of those dear to me. When I turned away and went back through the low passage, I was trying to think how we could use this to our advantage. Cooens was waiting near the opening when Dawood pulled me up. Well, he demanded, incredible, isn't it? Incredible, I agreed. Words fail me. Emerson, you will not believe. Don't tell him. Let him see for himself. He sounded like an enthusiastic boy. Emerson, the greatest Egyptologist of this or any other age, dominated the field like a colossus. No youthful scholar, however villainous, could remain indifferent to his approval. Despite his excitement, Cowens had sense enough to step back when Emerson approached. My husband's eyes locked with mine. Be ready, they said. I inclined my head slightly. Obeying Cowens's gesture, I returned to my place beside Cyrus. Emerson needed no one's assistance to descend. He lowered himself by his hands and disappeared from sight. He remained below for a long time. Not a sound issued from the pit. Torn between suspicion and anticipation, Coons edged closer to the opening. What are you doing, Professor? he called. Emerson's untidy black head appeared. His hands, resting lightly on the edge of the pit, he looked up. It's a fake, he said. Instantly, I dropped to the ground, pulling Cyrus down with me. It was a sensible but unnecessary precaution. Coens lost his grip on the gun when Emerson's hands closed round his ankles and pulled his feet out from under him. Selim snatched the weapon up, and Emerson seated himself on Coens's chest, and the reluctant Gornawis pelted out of the place, scattering in all directions. Ah, said Daoud who would watch the performance interestedly. Soon I can kill him, is it not so? Where is Nur Misur? I expect Ramses has a safe by now, Emerson said calmly. Sell him, find me some rope. I was sorry Ramses hadn't heard that splendid tribute. I was unable to share Emerson's confidence, but there were a few things to tidy up before we could search for our missing children. I always carry a coil of rope on my belt, in case I find it necessary to tie up a prisoner. With this and strips of cloth torn from various articles of clothing, we bound Coen's hand and foot, despite his struggles. While we were doing this, Cyrus edged up to the opening of the shaft. I can't stand it, he said suddenly. You folks are going to think I'm a selfish, cold-blooded viper, and I won't take more than a minute. But if I don't see what's down there, I'm going to burst. Go right ahead, Emerson said amiably. It may take us a minute or two to find out where that scum of a Syrian took Nefret. Give Vandegilt Effendi a hand, Daoud. Now then, Coens, what have you to say? Recognizing at last the futility of resistance, the Swiss lay still, breathing heavily. It was a lie, he gasped. 
the statue is genuine. You know it. You knew it. He has still some of the instincts of a scholar, Emerson remarked to me. If they had not been present in his mind, my little rules would not have succeeded. Yes, it is genuine, and yes, I knew it, and yes, indeed, I hoped the momentary relaxation of your guard would... A whoop like that of a banshee floated up the shaft. Emerson grinned. Vandergelt has not my self-control. Perhaps we ought to leave him here to guard the statue. I wouldn't put it past those rascals from Gurna to sneak back after we leave. Where are we going, Coens? You cannot make me speak, Coens said sullenly. I wouldn't be so sure of that, Emerson said mildly. I am known for my patience and forbearance but where the safety of my daughter is concerned. You said you loved her once. I think you still do. You had no intention of giving her up, did you? And yet you left her in the hands of a murderous brute. If she has been harmed, or even handled roughly, I will kill your Syrian friend, and then come back and kill you. Sweat poured down the man's face. I am willing to strike a bargain. No, listen. You cannot get her away from Obashir without my help. I am the only one he'll listen to. I will go with you and order him to release her, if you promise to let me go. Emerson is accustomed to having his own way, without compromise or bargaining. His eyes narrowed into slits of sapphirine fire. We must discuss it, I said. Come with me, Emerson. Sell him. Watch him. We went together out into the sunlight. Under my restraining hand, Emerson's arm was hard as granite. We must agree, Emerson, I said softly. I share your admiration for Ramsay's abilities, but even he has his limits. He may also be a prisoner, or... Coens has nothing to lose. He already faces the death penalty. So we let him get away with how many? Three murders? Four? I remembered something the fretted once said. Is it wrong to care so much about someone that nothing else matters? In the last extremity, when a loved one is at risk, nothing else matters. Certainly nothing so abstract as justice. It is, after all, a concept defined by men. Yes, I said. Instead of replying, Emerson emitted a wordless shout and began to run. I turned and saw them coming, holding one another's hands, the sunlight bright on Lefret's golden hair. I started toward them rather quickly, but not running. Not very fast, at any rate. Emerson had enveloped his daughter in a close embrace. I looked at my son. He gave me a rather tentative smile. I apologize for my appearance, Mother. We came straight here, since we thought you might be... Mother? Arms, breast, face, side, hand. I gave up the attempt to tally his wounds. Another shirt ruined, I said, and threw my arms around him. The remainder of that day was something of a bustle, what with arranging for the shrine to be guarded and the prisoner removed, tending to the wounded and bringing one another up to date. Our celebratory preprandial gathering in the beautifully appointed sitting room of the castle included only part of the group. Senia was with Jumana, delighted to have another sick person to look after. Sethos was tucked up in bed, with Margaret watching over him, or standing guard over him, to put it another way. What would transpire with those two, I did not know. But it had been evident to me for some time that he had now, if he had not had before, a certain interest in her. I had sent William to relieve Daoud. My necessarily brief explanations confused him a great deal, I believe, but he was obviously pleased to have such responsibility rested upon him. 
He suffers from a lack of self-confidence, I explained, as Cyrus handed round the whiskey. That is why he behaved so suspiciously. Self-doubt leads to paranoia and feelings of guilt. It is a well-known psychological fact. I don't want to hear about it, said Emerson. Me neither, said Cyrus. I'll give Amherst a job if he wants one. I can use him. But I don't want to talk about him. Well, what shall we drink to first? My eyes moved round the room, from Bertie, whose ingenuous countenance still displayed some perplexity, to his mother, relieved at last of her anxieties, to Ramses and Lefret, seated side by side on the sofa, their fingers entwined, to Cyrus's lined, smiling face, and to my dear Emerson, who wasn't even listening. What? he said. To friends and loved ones, I said. To another miraculous escape, Cyrus amended. There was nothing miraculous about it, Emerson declared. Good gad, we've had considerable practice in this sort of thing. All that is required is courage and strength, superior intelligence, quick wits, the ability to respond instantly to unexpected emergencies. And the help of our friends, I said modestly. Yes, ma'am, Bertie burst out. And I take it most unkindly, if you'll allow me to say so, that you wouldn't let me... We will let you take a hand next time, I said. If there is a next time, Bertie exclaimed. There will be, said Emerson. There always is. Not this year, I said, giving Catherine an encouraging nod. I trust not, Emerson said giving me a hard stare, as if the whole thing had been my fault. We have enough to do as it is. We will have to stay on for a few weeks, Peabody, but not here, he added hastily. Wouldn't want to put Catherine and Cyrus out. Can we evict poor old Yusuf, find him another house? Leave it to me, I said, waving aside Catherine's polite protestations. Cyrus was lost in wistful speculation. You'll let me help, won't you? Closest I'll ever come to a major find, I guess. I just don't seem to have the luck. How long do you suppose that statue's been there? Since 663 B.C., Ramses said. I say, Bertie exclaimed, that's deuced clever. How can you be so precise? Ramses looked at his father. Humming tunelessly and off-key, Emerson reached for his pipe and returned his son's deferential glance with one of expectant interest. "'I may be mistaken,' Ramses said, "'but it is a reasonable guess. "'The rulership of Thebes changed many times over the years, "'from northern conquerors to Cushite kings to high priests. "'But they were all, even the Cushites, especially the Cushites, "'devout followers of the old gods.' There was a certain amount of looting, I dare say, but the shrines would have been sacrosanct. Conquerors boasted of having restored the statues and the offerings. Then the Assyrians came down like a wolf on the fold. Poetry, I murmured. Not only poetry, but Byron, Ramses admitted. That is how it must have been, though. The sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea. For the first time in its long history, the city of Thebes was taken and sacked. From Thebes, I carried away loot rich and beyond measure, two obelisks cast of shining bronze. The Assyrians cared nothing for the gods. Among their booty were the furnishings of the temples and the divine statues, except one. How the priests got it away, we will never know. Unless there's a papyrus or ostracon in there. Cyrus broke in. That would be a find, wouldn't it? Ramses agreed. Even more important than the statue in some ways. But it must have been a hurried, frantic job, with the Assyrians advancing, already on the east bank, perhaps, and they hoped to retrieve it one day. They must have been killed defending the city. All knowledge of the location was lost. Until Jamil found it, I said. What will become of him? What has become of him, you mean? Emerson said. Nefret cannot have wounded him seriously, or he wouldn't have been able to take her horse and get clean away. We still don't know how deeply he was involved. Coens isn't talking. 
In a way, I hope the boy doesn't come back. He would face a prison sentence at the very least, and that would bring disgrace on the whole family. It did seem likely, as we all agreed, that Jamil had been the original discoverer of the shrine. Otherwise, Kuntz would never have enlisted him as an ally. He had worked for Kuntz, among others. Either Kuntz had caught him in the act, or Jamil had had enough sense to realize that he could not dispose of the incredible find by himself. And guided, perhaps, by the instinct that allows one morally corrupt individual to recognize another, he had approached Kuntz. Speculation could carry us no further, so we abandoned it for the nonce. A few more congratulatory speeches and a trifle more whiskey concluded the evening. It was not until the following morning that I was able to arrange a conference that would, I expect, answer my remaining questions. It took place in Sethos's sick room. The only other persons present were our four selves, for the matters under discussion were of a nature that could not be disclosed to anyone else, not even our dearest friends, or Margaret Minton. I had not informed my brother-in-law of my intentions... With most men, particularly the members of the Emerson family, advance warning is a tactical error. However, I paid him the courtesy of waiting until the servant informed me he had finished breakfast and was up and dressed before I knocked. When he saw who it was, he put down the book he'd been reading and sat in surly silence while the others filed in. I was pleased to see that he had shaved that morning and that he was looking quite respectable in a shirt and trousers borrowed from Ramsay's. The two of them were almost the same size. After I had locked the door, I invited everyone to sit down. By all means, Sethos said. A private little family conference, is it? Margaret told me about your activities yesterday, so you needn't go over them again. Congratulations on your discovery. Damn it, man, is that all you have to say? Emerson demanded. I am somewhat curious about one thing. And what is that? I asked. He turned those strange grey-green eyes on Ramsay's. How the devil did you get her away from Mubashir? It wasn't very nice of you to let him go alone if you thought he couldn't, I said critically. But I feel obliged to remark that from what little I have been allowed to hear of the affair, it would be impossible to praise too highly the courage and cleverness and skill and mother... He's doing it again, Ramsay's interrupted. Don't let him get you off the subject, or we'll be here all day. Quite, said Emerson. You have an agenda, I believe, Peabody. I suggest you stick to it. Certainly, my dear. I unfolded the papers I had taken from my pocket, spread them out on the table, and cleared my throat. This won't take long, assuming, of course, that our uh, kinsman does not continue to equivocate. Kinsman, Sethos repeated. On the whole, Amelia, I would prefer... Perhaps it would be better if I simply stated the facts. His lips parted. But long years of experience with Ramsay's, and to some extent Emerson, had taught me how to turn a conversation into a monologue. Raising my voice slightly, I continued... "'You are still working for British intelligence. "'You were sent here to ascertain the intentions of the Senussi "'and the extent to which they had influenced the desert tribes. "'Mr. Brace Dragon, Mr. Boy's Girdle, "'Mr. Smith is the person to whom you report. "'You met with him the evening you went to the Winter Palace. "'Up to this point, I was on solid ground. "'The rest of it was somewhat problematic.' and I hesitated, trying to think how to get the confirmation I needed before committing myself. One look at Sethos told me I was not going to get any help from him. He had tilted his chair back and was watching me with a mocking smile. "'What shall we do with Mr. Kuntz?' I inquired. The front legs of the chair thudded onto the floor. "'Why are you asking me?' he demanded with an unconvincing show of surprise. The matter is a trifle delicate, is it not? Our friends are under the impression that we arrested Mr. Kuntz because he was a murderer and tomb robber, which is good and sufficient cause. 
your superiors may not wish it known that he is also a German spy. I might have known you would arrive at that conclusion, Sethos muttered. It was obvious, said Emerson, folding his arms and trying to look as if he'd known it all along. Well, it was rather, I admitted. Ramsay's encounter with poor Mr. Assad could only have been arranged by someone who knew the role Ramsay's had played the previous winter. In other words, an agent of Turkish or German intelligence. But I cannot blame myself for failing to give that interesting clue the importance it deserved, since the attacks on us continued even after Ramsay's had left Cairo. Everything that happened from then on was designed to keep us in Cairo and bring Ramsay's back. That was what confused me initially. The fact that our adversary had two roles and two motives. I even considered the possibility that there were two different people involved. An enemy spy, who had sent Mr. Assad to prevent Ramses from returning to his activities on behalf of the War Office, and an archaeologist, who had found something of value in Luxor, which he had determined to exploit for his own gain. Of all people on earth, we were the most likely to interfere with such a discovery, not only because of our expert knowledge of the area, but because of the bonds of friendship and loyalty that unite us with the members of dear Abdullah's family. Emerson's influence with them is paramount, his reputation awe-inspiring. Coens feared that once in his presence, Jamil might break down and confess— he was mistaken about that, for the wretched boy's desire for power and wealth was stronger than loyalty. But he had good reason to be concerned. I'm surprised he didn't simply kill Jamil, Nefret said. The murder of a member of our family would have brought us here at once, Nefret. Besides, he needed Jamil to spy on you and Ramses and report your activities to him. Get on with it, Peabody, Emerson grunted. Where was I? I consulted my notes. Ah, yes. Mr. Kuntz is a German agent, but he is also an archaeologist, and a good one. He recognized that the statue was the discovery of a lifetime, and although he continued to carry out his original assignment, his primary motive from then on was to make himself rich. I dare say he is not the only man who would be seduced from duty by such a prize. I understand his point of view quite well, said Sethos meditatively. Being accustomed to his attempts at provocation and distraction, I silenced him with a stern look and went on. You knew or assumed that the Central Powers had a man in Luxor. I will not ask how you knew, since you wouldn't answer me, claiming that it is classified information, which it may be. But it would be logical for them to do so. Your role was to find out who he was and what he was doing. In pursuit of these aims, you made several trips to Kaga Oasis, as Kuentz had done. The place is a hotbed of subversion, and readily accessible by rail, as the other oases are not. You learned that your counterpart had been there, but nothing more that would enable you to identify him. I turned over another page. It came as a considerable surprise to you, I expect, to find that someone was impersonating you. Why, you must have asked yourself. Could it be that this individual was the German spy you sought, making use of your notorious, well-known prestige to win adherence? Or, I paused to catch my breath, could it be that there was another player, and that the prize was an archaeological discovery of great value? I thought you were going to state facts. Sethos said. Those were rhetorical questions, I explained. But if you would care to answer them... Why not? said my brother-in-law, with an appearance of candor that aroused the direst of suspicions. You seem to have it all worked out anyhow. I hadn't been in Luxor for two days when I began hearing rumours about a great discovery. One hears such things frequently, of course. Usually, the rumours are false. The rumours about the return of the master were more serious. And when I recognised one of my former hirelings, I decided I'd better move cautiously in re-establishing contact with my old organisation. As you know, I wasn't cautious enough. He paused to light a cigarette. Continue, if you please, I said. Do you really want to hear all these tedious details? 
He blew out a cloud of smoke. No, said Emerson. I want to get back to the shrine. I believe I can summarise the main points, I said. You wondered why, if the imposter meant to take over the antiquities business, he hadn't stolen anything. We know the reason now, of course. The magnitude of the find was such that he didn't want to attract the attention of the authorities until he'd made arrangements to remove and dispose of the statue. Suspecting something of the sort, you decided to challenge him, a typically reckless and ill-considered move, I might add, by carrying out several daring thefts. Was destroying the German house another such challenge? In part. The locals avoided the place. They'd been told it was haunted or cursed or something of the sort. That in itself suggested someone was using it. So I searched the place. He hadn't left anything incriminatory, not even a code book, but the wireless was there. So I decided I might as well blow the bloody place up, cut his line of communication, and remove one of his hideaways. At this point, I still didn't know whether I was dealing with one man or two. But when I was notified of Assad's death, I felt certain the two were one. As you yourself so cogently remarked, only a man who knew of Ramsay's role last winter would have realized that Assad might constitute a danger to him. We will never know for certain unless Coens decides to confide in us. But I expect Coens ran across Assad on one of his trips to Chicago and heard his heated remarks on the subject of British oppression and the martyrdom of his beloved leader, which gave Coens the bright idea of turning him loose and encouraging him to seek revenge on a traitor. It was not such a bad scheme. All it cost Coens was a few pounds and a little time, and if it had succeeded, it would have put Ramses out of commission and seriously distracted the rest of you. He wanted to keep you away from Luxor, for the reasons you have indicated. What he failed to understand was that Assad's heart... The corners of his mouth turned up in a particularly offensive smile. His heart, shall we say, wasn't in it. Coens had arranged to meet Assad in Cairo, promising aid and comfort for the cause. When they met... Kuhns discovered that Assad had not only failed to kill or incapacitate Ramses, but that he was riddled with guilt and remorse. There was a reasonable chance he would go to his uh, friend and confess. So Kuhns killed him. My reasoning exactly, I said. Quite, said Sethos, nodding gravely in acknowledgement. To sum it up, the Germans and Turks had planted a number of agents in various trouble spots, awaiting their tug, and archaeology provides excellent cover. If my quarry was an Egyptologist who had come across a startling discovery in the course of his normal activities, a discovery rich enough to seduce him from his duty, well, that would account for what had happened. Good enough, said Emerson, bounding to his feet. Ordinarily, he enjoys participating in our little deductive sessions, but archaeological fever had overcome him. So, you will take steps to get Coens off our hands? I will wire Cairo today, was the reply. Just write out the telegram, I said. You use some sort of code, I suppose. I will send it when I go to Luxor this afternoon. I have a great deal of shopping to do before... I have seldom heard such language even from Emerson. Nor did Emerson object, as he usually did, to bad language from anyone except himself. I waited until Sethos had worn out his store of invective, and then said, You aren't fit to go anywhere yet. Nefret, perhaps you had better take his temperature. Sethos gave his brother a look like that of a caged animal. Emerson shook his head. It's no use he said gruffly. She always gets her way. Anyhow, you aren't... Uh, you ought not... Uh, uh, we cannot allow you to... Um... Disappear again into loneliness, danger and despair, I said. Not with Christmas only two days off. Sethos covered his face with his hands. 
Get me pen and paper. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. The tree was bright with candles and hung with the little ornaments which David had made all those years ago and which had become a treasured part of their holiday celebration. Leaning against her husband, Lefret was so tired she couldn't have moved if her life depended on it. Her mother-in-law had had them all working round the clock to get things ready. And when she wasn't after Nefret to help with wrapping gifts and hanging decorations, Emerson was demanding photographs, sketches, and plans. There was one moment Nefret would never forget. When she stood in the underground chamber with Selim and the cameras and realized she was still clutching the wreath she had been making when Emerson dragged her away from the castle. After they had finished taking photographs, she laid it at the feet of the god. It had been worth it. Senia was beside herself, fluttering from person to person like a ruffled white butterfly, tearing the wrappings off her gifts, shrieking with pleasure. A letter from Rose had arrived that morning, with the news that Seshat had had her kittens, four of them, all healthy and handsome and brindled like their parents and Senia was still puzzling over how to allocate them. One for herself, of course. Lefret wondered how Horus would react to that. And one for Ramses. But should the others go to Gargery, or the Professor, or Daud, or Mr. Amherst, who was clearly in need of appreciation and affection, or Bertie? Bertie sat by his mother, holding her hand, or perhaps she was holding his hand to prevent him from joining Jumana, who was sitting next to Emerson, her foot on a hassock, fluttering her lashes and talking non-stop. Emerson listened with an indulgent smile, but his eyes, like Nefret's, wandered round the room, lingering longest on the face of his wife. Wearing a gown of her favourite crimson, she was bustling about, managing everything and everyone, persuading Gargery to rewrap his replica of Abu Simbel, which had an unforeseen tendency to shed sand all over the carpet, pausing for a moment to chat with Amherst and give him an encouraging pat on the back, helping Fatima pick up the ribbons and paper Senia had scattered. She looked very handsome, her cheeks flushed and her hair twisted into a coil atop her head. Nefret had certain suspicions about the unrelieved black of that handsome head of hair, but she would never have expressed them. All the Egyptologists Cyrus could collect were there, as well as several friends from Luxor. Marjorie Fisher and Cathy Flynn hadn't brought their cats, who were usually honoured visitors. Horus was roaming free, at Senia's insistence, and since he regarded all male felines as potential rivals and all females as potential prey, Coco and Bess had been forced to miss the festivities. The family had sent their representatives, Daoud and Selim, Fatima and Khadija and Basima, graciously sharing in a festival that was not their own, though Daoud had remarked in that innocently shrewd way of his, The Lord Issa is one of the great prophets. Why should we not honor his birth? The occasion was certainly ecumenical. In the center of the room, on a plinth, sat Amun Ray. Candlelight streaking his face and crown with gold. Emerson had been unwilling to leave him unguarded any longer, and clearing the shrine had proved to be a disappointing simple business. There had been nothing in the chamber but the god and his offering vessels, no papyri, no final plea scratched on an ostracon or on the walls. Perhaps it hadn't been necessary. He heard the prayers of the silent, and no one deserved his mercy more than the devoted priests who had saved him from the invaders. Remembering her mother-in-law's account of Abdullah's enigmatic words, Nefret shivered a little. He had spoken of Amun. I mustn't be superstitious and sentimental, she told herself firmly. One look at Sethos was enough to dispel such fancies. 
She could not exactly call him a skeleton at the feast, but he bore no perceptible resemblance to Father Christmas, even with the beard he had insisted upon wearing. Bolt upright, in a particularly uncomfortable armchair, he watched the proceedings with a singular absence of expression. He did not look at Margaret, or she at him, though she was seated not far away. Catching Nefret's wandering eye, his lips curled in acknowledgement of the absurdity of his presence. The prodigal son, the black sheep. Not even her formidable mother-in-law, she thought, could bring that sheep back into the fold. What will happen to those two? she asked. What two? Ramses had been watching Senia when he wasn't looking at her. Oh, the mind boggles. Aunt Margaret, God save us. He does care for her, though. If you'd seen his face the other day. I knew before that, Nefret said smugly, because he behaved so abominably to her. He was falling in love with her, and he didn't want to, Nefret explained. Women are such nuisances, aren't they? Always hanging about, demanding attention and complaining and getting themselves captured. White hands cling to the tightened rein, her husband agreed solemnly, slipping the spur from the booted heel. Poetry, Nefret said scornfully. She pulled his head down and kissed him. He responded without self-consciousness or restraint, and when they broke apart and saw that his mother was, of course, watching them with an approving smile, he grinned at her and held Nefret closer. Kipling had never met you or mother, he remarked, raising her hand to his face. He wouldn't have written such rubbish if he had. She's gesturing at us, Nefret said, as his lips explored her palm and fingers. I think she wants us to sing carols. Couldn't we slip away? Away from Mother, when she's in a sentimental mood, not bloody likely. Contain yourself a little longer, you shameless woman. I am entirely without shame, Nefret murmured. But I don't think I can control myself if she tries to make the master criminal join us in a rousing chorus of Deck the Halls. Surely not even she would expect. She did expect, and he was too cowed to protest. Or perhaps, Nefret thought, there was another reason. She was surprised to find that he knew all the words. Sethos was gone next morning, and so was Margaret. Despite Emerson's indignant complaints, Nefret suspected he had collaborated in his brother's disappearance. It would have been difficult for the pair to get away without help from someone. The beard and Ramsay's best suit were missing, too. The only thing they found in Sethos's room was a small parcel addressed to Nefret. It contained a bracelet of linked carnelian plaques, exquisitely carved with the figures of a king and queen enthroned. Amenhotep III and Queen T, Ramsay said, breathing hard. He lied about that, too. He did find her jewellery. Good of him to share, his mother said coolly. He had left nothing for her. What do you suppose he's done with the rest of the jewellery? Emerson asked. We were in our room, collecting the articles we would need that day. I buckled my belt of tools round my waist. He will sell them to a wealthy collector. He's built up quite a clientele, I imagine. Or a well-funded museum. Some of those institutions have no scruples about purchasing stolen artefacts. Hmm. Emerson agreed. He gave me a sidelong look. I was somewhat surprised that he um, neglected to give you anything. It was a typically oblique and a typically graceful gesture, my dear. An acknowledgement of his altered feelings for me. And you. And his commitment to another lady. Hmm, said Emerson. You really think she... Temporary commitment, perhaps, I should say. How long the uh, arrangement will last, one cannot predict. But she is a very determined woman, and he is no longer an impetuous youth. 
It is time he settled down. I doubt he would agree, Peabody. Confound it! He's as good as admitted he's not abandoned the antiquities game. Are we to be on opposite sides again? He did add a certain spice to our lives, Emerson. Admit it. Emerson passed his hand over his mouth. I will admit he was the only adversary worthy of our steel. You have forgiven him, then? Oh, bah, forgive. Emerson no longer attempted to conceal his smile. I suppose I can hardly blame him for having the good taste to admire you. And he hasn't tried to murder me for years. I wish he would turn to a line of work that doesn't interfere with mine. But I can even put up with that, unless... Unless what, Emerson? Unless he has the damned audacity to die again. You've been listening to Lord of the Silent by Elizabeth Peters, narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt. 